Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. If you don't see uh, seating on the floor, there's additional seating upstairs in the balcony. It's very comfortable. Uh, so anybody, if you don't see, uh, see any seating on the floor, we have very comfortable seating upstairs in the balcony as well. Hello, if the commissioners could take their seats. Well, it's your name. So if you... One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I've, I've lost some, but. Good evening and welcome to today's hearing of the Charter Revision Commission of the City of New York, established pursuant to Local Law 91 of 2018. I am Gail Benjamin and I am honored to lead this commission as chair. It is my pleasure to call this meeting to order. I would like to recognize that we are joined by Commissioners Sal Albanese, Lilian Barrios Paoli, Lisette Camillo, Jim Karras, Stephen Fiella, Paula Gavin, Reverend Clinton Miller, Satish Nuri, and Carl Weisbrod. I said Lisette Camillo. Therefore, we have a quorum. This is the fifth public hearing in our ongoing effort to engage the public in the generation of ideas about ways in which the city charter can help make the city work better. This commission was established by legislation proposed by the speaker, adopted by the city council, and has appointments from each of the borough presidents, the public advocate, the controller, the city council, and the mayor. We, the 15 of us, represent a cross-section of New Yorkers. We live throughout the five boroughs. We work in diverse fields. We're of diverse backgrounds, ages, and means. What we share is a love of our city and a desire to help shape our city's future and to meaningfully participate in changing the document that will provide the basis for that task. Given that you're here today, I know that you are already aware of the importance of the Charter and how we live our everyday lives here in New York. The Charter provides the manner in which the city handles public money and provides goods and services to residents throughout the city. It defines the responsibilities of government officials as well as our city agencies and provides the framework for the use and development of land in the city. We're all here tonight to propose ideas that can strengthen the compact between citizens and their government. Ideas that can provide a transition from the city of 1989 to the city of 2050. These ideas may rebalance the rights and responsibilities of our agencies or our government officials, may streamline our budget or may redefine how the city uses land and purchases its goods and service. We welcome all of your ideas and thank you for sharing them with us. If you wish to testify today, please fill out a speaker slip and to submit it to our staff. I would say for, for all of you that we have almost 70 speaker slips, um, so this may be a long hearing. Please make your points clearly and succinctly as we want to understand the issues you raise. We're happy to accept any written testimony you may have either today or over the course of the coming weeks and months. Our web address and Twitter feed is on the pamphlets, which are on the table located in the front of the room. All testimony in whatever form you choose to submit it will be included in the record and made available to the commissioner's staff and the public. Um, we hope to gather a robust set of proposals and we'll be conducting additional hearings in the spring to present the results of our research and analysis and receive further feedback. By September of 2019, we will share with you a set of proposed revisions to the Charter, which will be put before all of you on the ballot of November 2019. Again, we thank you for being here and taking part in this momentous task. Um, as a first order of business, I will entertain a motion to adopt the minutes of the September 24th meeting. Motion to adopt? So moved. Second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Motion carries. We will now start our public testimony on proposals for revisions to the Charter. 
We will limit testimony to three minutes per individual in order to ensure we can hear from everyone who wishes to speak. Members of the Commission may have questions for you to follow up on your ideas or proposal. And I would ask that everybody really attend to the three minute limit. There is a clock that will tell you when your three minutes have elapsed and there will be a beep that will go off. And if you could conclude your remarks then, I would appreciate it as would the other members of the public who wish to have time to speak also. For the first member, I call up Speaker Corey Johnson. I can begin, Madam yes. Chair? Yes. I was seated where you're sitting for six hours today, so it's uh, funny to be on this if side. If you'd like to change seats, um, uh, we can do that. Definitely not. Uh, good evening. Uh, I want to thank you, Chair Gail Benjamin and Commissioners of the 2019 Charter Revision Commission for holding these hearings and this hearing and establishing such a positive start to this process. I am particularly proud of this commission. There has never been, as far as I am aware, a council legislated Charter Revision Commission and Borough President Gail Brewer and public, I see Gail here, and public advocate Tish James deserve an enormous amount of credit for taking this issue on before I became Speaker of the Council. Uh, and in another first, uh, this commission consists of appointees from almost every elected official in the city, citywide or borough-wide, and no one, no one has a majority of seats on this commission. To top it off, since 1989, no charter revision commission has been charged with looking at the entire charter with no specific mission other than to make things better for New Yorkers by improving our government. This is truly an independent, fully empowered charter revision commission. I am proud of the structure we established for this commission and believe this should be the standard for all future commissions that are called. With that in mind, I would like to propose several broad topics for this commission to study. These topic areas arise out of internal discussions in the City Council, uh, including through our policy working group at the Council, led by Council Members Brad Lander and Fernando Cabrera. We have more detailed proposals in the future, uh, but for now we hope these will start some of the important discussions that we think should take place. First, we recommend that the structure of the city's government, the allocation of power, and the system of checks and balances within the system be examined by this commission. The council is the legislative body of the city of New York, a separate branch of government designed to be a check on the executive. That balance of power was clearly envisioned by the framers of the 89 charter, but it was not fully formed. For example, the council currently has limited authority for the review of the appointment of mayoral agency heads and does not have their authority to remove any of them. You should also consider whether budgets of certain offices, which are uncertain and subject to political considerations as opposed to substantive need, should be fixed budgets or independently set budgets. Along those lines, I also think that the role of the Corporation Council and the Law Department merits your attention. One lawyer attempting to serve two separate branches of government is an invitation for confusion and disruption and may not be in the best interests of the entire city. I urge you to examine how we can improve this structure. Next, we recommend that the Charter Revision Commission undertake a thorough review of the budget process to ensure that the council is in fact able to serve as a co-equal budget partner and a balanced check on the mayor's authority that the 1989 Charter Revision Commission envisioned it to be. This year's $89.2 billion, I repeat billion, dollar budget is more than three times the size of the $26.8 billion budget, which was in place in 1989. And the city's economy and finance today, as I'm sure we'll hear from the controller who I believe is here tonight, <clears throat> 
are far more stable than they were less than 15 years after the fiscal crisis of the 1970s, which rocked our city. With this evolved budgetary landscape in mind, the Council believes that the Commission should focus its budget-related review on the principles of fiscal responsibility, transparency, accountability, and efficiency. The Council recommends that the Charter Commission look at two categories of revisions, the current distribution of budgeting authority and clarifying, and clarifying charter language regarding budget format with clear ties between programs and budget lines, which could have wide-ranging impacts on both the expense and capital budgets of the City of New York. We also recommend that you examine the City's land use process. Prior Charter Revision Commissions have put off discussion on this important topic, usually for lack of time. With this Commission, we have the expertise and capacity to explore questions that we have pushed off in the past. Today, I want to draw your attention to four of those questions. The first, there is, as many people will tell you, a lot of fatigue and frustration about our current land use process. Would a citywide planning framework that sets clear planning goals for neighborhoods across the city be a far better approach than we have right now? Number two, how do we increase equity of benefit and equity of burden across the city? Number three, how can we improve the mechanics of land use? And finally, how do we ensure meaningful public participation in the land use process? I look forward to coming back to you with specific proposals regarding these important land use questions in the near future. Next, and I'm almost finished, uh, Madam Chair, during your previous four meetings, I heard a lot about police accountability from folks that came and testified. It is, a, it is vital that we ensure confidence in our public safety institutions by providing proper oversight and real accountability in law enforcement. I strongly urge you to take this issue seriously, but I am not endorsing or opposing any of the views that previously came before you. Finally, civic participation Please. Finally, civic participation is of utmost importance to me and my colleagues, and I urge the Commission to look into elections, in particular, instant runoff voting. Runoff elections are costly exercises that few people actually vote in. We can maximize voter participation by making each vote more meaningful rather than requiring additional elections. I look forward to presenting more detailed proposals to this Commission regarding these issues, and likely a few more, in the coming months. Until then, I want to thank you for your service. I also want to thank my colleagues at the Council for their input. And as I have said before, I believe the City Charter is in good hands with all of you. Thank you very much, Council Speaker Johnson. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. Oh, Jim. Thank you, Speaker Johnson, uh, and thank you for your support. Um, I'm really glad you mentioned the budget because it's been a long, long time interest of mine uh, ever since uh, being finance council and acting finance director at the council. You talked about clear lines between uh, programs and budget lines. Uh, I, do you think uh, right now we have, I'll, I have this page, I've been carrying it around with me for weeks, uh, of the current budget. Uh, the Department of Homeless Services has about a $2.1 billion budget, and $1.9 billion of that are in one unit of appropriation. Is that appropriate? Um, I don't want to look at uh, Dr. Lillian Barrios Pioli when I answer this question because I think she has some expertise uh, on this, but I would say no, it, it's, it's not uh, appropriate. And, and let me just give you a, a few reasons and I, I'll try to answer this question, question quickly. Um, we we want to, part of our job is to do real oversight and to be able to understand what's working and what's not working. Uh, we want to know how much is in a particular program whether it be a rental assistance program that is currently getting uh, a certain amount of money, and if there are other programs that get money but aren't working as well. We want to see that clearly delineated so we can do oversight on those programs 
and understand how it should be broken down so that we can ask the appropriate questions through our oversight role as a municipal legislature. And then second, one of the things that is, I believe the 89 Charter Revision Commission had envisioned was through our budget process, budget modifications. If the mayor wants to modify the budget and needs more money for homeless services or for the NYPD or for the Department of Education and there's a program that's working or not working, there is a process to do that. It is a budget modification process. They're usually presented to us once or twice a year where OMB comes forward and has proposals to change some of the spending that was proposed in the current fiscal year. So having greater units of appropriation uh, spelled out in a more detailed and accurate way uh, would allow us to do greater oversight and we could do more budget modifications with proper oversight to understand how that money should be spent and have a meaningful voice and how that money gets moved around. Thank you. I look forward to your uh, proposals on that. Any other questions? Thank you, Speaker Johnson. We appreciate your bringing this group and into fruition and your testimony today. Have fun tonight. I know it's going to be a short night. <laughs> <laughs> the next speaker is Controller Scott Stringer. Um, I would also like to acknowledge that uh, Mr. Commissioner Ed Cordero has joined us um, and to say that if any of you who are standing around the room would like to sit, there are seats upstairs and there are also seats interspersed throughout the room that are available. So if you would like a seat either upstairs, there are lots of seats and there are a few out. seats throughout, no, I need throughout the room. Controller Stringer. Okay. Well, thank you, Chair Benjamin and members of the Commission for the opportunity to testify this evening on this very important topic. As you know, change is the lifeblood of our great city, and our charter is the engine that helps our government adapt to new challenges, not only today, but for years to come. Unfortunately, we have not taken a comprehensive look at our charter for nearly 30 years since the Supreme Court forced us to in 1989, and that's a long time. Over the past 30 years, New York has witnessed enormous change, much of it good, from diverse population growth to new emerging job centers in all five boroughs to our reduction in crime. But there has also been an explosion of homelessness, a deterioration of our subway infrastructure, persistent inequality in our public schools, and a continuing disappearance of affordable housing. Meeting these challenges in the 21st century will require new ideas and perhaps a new city charter. Without new ideas, our charter is an outdated set of rules and regulations instead of the living, breathing document we need it to be. The engine of our city begins to slow, and that is unacceptable. And that is why I am pleased to share with you a comprehensive report from my office called A New Charter to Confront New Challenges. It includes 65 ideas to improve the charter. I will be going through those 65 I No, just kidding. But not at this moment. But not, but not at this moment. This book is not intended to be a comprehensive vision for tackling all of our problems. It's not intended for that purpose. But I hope to give to you a document based on what I've learned as a member of the Assembly, Borough President, and City Controller. It offers what I think is a roadmap for facing challenges, implementing changes, and making city government better for everyone. In our report, you will find ideas on how to create wealth in more of our neighborhoods by helping to close the inequality gap and create more economic opportunity in all five boroughs. You'll find strategies on how to give communities a greater voice in land use decisions and how to make sure our city engages in more long-term planning. There are thoughts on housing and steps we can take to fight back against the scourges like lead paint and mold through strengthened inspections and changes in agencies. We tackle our city's archaic procurement process, which I'm sure many people want to rise up and say procurement, yes, but I know no one really looks at it that way, but I do. 
we, which too often leaves frontline social service providers without the funds they need to operate, we should think about making substantive changes through the Charter. We also take a deep dive into our city's capital budget, which right now is a black hole that emits almost no useful information. These are just some of the ideas in our report. I know the Commission will be hearing from many others with thoughtful ideas, but hopefully the suggestions we've outlined today can spark some discussions in the months ahead. It's my intention to make our proposal somewhat of a living document. We're going to add to those proposal, the proposals in the book. Obviously, we will do that in consultation with everybody. And again, I want to stress, these are only some ideas. Many of these ideas can be discounted. Some should be looked at carefully. But we really wanted to take the time in our office to give you a set of ideas based on uh, some topics that I think would be relevant for your consideration. And lastly, I want to just say, Chair Benjamin, that this is a pretty powerful and, and smart group of Commission members, and I think there's great potential. I know many of you personally, and if I don't know you, I know you by reputation, and you really represent the best of the city. So I wish you, uh, you know, real success in your endeavor to uh, enhance our Constitution. Thank you very much, Controller. Are there any questions of Controller Springer? Stringer? Stringer. Okay. Thank you very much, Scott. Thank you very we, much. I know we will be talking to you in the days to come. I'm, I'm looking uh, forward to it. As we read this report. I'd also like to acknowledge the presence of Commissioner Hirsch. Um, and what? Oh, I'm sorry. Sal? Mr. Albanese. Yeah. Uh, good evening, Troll Stringer. Um, I noticed in your report you mentioned strengthening campaign finance laws in the city, which I think obviously are, in view of the scandals we've seen, are inadequate. What What is your vision for a campaign finance law that that um, removes conflicts of interest and deep pocketed self interested folks from from running our politics? What's your view on that? Look, I I think that there's a number of in interesting proposals that go beyond New York City. You've championed uh, the vouchers, and I commend you for that. Uh, I do think we should consider a couple of things that relates to campaign finance. First and foremost, we have to make sure that candidates can run competitive elections. We have to make sure that big spenders with unlimited money uh, do not take advantage of whatever reforms are put forth. That's a larger conversation. But as someone who had to run against someone with unlimited money, uh, with a campaign finance program that doesn't really address that kind of those kind of issues, I look forward to working with you. Second, I would ask you to close what I think is a glaring loophole. There are times when candidates need that public campaign finance financing. You play by the rules. You get those low donor contributions. We need the campaign finance board, and they do. They get those checks to where they have to go for the campaign. But there's also uh, a situation where candidates are able to access public money for races that they're going to win by 80 percent of the vote, costing city taxpayers millions of dollars. I would rather limit incumbents who have a huge financial advantage with no real opponent. They should not access those campaign funds. I ask you to take a look at that as well. And also, I just want to say to all of you, as I have great respect for the commission that just concluded. So we had some really great people on that commission. But I do want to say that the campaign finance proposals that they ended up putting on the ballot um, were not well thought out. It did not come with a larger vision. I think you have an opportunity to do that. And second, what I guess I want to say today specifically, because this proposal will be on the ballot, when you think about long-term planning, when you think about community-based planning, when you think about how the rules of the game are usually in favor of, of more wealthier, well-heeled people. Uh, the notion that you're going to instill term limits on community board members uh, who have the experience fighting every day in the community without any other substantive proposals makes absolutely no sense to me. And I think you have an opportunity to really engage on how our city can have access to our government. Uh, just a quick uh, Please, please, please. A quick follow-up. Uh, you're the chief fiscal officer. Um, the money is in the bank. Mm -hmm. I, I understand. Uh, and the check is in the mail? Um, <laughs> Always on time, yes. 
do, do you feel that we need to spend $10 million in citywide campaigns in the mayor's race? To, I mean, do we need to spend that much money to get your message out? That's well, the cap, as you know, well, for, for citywide for, in the mayor's race. Well, look at your own experience, right? Sorry? Look at your own experience. You can't win citywide office spending a very small amount of money. The question is, how do you get people to a threshold where we can engage people? Well, so, so, for example, is so for example, in the campaign finance proposals, right? Uh, they see, you know, there's a spending cap. Um, believe it or not, having gone through these campaigns, it seems like a lot of money, but it's actually not. When you think about the cost of television, digital, mail, um, one of the things that I, that I thought was interesting about raising the sh matching fund threshold to eight uh, to eight to one, there was no credit given or understanding of what it would actually take for a campaign to build out a low donor strategy. So this is why I think you have to sort of clean up a lot of this work. If we're going to really create a small donor citywide opportunity for candidates, then we also have to give them the ability to actually do that. What right now the system is geared, quite frankly, to people like me who are incumbents, who have done this multiple times, but that is not right and that is not fair. We have to think about the new candidates that are going to be coming here and doing some bold discussion of issues, but if they can never get their issues out there because they don't have that threshold of money, then it's going to be a status quo yeah. election in 2021, and that's yeah. not right. I, you know what I'm points. saying? Yeah. So there has I, to be a balance. Just based on my own experience, I think $5 million is sufficient to get your message out. But you need a couple, you definitely need millions. I'm not sure you need $10 million. Uh, I, there are people who would argue that $10 million is actually not a lot of money. And by the way, we the should. The consultants would argue um, that. No, no. When you think about what TV time and the amount it takes to get on and break through, you know, I'll be honest with you, it was in my race uh, uh, for controller where I was running against a self-funder, you know, that, that individual spent $12 million for controller. I couldn't ever spend that, but the question always for me was, could I break through? I would read that in the papers every day. He's not breaking through because he doesn't have the money. Okay. So it's a balance. Um, Commissioner Karras. Thank you. Uh, Comptroller Stringer, one, uh, I was leafing through your report, one thing caught my uh, eye Which uh, in particular. Uh, in the first preliminary budget after charter revision, the mayor and council should jointly determine the units of appropriation to be included in each major agency. Uh, I was wondering if you had background on that because it's uh, to the extent I've been able to do research on this and I've tried to do a fair amount, that was uh, raised as a proposal in the 89 Charter Commission, that there was supposed to be a transition provision that called for the mayor to submit a preliminary list. And I, I did some research and I found they discussed that when they voted on the budget provisions and there were people who said, well, that's going to be in the transition provisions. And then it never appears in the transition provisions. Ooh. And I was never able to find out why that was the case. I, so I wondered if any of, if you have any background on where this proposal came from, and if you have any idea, if your staff might have ideas on what happened to that in the 89 charter. To the extent that we're allowed to assist with that, um, I would certainly be happy to meet with you and, and take you through that. I think that the unit of appropriation uh, the measure should be to specific programs and budget items so that we know exactly what that unit of appropriation means. I think there's going to be a lot of support for that. Certainly in our office, it would be very helpful for our audit work and just for transparency. Uh, I don't know all the, this is a pretty comprehensive book and we do some history about charter commissions, but I don't think we addressed that nuance, but I'll be happy to work with you. Okay, thank you. First of all, I do want to congratulate you and thank you, um, Mr. Controller, for your work as borough president in raising the quality of community board membership. I think you did really an excellent job and I appreciate it. Thank you. Um, I have sort of a broader question for you. Um, uh, Speaker Johnson noted that um, this charter commission has an extraordinarily broad mandate and the broadest for sure since 1989, um, and I also know that um, 
um, uniquely, perhaps, uh, you know, everyone, all the elected officials who appointed members to this charter commission are term limited. And so they're not going to be in their current positions three years from now. Um, and so it's an opportunity, in a sense, to take a step back. And I wonder whether broadly, um, and I have obviously haven't read your recommendations mm -hmm. and look forward to reading them, but broadly speaking, do you think, and given the various um, positions you've held in city and state government, that the basic balance between among the various elected officials is right? Are we dealing uh, largely on correcting idiosyncrasies or, and is the basic balance between the executive, the legislative, legislative branch, borough presidents and council members, which was fixed in 1989, fundamentally right? I'm not asking you whether it's exactly right, but is the basic balance right in your view? To answer your question, I, I do think the 89 Charter um, has got it right in a lot of areas, and the document has really stayed the same with some changes for a good part of 30, 30 years. And I think that, and I think partly they were under the gun because of the ruling, and it was wholesale change in city government, so I think people took it very seriously. But the commission was very much like the people who I'm speaking to tonight, people who have community and government and, you know, private sector experience, mayoral experience, council experience, land use experience. And I, I think even though we would say that, the, that they got it right, I think it's important to sort of do a refresh. And I think whether it's mayoral agencies and procurement, the controller's office and budgeting, um, should we refresh a little bit, I think, on the public advocate's office, um, the role of the council, speaker talked about that. I think it is very appropriate to do that. The balance that I would say, everyone comes here sort of, and, and this is what's happened in previous charter revisions. Mayors who convened charter vision commissions had an ax to grind or someone's gore had to be got. Uh, that was true when there was the whole fight to eliminate the public advocate's office. This commission does not have that. So having a fuller agenda means you don't have a narrow view of what the outcome is gonna be, and that has happened in some of these commissions, although some have done great work. So I would say take an expansive view, but also remember that if you are the mayor, you wanna make sure that we have a mayoral uh, structure so that things can move in the city, right? When we were laying out some of our um, ideas. Some of it comes from a borough president controller lens, right? I want to see the city planning commission, you know, not change, but a little more to community boards and borough presidents. I want to see more community-based planning because I did that for eight years as a borough president. As controller, I want transparency and more audit. If the mayor was standing, uh, was sitting next to me, he would do, I think, a very good job saying, be careful that we don't grind the government to a halt. And I think that's your job, to get us to a place that we have a new document, but we haven't broken the city. And, and I wish you good luck with that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Any further questions? No, thank you, uh, Controller thank Stringer. You. Thank you, everybody. I would like to recognize that Commissioner Hirsch and Tish are here and ask if they would like to vote in the affirmative on adopting the minutes of the last meeting. Okay. Yes. Thank you, Commissioner Hirsch and Commissioner Tisch. Uh, our next speaker is our Manhattan Borough President, who shares my name and initials, Gail Brewer. Good evening, GB, and to each of the commissioners for taking on this role and welcome in Manhattan. It's the largest turnout of all five boroughs. Let me be clear. Thank you. Manhattan rocks. <laughs> and I want to thank the uh, speaker and the public advocate uh, for working with us on a charter revision commission. And you are all here, and I appreciate that. There's so much to talk about. 
Uh, with my short time, I will present an overview of items that I would like to see this commission to consider, and we will have full testimony in the near future. And I do hope, and I think you will, put all testimonies on the web. Real estate, as you know, plays the most crucial role in the physical shape of our city. And so I want to start with my suggestion for changing land use procedures, some of which were derived from the excellent work done by the Inclusive City Working Group, which I worked on with Council Member Reynoso. So number one, pre-planning must be built into ULERP. Input from community boards and elected officials must be considered before a project is certified. Number two, borough presidents should be allowed to submit amended applications with their ULIP recommendations when a city agency or local development corporation is the applicant or co-applicant, which would put important potential zoning changes in scope for the city council. During the inward rezoning, for instance, Everyone but the Department of City Planning wanted storefront size limits, something I worked on on the Upper West Side. If I could have submitted an alternative application during ULERP, these storefront size limits could have been adopted by the council. Number three, there needs to be a citywide comprehensive plan every 10 years. This planning process could distribute new development equitably across the city. Additionally, the zoning resolution itself could be reviewed every 10 years. And then you could have, uh, include use group reform and other issues that people want. Number four, for changes to special permits, such as the two bridges project, which we're dealing with now, there must be a new ULERP for modifications that differ from what was presented during the initial ULERP. Also, the City Council must be solely authorized to determine whether a modification to a proposal is within the scope of the original application and the environmental review. And number five on the issue of land use, super tall buildings are everywhere. Without getting into my own feelings about these, I think you know them, I recommend that at a minimum we make requests for zoning lot mergers, for easement agreements, and development rights publicly accessible through an online map portal so we know what's going on. Um, I want to talk about some other things quickly. Landmarks Preservation Commission. I appreciate the presence on the LPC of architects and planners, but we need preservationists and we need to have stipends for the commissioners. Another issue is the uh, robust issue that was brought up earlier of spending priorities. The council does not currently have access to the units of appropriation, and you heard some discussion earlier about that. By providing details of what the council is being asked to approve, including a reconciliation of year-over-year -year changes, and by, pro by prohibiting an agency from categorizing all its spending in one unit, as you heard earlier, the council could really know what the basic form of governance actually is and where the taxpayer's money is going. Also, requiring service level information and performance measures, the budget should match the performance for each unit of appropriation in the budget would add transparency. Finally, with regard to budget, the charter should require that the mayor provide final revenue estimates earlier than is currently mandated. Then the charter would further empower the city's body to make better informed decisions. Just a few more things. Okay. Our ability to govern is also determined by the independence of our oversight bodies. For instance, the Office of Corporation Counsel provides legal guidance not only for the mayor, but to city government as a whole, like the borough president and the city council. The position of Corporation Counsel, we feel, should be advice and consent by the city council. The Civilian Complaint Review Board needs some changes in order to fulfill its role in ensuring the public has effective recourse when there are complaints about police conduct, and we will have some very specific suggestions for that. I am a believer in the local form of governance, community boards, without going into all the specifics of the previous uh, commission, uh, that was appointed by the mayor, I want to point out that I do not think that we should have term limits for community boards. That is our first line of defense in neighborhood planning. Finally, in the 1989 charter revision, when the Board of Estimate was abolished, a funding formula for borough presidents to, dis 
dispersed capital funding to the community was established based on the land area and population of each borough. It's a very important role. And my office has funded parks and schools and so on and lots of infrastructure. But according to a recent NYU study, Manhattan's population doubles every day as an additional two million commuters come into the island and taxing on infrastructure. This daily population spike is not reflected in the funding formula for borough presidents, and it should be. We have 60 million tourists and lots of commuters, not in the budget in terms of the priorities. Thank you for the opportunity to testify tonight. I will submit my written much longer testimony shortly. Thank you for all being here, and I'm really excited about this Charter Revision Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Gail. We're really excited that you took the time to come here, particularly when I know you have an important hearing across the street on Rikers Island and the decentralization of that facility. Um, we'd like to get you over there as soon as possible. So are there any questions from members of the commission? Allison Hirsch. Hi, Borough President. Thank you for being here. I just have two questions, and I know you um, need to get out. I'm for fine. The, um, it's a mess over there. There's 200 people who <laughs> can't get in, so it's much nicer to well, then, be here. Then I'll talk slowly, so Please. you don't have to go across the street. <laughs> um, I just had a question. If you could, uh, I have two questions. One is on the alternative application during the Euler process. Yep. Do you, can you explain how that would work? Would both applications go through the council simultaneously? Would the one be adopted within the other? What would the uh, practicalities of that look like? Well, it's a good question. In other words, the concept is, and the Inwood is an example, I can be a little bit more specific. Um, the city council, which I was on for 12 years, right now makes the final decisions, as you know, and they should. But the issue is, if you have some good ideas as borough presidents, and some borough presidents have good ideas, <laughs> community boards have good ideas, um, and this issue of retail is a big concern in Manhattan in particular, loss of mom and pops. And so what happened in Inwood, to be honest with you, is that we suggested that the size of the retails be uh, a certain size all across Inwood in the rezoning. Um, the city planning commission at the city council level refused to even include that in their proposal. So therefore, the mayor's office said, no, we won't do it. And understandably, because I've been in the city council, the clock ticks and you have to get through and vote. If, in fact, as the borough president, we could have said, this is a priority, an A text, application text, as it called for us, you wouldn't take the entire quote unquote recommendation that is essentially what the borough president's ULRP is, but you would take certain items and this would be part, just as the city council votes finally, it would be included as an application text in the final document. Got it, and I have um, one more question, changing the subject. Um, do you, you know, we've heard a lot of testimony about uh, different ways to reform the CCRB, yeah. and I was wondering, I know you mentioned that you think reform is a priority, if you have specific recommendations about how to do that. I have some. I'm, pretty familiar with zoning. I am less of an expert on the CCRB, to be honest with you. Um, but I will say that um, I know that at several of the hearings of this commission, the type has come up. Um, and I think the, apparently the current memorandum of understanding, which of course is an MOU, that provides for the administrative prosecution unit and that set forth the New York Police Department's duty to cooperate with the board needs to be codified and made permanent. And what that says in English, I believe, and I've just met with some of the board members of CCRB to talk about this, is that folks at the CCRB feel that sometimes what they suggest is not taken seriously at NYPD. So how do you, your goal is to have seriously uh, taken your recommendations. Now, how you accomplish that is something that I hope that you will focus on. Um, Commissioner Fiella? Madam Borough President. I love Staten not... Island, but you know who I really love? Jimmy Otto. I know. I <laughs> well, know. we love Steve Fiella as much as I know, we love but Jimmy I really, Otto. really, really love Jimmy Otto. I know. Everybody loves Jimmy Otto. <laughs> not as much as me. I love Jimmy Otto, too. I know. I thank him for the opportunity to be here. Can we see a show of hands for everyone who loves Jimmy Otto? 
Thank you. Madam Borough President, there are two areas, two very quick questions, one regarding your testimony and one concerning an area that's of particular concern to me. Regarding your testimony, you allude to moving the date in which the mayor uh, presents the council his final budget estimates. Do you have, do you have a specific time frame in mind? How, how much would you push it up? Well, I, um, I would have to get back to you on that. I okay. will tell you that, you know, again, as a member of the Finance Committee in the City Council, um, it was a big challenge to be able to come up with our list, and I'm sure the Speaker and his staff have the same problem now. Uh, not only were, was there a time issue, but you have to figure out what the revenue projection is going to be. And so you're constantly juggling. Um, and so, again, is this something that could be worked out? It would be preferable if it did. Um, I don't know. I, can't give, I can work on an exact date. I know the overall problem is that you spend a lot of time and then you find out that the uh, timing doesn't work for all the work that you've done. Okay. Um, the second area relates to service delivery. The 1989 charter spent a fair amount of time on this. Service delivery is essentially one of the most important things a municipal government does. The role of the borough president many would argue was eviscerated. I voted against that charter precisely for that reason, just in full disclosure. But the language in the existing charter, some would argue, in theory at least, provides borough presidents with a meaningful and substantial role in affecting service delivery outcomes in their boroughs. Is it your experience that the theory or the language that supports that statement, that borough presidents have a meaningful role in service delivery meets the reality? Or is there something that we could look at doing to enhance the role of a borough president so that that individual, he or she, has a meaningful voice in shaping the policies relating to delivery of services in the city? It's a great question. Um, I would say a couple of things. First of all, um, working with the community boards, we obviously have uh, borough service and we also have a borough board every single month. And to get the borough service, which is when the agencies and the uh, community uh, district leaders, community board district managers come every single month, you do not find a large number of city agencies participating and you don't see the kind of uh, data. I passed the open data bill when I was in the city council. So I really, really believe that this data that you're looking for, because the way to do service delivery is to know the data so you know where the challenges are in your borough. So the strengthening, to answer your question, which is an excellent one, would be to shore up and do some mandates for participation in the borough service and the borough board, and secondly, to figure out working with the community boards, either through staffing or better data presentation, and we spend hours and we train them and so on. They have monthly uh, borough service cabinets of their own with all the agencies. That data doesn't necessarily get accumulated in any kind of a meaningful way. So it would take a, a staffing and correlation with the budget and the program, which we talked about earlier in terms of the units of appropriation. But as usual, Staten Island has a great idea in terms of how you would take uh, looking at the borough, what is the Department of Transportation doing for Staten Island, what is it doing in terms of Parks Department, and is it getting its fair share? Um, that would be the, the metrics uh, uh, that you would be measuring against when you have enough data that's collected from the community boards and from the borough service. It is not done now. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Chair. Are there any other questions of Borough President Brewer? Give my best to Jimmy. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Um, uh, if I could ask people to put their phones on mute at a minimum, uh, everyone would appreciate, would appreciate that. I'm going to call up the next panel, and if you would come up quickly um, and speak succinctly, we would all appreciate it. Um, Helen Rosenthal, Keith Powers, Bradford Gonzalez-Sussman, 
Gregory. What? Flake. And John F. Manning. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Manning, I believe we've seen you before in Brooklyn. Uh, Craig Floyd, not Flake. I'm terribly sorry. Is that part of my three minutes? Is it going to be part of my three minutes if I say what happened? Yes. It's all part of your three minutes. No, I'm not doing that. <laughs> Helen Rosenthal? Great. Um, if I could give this to the somebody. Thank you very much. Um, before you start the clock, I, no, the, I just have to say starts. that turnabout, I guess, is fair play. I'm looking at some of you who I've been a little sharp with. I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, good evening. My name is Helen Rosenthal. I'm the city council member rep representing the Upper West Side, and I chair the city council's committee on women. I'd like to begin by thanking the members of the Charter Revision Commission for their service and for providing residents across the city with the opportunity to testify. I have two issues for your consideration. First, that the charter be revised to integrate the United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, CEDAW, and two, that the charter identify mechanisms to hold the city accountable for its con contract procurement process. So first, as as to do with the gender equity issue. As chair of the Committee on Women, I've come to believe that the circumstances that are unique to women or under which women are particularly vulnerable are not considered a priority by our own New York City agencies. Through lawmaking, we've made some strides from providing menstrual products in the city's schools, jails, and homeless shelters to passing anti-sexual harassment in the workplace laws. In my written testimony, I reference recent oversight hearings on the NYPD Special Victims Division and on sexual violence in city jails. Both hearings revealed the stark vulnerabilities that women face. My hope is that by including CEDAW principles in our charter, women's unique experiences would be prioritized within the mission of each city agency, perhaps empowering the Equal Employment Practices Commission and requiring them to issue an annual public action report could be one way of achieving that goal. On procurement reform, we must first recognize that the city relies on contracted nonprofits to provide a vast range of essential city services, from mental health care to senior centers and daycares to more than 2.5 million vulnerable New Yorkers. The providers are chronically underfunded and are often paid 8 to 12 months late. With the goal to increase transparency and accountability, I have a couple of suggestions. We have to shine a light on late payments to human service sector contracts. The city has to reimburse for interest payments that nonprofits must pay for loans taken out to cover the cost of providing government services prior to contract registration. And information about the procurement status of capital projects, which can take decades to complete, must be made public, nearly done. For the controller, we have to ensure that contracts submitted to the controller are subject to a 30-day limit for registration, and that this 30-day period is paused, not restarted, if a contract is rejected, then resubmitted for consideration. Similarly, when the controller, the controller must publicly report the reasons for rejecting contracts and identify whether or not they are within the scope of the controller's charter allowed reasons for rejection. In other words, 
We must take politics out of the contract process. And lastly, and this is a suggestion, that we empower the Procurement Policy Board, the PPB. We require that they have public meetings at least four times a year. And we provide PPB with the authority to make changes to city procurement rules if these changes can help expedite contract registration. There is an urgent need for robust and meaningful procurement reform, and I am hopeful that this commission can identify ways to do so in the New York City Charter. Thank you. Thank you very much, Commissioner Rosenthal. Are there any questions? No. Thank you very much. Um, I look forward to seeing more testimony from you in on some of these issues of procurement, which I think are very important, but very dry. <laughs> not you, not you being dry, but just that the public finds the issues of procurement. <laughs> we can say it. Um, but we may have to hire a special prosecutor. <laughs> the next speaker is Council Member Keith Powers. Thank you, thank you, and good evening. And I don't believe Helen Rosenthal is dry. She's animated and she's no, uh, not Helen. Up important issues. Uh, my name is Keith Powers. I'm a city council member representing District 4 Manhattan, which encompasses a big part of Midtown in, in Manhattan, the Upper East Side, where I live, Stuyvesant Town, and Peter Cooper. Um, and I'm testifying here on behalf of myself, many of the constituents I see here from my district tonight, and also as a member of the Progressive Caucus, who's been coming to all these hearings to talk about improvements in the planning and land use process here in New York City. Um, so thank you for the, for the ability to testify. I've submitted what is our testimony as the caucus that encompasses many things you've heard. I, I believe by, test, uh, by hearing five, you've heard this a few times. So for brevity and time, I just wanted to talk about, uh, I think what is our biggest issue right here today, which is, and the speaker touched upon this as well, which is to have a better framework for land use development and planning in the city. And many are referring to it as a more comprehensive planning process. And I believe this is a crucial topic for this charter revision to commission to address, not, be, not just because it hasn't been addressed a long time, but I actually believe the members on this charter revision commission are uniquely qualified to be able to take issues around land use and development. Um, as you've heard from colleagues at other hearings, many regular New Yorkers, many who are here today, feel generally unsatisfied with the current land use process and the strategy in the city. The current system seems to frustrate almost everybody, whether it's community members, organizers, elected officials, those in the development world, and planners. Um, as an elected official, I can tell you in my so 10 months here that it's a frustrating process trying to balance the needs of a growing and global and 21st century city with the often raised and rightful concerns about the impact of development, whether it's about affordability, height and density, impact on the ground level businesses, or many more of the other issues that come up as we're building and growing here as a city. The, re many that, the reason that many of us are favoring a process that looks at the beginning of this long term is because we believe that a comprehensive process will actually create a guiding set of principles and ideas that provide, provide relief from that tension that, and make us better at addressing the long-term needs of, the, of our neighborhoods and of the boroughs that we live in. Um, and as we are a global city that aspires to be changing and to be growing endlessly, um, I think that a long-term process for each borough or each, for each neighborhood would be better situated to give us a starting point to analyze applications that come before us and also to create a set of goals about infrastructure, school seats, other needs that we have in our communities rather than just taking particular uh, applications one at a time. I think many here have sort of experienced that frustration of how does one project fit into the bigger picture picture that we have as goals, I think it really actually the truth be everybody would be better situated to have some sort of starting point to, to begin to go through. Um, there are other recommendations that have been made, the controllers made some about how to, how to uh, improve representation and reflection of city planning and other processes. So I won't go into detail on those. I have six seconds, but I, um, but I would just mention some other personal things I care about uh, in addition to that. Voting, we, uh, the speaker brought it up, but looking at things like instant runoff voting as an alternative to the low turnout special elections right now uh, for the three citywide offices, perhaps looking at other offices, I think is a good place, thing to look at. Um, our city budget, uh, procurement included in that, but 
really making sure that our city budget gives us a path to making having long-term savings, having long-term planning in our city budget as well, because I think we also are taking to see sometimes one budget at a time, having accurate revenue estimates in the budget, and putting us on a path to be fiscally responsible uh, and not and make council members be able to be part of that process and know that we're meeting those goals. And the last thing I'd say with my last zero seconds is um, as the chair of the Criminal Justice Committee in the City Council too, I, I don't think this has been discussed, but there is a part, a section of the charter that the, the discusses the correction system and the criminal justice system in New York City. It's not; re it's pretty muted on many topics around criminal justice, um, and we're going to submit, I think, more details and proposals around things that could be improved in that. But I think it's an area that's been absent in this co conversation today about the city charter. And I know there's many people who are in here that also care deeply about the criminal justice and correction system, and would love to see even some thoughts in this process around whether that can be improved as part of this as well. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Are there any questions, Sal? Good evening. Um, in terms of infrastructure, the city's infrastructure, as well as the state and probably the country, is in disastrous shape. Uh, we don't seem to have a process in place in New York City for evalu evaluating our bridges, our roads, our mass transit system. Do you have any idea, any proposals on how we, on a regular basis, assess our infrastructure in this town? Yeah, good question. Uh, I, I think, for, I mean, just to take a step back to what I said earlier, is we don't set any goals in like any particular community board or community to say how much affordable housing do we need. And when we get applications, we always have this tension here about how many affordable housing units do we have? It's near a subway line. Should that be a place where we should building versus other areas? There's, we, I know this has come up, but the NIMBY and the YIMBY and all the other acronyms. Um, we should set some goals. I mean, I think we really should have identity, uh, identifying which neighborhoods really are good for growth, which are good for uh, or need infrastructure. Um, I think that certainly city planning should be, and, and department buildings and all the sort of ecosystem around land use and development should be doing maybe more regular uh, identification of what the needs are and then having some measurement tool to go against it. Um, I, because we, go, we see buildings go up, but we don't know how many people, I, I think, every day are going to end up on the subway system or how many school suits we need. I think we do some of that. In terms of how we can better address that or, or understand it, um, I'll have to come back to you on that, to be to honest. But I think starting to have a measurement tool or our goals at the beginning would at least give us an idea to say when we're reviewing ULERP's applications or just looking at as a right development, whether we're, you know, whether we are in the ballpark or not. Thank you. Are there any, Commissioner Nuri? I'm either doing something right or wrong. If I'm getting okay, yeah. Thank you, Council Member. I think it's fair to say that this is the second most important hearing of the day. Would people agree with that? Um, I agree. My question to you is, with respect to fair share, I understand the concept in theory, but would you and, and the members of the Progressive Caucus be sensitive to issues mm -hmm. of citing things like homeless shelters and services for the disabled in the communities in which people already live? Is that a consideration that we should take into account? So fair share is definitely a topic that we've discussed, both at the Progressive Caucus and among city council members who are discussing it, and a feeling like the way it's set up right now is not adequate to the needs of it. To be honest, fair share is a really highly debated topic because of the sort of the outcomes that get associated with it. I'll tell you, somebody who has maybe vocally supported homeless shelters at times in my very crowded and dense district, um, understanding that it's all districts that have to take a take a, a part of solving problems for the city. Um, it's a very difficult process. I think there is a real appetite amongst us to revisit that. And I think you'll see a tension about whether, um, when you talk about fair share, of course, about whether you should be creating, creating limitations in certain areas or making it a, pr a place where every everybody is open and available for it. Um, I know that other members have from, the, the, from the caucus have come and talked about the need to improve the definitions of fair shares, which I think would at least give us some better guiding, guiding rails and when we talk about it, or, or when we make decisions about what should be in different districts. But I just personally have felt like in the middle of Manhattan, we have to be you know, both sensitive to all the density and the safety issues, but also part of solving the problem, problems. And we'll, thank you, Council Member. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, the next speaker is Bradford Gonzalez Sussman. Good evening. 
Good evening, Chairwoman Benjamin and members of the Charter Revision Commission. My name is Bradford Gonzalez Sussman and I'll, uh, from Pitta Bishop, and I will be presenting uh, the testimony of Lance Van Arsdale, Jr., um, IBW Local 3 Assistant Business Manager. Uh, good evening. Thank you for this opportunity to submit testimony regarding potential changes to the New York City Charter. Um, my name is Lance Van Arsdale, and I am the Assistant Business Manager of International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers, Local Union Number 3, AFL-CIO, Local 3. Local 3 represents nearly 28,000 workers throughout New York City and surrounding counties. For nearly half a century, about 1,800 of these members have been telecommunications workers, first working for Time Warner Cable, and then subsequently Charter Communications, a.k.a. Spectrum. The relationship between these workers and their employees throughout Local 3's bargaining relationship with them has been significantly impacted by the New York City Charter's provisions regarding franchises, primarily contained in sections 363, 365, 372, 373, 375, and 376. Based upon Local 3's experience with the, with the operations of these franchisees, and with the process by which they receive their franchises, we are convinced that the current franchise framework contained in the Charter is flawed, favors franchisees and prospective franchisees, and shields the process from meaningful community input and public scrutiny. But having these decades of direct experience with the telecommunications companies is not required to be able to identify that there is a major failure in the provisioning of telecommunications services in our city. I'm sure that any person in attendance tonight could rattle off a list of problems that they are experiencing with their cable television, telephone, or internet service. Attached to this testimony are proposed changes to the previously cited sections of the Charter, as well as to others. Recognizing that the Commission may be reticent to completely change the framework by which these franchisees are negotiated and awarded by the City, these changes would certainly provide more transparency to an opaque process. However, Local 3 truly believes that for any meaningful improvement uh, upon the process, which will empower local communities and which will better ensure these companies to whom the city grants the enormous and lucrative benefit of a franchise for any service, but especially for telecommunications, this commission must consider an alternative mechanism for the franchise process. In that regard, the framework of the Uniform Land Use Review Procedure, ULERP, we believe is a good model. As members of the Commission, you likely are familiar with the history of ULERP and how it was intended to encourage local community input into zoning and land use decisions. In the wake of the decades of infrastructure developments commissioned by Robert Moses over the objections of local communities. Ultimately, the franchise process is one that, implicate, that implicates land use. A, franchi a franchise permits a franchisee the considerable benefit of using the inalienable property of the city for a fixed period of time, in some cases up to 50 years, to provide services to city residents. In the telecommunications context, the franchisee's use of the city's inalienable property includes the ability to install infrastructure needed to deliver services to the franchisee's customers. The construction, the, the construction attendant to this infrastructure installation and maintenance, or the failure to do so, has tremendous impact on local communities. For this reason, the franchi franchise process, while being directed by an agency with particular expertise in the area, should authorize community boards, borough presidents, and city council members to have a specific role in the negotiation of the terms of a franchise and the, sec and the selection of a franchisee. May I read the last couple sentences? Very quickly. Very quickly. I'll read fast. Recognizing there is limited time this evening and many others that wish to testify, I have, I have limited my remarks, but I welcome the opportunity to speak with you or your staff further about changes to the franchise process. We need a process that ensures that local communities have a formal and meaningful role in the decision making related to franchise, franchises. Only then will multinational corporations that invariably are the franchisees be accountable to the needs of New Yorkers and not merely to their shareholders. Thank you. I'm going to, as chair, take my prerogative. Um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the franchises or if you're reading uh, Van, Mr. Van Ordsdale's 
speech, but if you are, then you must be aware that the franchise process involves, is a multi-step process that involves an authorizing resolution that comes to the city council, and if there are major land use impacts, then it would go through ULERP and would go to the community board, the borough board, the city planning commission, and again, the council. However, that would be on the land use issues. The contract itself is solely within the purview of the SCRC and the mayor. So when you're suggesting that it should go through ULERP, are you suggesting that the current process where it may go through ULERP, ULERP is insufficient? Or are you suggesting that every franchise, no matter how insignificant, should go through ULERP? The, in the complete testimony, uh, the, the sections that we're recommending um, uh, get analyzed are, are, are black-lined. I just uh, read the... Are what? Are, 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 are black-lined, are noted in the, in the complete testimony. I just read the, the, the cover Highlights. letter to the... Thank you. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. Are thank there you. any other questions? No questions, Carl? <laughs> um, the next speaker is Mr. Flake, whose name I originally pronounced wrong, and I'm Floyd, quite sorry. Floyd. Floyd. It's Mr. Floyd. And I did it again. I get that a lot. <laughs> well, I don't know if this is your handwriting, but... Um, it, it may be. I'm, I apologize. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Chair Benjamin, commissioners, for allowing me to come here and testify. My name is Gregory Floyd. I'm president of Local 237 Teamsters, and I am testifying with the proposal of the city council approve any sale, lease, or management of public housing. Despite decades of efforts to encourage the creation of low-cost private housing, New Yorkers continue to face severe shortage of affordable housing, and our city's most significant source of permanent affordable housing remains public housing. Traditionally, a mix of city and state and federally owned buildings under the control of the management of the mayor and his appointees through NYCHA. Beginning under Mayor Bloomberg and continuing under Mayor de Blasio, NYCHA has embarked on a series of so-called public-private partnerships, including infill and participation in the Federal Rental Assistance Development Program, RAD. At their core, these projects hand over publicly owned and managed low-income housing land for profit interests. The uh, dissimulating of the addition of public housing is urgent concern to half a million disabled working poor and senior citizens that call NYCHA their home. So are their living wages, union, civil service protections that generations of NYCHA workers have fought for. To date, details of these private deals and potential consequences of removing affordable housing from the public stock have largely been hidden from voters. These backroom deals must stop. Our public housing system is one of the city's most affordable public assets and safety nets Decisions on this future should be conducted in full transparency. RAD works as transferring public housing units to the private sector. As our current homeless and affordable housing crisis make clear, the public-private sector cannot be counted on to create and maintain adequate affordable housing. A recent GAO study found that HUD is failing to adequately track impacts on tenants, monitor potential violations of resident rights under the law and HUD policies. While it is clear what private developers gain from RAD conversions, valuable public access, access and public funding is not all clear. If anything, NYCHA residents and our city uh, taxpayers, what do they get from that process? Take the Triborough building conversions where the de Blasio administration was accused of intentionally sidestepping the city's uniform land use review procedures when it sanctioned NYCHA's sale of properties. Two of the Triborough partners, BFC and LNM, 
have been targeted by building trades unions for their use of non uh, non use labor, uh, non union labor. So I, I just don't, I'll submit the testimony later, but I just want to say it is important and we cannot trust the sale of the last public housing stock and affordable housing in this city to any one person and this administration. We should use the city council and all 51 of its members to approve any lease sales and management of these properties. Thank you very much. Please, please. Are there any questions for Mr. I have, I have Floyd? A yeah. Sal? Um, thank you, Mr. Floyd. And uh, you hit on a very good point here. Sadly, public housing is the only affordable housing left in this town. Um, and uh, of course, uh, we know the scandals surrounding it, the terrible neglect. Uh, but specifically on the RAD program, which is private contractors handling um, issues in some developments, is the city is not just saving any money through that program or are the contractors making money and the employees are getting paid less? Have you done an analysis of that? Well, yes. The, the city is getting the um, money from the federal government. But here's the difference. The management companies coming in make all the money. The employees don't make any money. And the residents see an improvement through that. However, there is a potential of the um, homes, those apartments, going market rate in 10 years. And other cities, the uh, affordable housing has disappeared, and so has public housing. And Maxine Waters, who a lot of us in this uh, hall respects, wrote two letters to President Obama objecting to the creation of the RAD program. It, it, but is the city's argument going to be that, that we save a lot of money and-, and, and No, the city's argument is going to be they get funding from it. But uh, in Cambridge, Massachusetts, which this union took a trip to, they've managed to keep the unionized employees and also keep the affordable stock intact, and they manage their housing far better in Cambridge, Massachusetts, where this mayor happens to have come from, much better than they do in New York City. So the RAD program allows for federal funding to come in. Without it, we wouldn't get the federal funding? Is that, is that the issue? Well, it's a, it's, a, it's, it's a federal funding that's available now going through HUD, and it's a different program. So the um, Obama administration set it up that way, as opposed to just HUD dispensing money to the um, housing developments. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Miller. Thank you, Mr. Floyd, for your testimony and for all your work. Undoubtedly, we've been hearing throughout all four boroughs so far, including tonight, that uh, there's no affordable housing in New York City, and even housing that's defined as affordable is really not affordable. It's come to my attention that there's a little known uh, federal housing law that states that if residents of NYCHA or public housing have the wherewithal to organize, even if the city talks about using NYCHA land to, to do development, they have first rights of refusal. I'm sure if more people knew about that, there'd be less talk about developing NYCHA land. So my question is, is real simple. Uh, perhaps your local could be more instrumental in bringing us more information about these federal laws, Local 237? Well, I'm unfamiliar with that because we, we just represent the employees, but I can have some attorneys sure. look into that for us because I'm not familiar with what right. you just said and I don't know that to be the fact. It's been brought to my attention that it, there is a law, such law. I'd like to know more about it if it exists. Yeah, I, I just don't know that to be a fact. Okay, just, all right. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Manning. My name is John Manning. I am a resident of Brooklyn and a civil servant. I speak this evening to ask the Charter Revision Commission to prioritize the issue of protecting our city and its communities from the negative aspects of overdevelopment. 
historic preservation, environmental protection, and the sustainability of neighborhoods that working people call home are three vitally important concerns for the long-term future of our city. We must require and empower the Department of City Planning and the rest of city government to address the overexploitation of our neighborhoods, the displacement of people of modest means, and the destruction of our national heritage. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. The City of New York and the Greater New York Region have a rich heritage and a beautiful natural environment. This is the finest natural harbor on the Atlantic seaboard. Lower Manhattan and Brooklyn are among the places where our nation's history began. My neighborhood, Bay Ridge, is zoned so that buildings are not taller than six stories. It is a wonderful community to live in or visit. Brooklyn Heights and other sections of northern and central Brooklyn are national treasures. One block from my apartment building, there is a small Revolutionary War cemetery. Two blocks away, there is a botanical garden maintained by community volunteers. Due to the political power and influence enjoyed by the real estate industry, general contractors, and other special interests, and their lobbyists, all over town, there is an enormous square box high rise going up. Many of these buildings are eyesores. Working class people and small business owners are being displaced. Communities that contribute a lot to the city are being destroyed. It is absurd that government policy encourages this while our mass transit and infrastructure needs are neglected. In many European cities during the post-World War II reconstruction, there was a blend of modern buildings and the restoration of historic areas and city quarters. We can do that here. Historic preservation is not just one building, it should be an area. We meet tonight in a charming 200-year-old landmark. Two blocks away at the South Street Seaport is a slice of 19th century urban America. However, here in Lower Manhattan, in almost every space that becomes available, garish, ugly, high-rise build buildings are springing up all over. Constructing new buildings and blocks that are aesthetically pleasing, neighborhood friendly, and affordable for working people is something we can do. Small to medium sized parks and gardens are vital to a stable community. I asked the Charter Revision Commission when drafting proposed city planning and land use law to not be beholden to the rich and powerful, but to appreciate the need for a city that is enjoyable to live in, where people who work for a living have a secure place, and the importance of the legacy we will leave behind for future generations. Thank you. Excuse me, if we could, I understand that you are supportive of what Mr. Manning has says, as are many people, but it really Let's just takes time away from your friends and neighbors who would like to testify if after every speaker we have Um, are there any questions for Mr. Manning? Allison? Um, do you have specific proposals about how you would go about changing the land use process or zoning laws to accomplish what you're suggesting in the testimony? Um, I think we have to recognize the problem that we addressed in the Brooklyn hearing that uh, the uh, Real Estate Board and the General Co uh, Contractors Association basically control the city's power establishment and we need to empower community boards and ordinary citizens. Having said to answer your question, again in Bay Ridge the area is zoned so st uh, buildings don't go higher than six stories and we have some lovely charming blocks and we, uh, if you get into Dyker Heights and Bensonhurst uh, there is uh, affordable housing. There is some affordable housing in Bay Ridge, depending how you define it. Um, I uh, grew up in Peter Cooper Village, Stuyvesant Town. The working class uh, World War II veterans who moved in in the late 40s, that was the government and the private sector working together. Uh, when I was in the service, I was stationed in Germany. If you visit Europe, you're going to find uh, places that were bombed out or fought over during the war and the reconstruction. They have gleaming glass and steel towers, uh, BMW headquarters. They also have charming middle um, evil and renaissance uh, blocks and buildings that are wonderful to walk down. You, we can have a blend. 
you know, we can build new buildings that are lovely, like Brooklyn Heights and uh, that sort of thing. Everything doesn't have to be a square box, 100-story eyesore. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Manning. Any other questions? Okay. The next panel is, we need one more. Oh. The next panel is Rachel Bloom, Bella Wong, and Kate Doran, Frank Morano, and Jeff Weiss. So did Mr. Manning. What? Because they're in a different box. So Weiss left. Okay. So. Um, I'd like to have uh, Mr. David Ford. You want to mention how long the wait is going to be? I don't know. It's up to you. I'll do it after this panel. Um, Ms. For, uh, Ms. Bloom? Oh. Okay. Do I need to move over? No. Okay. Good evening, Chair Benjamin and distinguished members of the New York City Charter Revision Commission. My name is Rachel Bloom. I'm the Director of Public Policy and Programs at Citizens Union, a good government group here in New York City and State. We thank you for holding this and other hearings throughout the city um, and giving us the opportunity to publicly share recommendations with you. We offer our congratulations to the commissioners. Um, the first one comprised of nominees from all branches of New York City government, and the first one convened by council legislation. We hope the diversity of perspectives will lead to some bold reforms in the charter process. Throughout its history, Citizens Union has supported periodic comprehensive review of the New York City Charter, absent a political agenda via the appointment of an independent Charter Revision Commission to ensure that city government is operating effectively, efficiently, and in the public's interest. We believe that this commission must not simply revise, but undertake some bold reforms. The process and recommendations that come out of it must strengthen the integrity and transparency of government institutions so that public confidence is greater and New Yorkers are able to better participate in, government, in governmental decision making. Over the coming months, uh, Citizens Union will be submitting detailed testimony on a host of issues. You'll probably see my face many more times um, in the following broad categories. The first categories listed below are ones that we identified in partnership with our good government partners at the League of Women Voters of New York City and reInvent Albany. They are election reform, open government and transparency, ethics reform, government efficiency and accountability, and land use reform. Tonight, I will focus my recommendations in the area of election reform. We will testify on the other ones in, up, in upcoming hearings. Our first recommendation in election reform is to institute a top two election system. Um, we urge you to consider establishing um, a system making the first primary election open to all eligible voters, regardless of party status, so that every registered voter can participate in the primary, which is often the most determinative in who is going to be elected to office in New York City. When we talk about elections and primaries, there's 1.38 million voters who are now effectively chosen, shut out from choosing many of the city's um, elected officials because they are not affiliated with the Democratic Party. Um, second, as you've heard before tonight, institute ranked choice voting. We um, urge you to consider this, that candidates, so that voters can rank their preference for um, candidates rather than allowing them to vote for only one. Our third recommendation, I'm being quick to meet my time, increase ballot access by reducing petitioning signature requirements. Um, uh, lowering the signature requirement would likely enable more candidates to get on the ballot because they could better withstand aggressive challenges from other candidates. And as we saw recently, competitive elections get people to turn out to vote. Too often our elections aren't very competitive. 
Number four, we ask you to enact true independent council redistricting, which the Mayoral Charter Revision Commission wanted to look at, but said they didn't have the time to really comprehensively address it. Um, while the city appears to have an independent redistricting commission, it is independent in name only because all of its members are directly chosen by elected officials. There's too close a connection between those who draw the lines and those who appoint them, and those who appoint them. So um, I will, you'll be hearing from me later. The only thing is um, uh, when you look at the, who's going to be on the ballot in 2019, potentially, you know, seeing if you can move your uh, referendums to 2020 so that um, we will have more people and more New Yorkers voting on whatever it is that you propose um, to reform our city charter. Thank you. Thank you very much. I wish we could move it to 2020, but it's my understanding that due to both the legislation adopted and the rules concerning charter revision commissions that we would run the risk of being bumped by a mayoral commission. Um, and I understand Mr. Albanese has a question for you. Yes. On the Independent Redistricting Commission, um, what is the, uh, the shape of that commission that Citizens Union recommends to make sure that it's independent? I think you raised a valid point. H how do you craft such a commission? So um, we propose that one-third or five members, including the chair and executive director of the Redistricting Commission, be appointed by the campaign finance board, creating wow. a buffer between the council and the mayor. Campaign finance board? <laughs> oh. I thought we were going to be independent. They are an independent right. agency. Oh. Appointed by the mayor and the city council. Well, I'm sorry. Continue. Um, we can, considering this will create a buffer that we are hoping to have, um, and then Consequently, the redistricting commission will have greater independence to draw the lines that more accurately reflect um, coherent city communities. Um, so we want to also support prohibiting the drawing of lines to favor any uh, favor or oppose oh, any political party. I understand. The, I think we understand the concept. Yeah. The shape of it is the issue. So the shape of it is to add five new uh, to assign seats to the campaign finance board and then uh, any plans to reform it will have to be approved by 11 of 15 redistricting commissioners instead of the current nine. Commissioner Fiella. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Ms. Bloom, thank you for your testimony and thank you to Citizens Union for uh, their submission. I'd like to focus on the nonpartisan election issue. Mm -hmm. I served on the previous two charter commissions. We chose not to take up the issue. The last charter commission to take up the issue was 2003. Four commissions prior to 2003 took up and extensively studied and debated the issue and felt there was merit. Finally, in 2003, the issue was brought before the voters of New York. Citizens Union, by my recollection, and collect, correct me if I'm wrong, because I often am, <laughs> Citizens Union had opposed nonpartisan elections. You are correct. In four of those five attempts, but in 2003, your organization changed its course. I'm wondering if you could walk us through the thought process. How, how in the course of a year, do you go from being against to four and secondarily, what's changed yes. since 2003? Voters exactly rejected this say. proposal by 70%. I was hoping for a different outcome. But by 70%, they rejected it. Has the case been strengthened since 2003? What is that, 15 years ago? Or weakened? I think I know the answer, but <laughs> Citizens Union in particular has a pretty interesting history with this subject, and I'm curious to uh, find out what your what your thoughts are. I unfortunately can't really answer uh, that in great detail about the change uh, within Citizens Union. Although we have historically, over our 120 years, um, you know, our policies are, are developed by our committees and then approved by the board. We have changed our position over the years on several issues. Um, so I can't speak to the details of that because I was long before my time. Regarding voters having voted it down 15 years ago, I mean, 
there's a lot that's changed since then. I think notably the 2016 election um, with so many people wanting to, I really, I think it really rose, rose to the forefront, the issue that New York State has the longest lag time of any state in the country when it comes to changing your party registration. Um, you basically, if you want to vote in a party registration, have to change your registration a year in advance. And even if the makeup of Albany has changed, whether that's going to be one of their top election reforms is very, is a question that no one has the answer to. But um, right now there's no movement in Albany to change that. People are incensed about it. People wanted to vote for, um, vote in the primary elections in 2016 and hundreds of thousands of people couldn't and they, it really rose the issue and it's something that's talked about by voters in New York in a way that wasn't talked about um, I think before, because it, it, all these new voters excited by Trump, excited by Sanders, wanted to go out and vote and support them, and they weren't able to, including Donald Trump's children who are registered in New York and couldn't change their party in time. So um, it's an issue that impacts all New Yorkers, all parties across party lines, and when you look at the number of New Yorkers that aren't registered with a party and how many elections, how many primaries in New York really determine who's basically going to win the election in most, in most cases. Um, it, it really should be something, I think it's an issue uh, whose time has come to be reconsidered, especially in light of the lack of movement in Albany when it comes to this. Thank you very much. Seeing no other questions, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Wong? Uh, okay. Uh, good, uh, good evening, uh, Chair Benjamin and members of the Charter Revision Commission. I want to. Um, I'm not sure your mic is on. Oh, is it not? It's a little it's button on the bottom. I, it's got. That should be red. It's red. So maybe I just need to speak. You got to pick it. it up then. Yes. Okay. So uh, good evening. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak. Uh, my name is Bella Wong. I'm the Voting Reform Chair of the League of Women if, Voters. If you could move it closer, sure. you're not getting picked up. I will continue up. to get it. Is it? He how about here? That's good. Great. Uh, so uh, I'm representing the uh, League of Women Voters in the City of New York. I'm here with Kate Duran, who is our election specialist, and we we are a multi-issue, uh, nonpartisan political organization that promotes informed and active participation in government at the national, state, and local level. Uh, we, I, I believe, have already testified uh, with respect to a couple other issues involving elections. So today we're going to focus on supporting instant runoff voting in New York City, uh, also known as ranked choice voting. Uh, we have supported this process since 2010 when we advocated for it to be implemented for the special nonpartisan elections that fill city council vacancies, uh, as well as for absentee and military voters in the 2013 primaries for citywide offices since uh, it's a very elaborate process to get ballots back and forth for those individuals. So uh, our interest was tipped off uh, in part uh, by the 2009-2013 citywide democratic primaries. Uh, in those years, we had runoff elections because no public advocate candidate received 40% or more of the vote. Uh, that meant that there was a runoff election in both co cases, each costing the city $13 million, uh, while the turnout was a mere 7%. So this is clearly not a very representative way to uh, think about how uh, the people of New York City should be voting for the public office. Uh, as a result, we looked for alternatives uh, which would achieve the stated goal of electing candidates who have significant voter support without requiring a second election. So ranked choice voting is great in this way uh, because it allows you to rank all of your candidates, uh, at which point there is a process uh, by which people's second, third, and even fourth choices may be taken into account, uh, thereby allowing us to avoid an, uh, a runoff, uh, an in-person second runoff, uh, because you have a second, uh, you have an instant runoff, one in which we already know your preferences and are thus able to figure out who has a broad base of support. So, uh, with my last 30 seconds, we have a few uh, reasons uh, beyond the stated ones that I, uh, I think will be important to this issue. Um, at the time when we first proposed it, uh, we still had lever voting, but now we have uh, electronic voting, uh, which will greatly increase the uh, speed and efficacy of the tabulation. Uh, voters in other places, such as San Francisco, have long adopted this uh, new rule and have found it to be easy to comprehend, easy to use, and in fact, in many cases, less confusing than other sorts of uh, election methods. Uh, and lastly, I think it's very good for rhetoric. Um, 
uh, because it is in the interest of politicians to appeal to people as the second choice as well as their first choice of voters, uh, it uh, encourages a certain temperance, we believe, in uh, rhetoric uh, to avoid creating this sort of uh, antagonistic rhetoric that we currently see in campaigns today. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to thank uh, particularly Speaker Johnson and uh, Councilman Powers for uh, also mentioning instant runoff voting. Uh, I think it's a really great issue and be very important to the city. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Wong. Are there any questions? Sal? Just a quick question. Uh, you know that this was considered by the Mayor's Commission. Um, yes. And uh, it seems like a no-brainer. Uh, why do you think they punted on it? Well, I can't speak as to that, but I think we have a great opportunity here to take it up again. Well, you're, you're, you're a politician. <laughs> you. Asked and answered. Okay. Uh, my name is Kate Doran. And uh, Diane speak Diane. into oh. the mic, please. You've got to put it really close. My name is Kate Doran, and as Bella mentioned, I'm the election specialist. And uh, uh, we watched very closely the Mayor's Commission, Charter Revision Commission, and our understanding is that there was just a division among the members of the commission, that they couldn't, they couldn't decide that this was an important. Uh, what was the rationale? What was the division about? I believe we heard some talk that there were certain commissioners who believed that they wanted to see a head-to-head -head contest, that that was important to see two people facing off against each other in these, in these runoffs rather than the instant runoff. Sorry. Uh, Ms. Doran? Yes. Would you like to give your testimony? I have nothing further to add. We're a well, uh, united front. We, we did it together, and Bella did a uh, fine Paula? Uh, I th thank you very much for being here and, and your testimony. How many members are there in the League of Women Voters in New York City? Um, I believe we have approximately 350, something, something like that. Something like that, and several of them are here tonight. Sorry. And so this represents really the yes. the uh, the feeling of that collective body. Oh, absolutely. That's the way we operate. Grassroots decision making. Super. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. The next speaker is. Frank Morano, I think we've seen you in other boroughs. Good evening, Commissioners. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be heard this evening. I do hope uh, that when your schedules permit, you'll review my written testimony. Uh, out of respect for your time and everyone else's here, I'm going to try and keep my remarks brief. And there are a number of aspects of charter suggestions in my written testimony that I'm not going to have the opportunity to get into here. And uh, Commissioner Albanese and Commissioner Vaca at the Queen's hearing on the 20th um, were kind enough to ask me a bit about um, the initiative and referendum process and ranked choice voting. So uh, I didn't include those in my prior written remarks, but I've done a, a fair amount of research that's included in these that I hope you'll look at. And far be it to correct um, Commissioner Fiala, who's one of the people in public life that I admire most, but Citizens Union actually opposed nonpartisan elections in 2003. It was in 2010, seven years later, that they changed their position on it. And they cited um, that turnout had grown so low and elections were so preordained that parties should lose their domineering power. Seven years more of watching the disaster of city government led them to that conclusion. And I think they were right. But one thing Citizen Union said in 2003 when they opposed nonpartisan elections was if the mayor's commission really wanted to put forward a progressive proposal that was really going to include more people in the process, they should look at proportional representation. And I think they were right about that, too. Now, part of the challenge that you have is that even though you have two years, you're looking at the entire city charter. Now, what that means for us, the public, as we're offering you suggestions, is we have no idea necessarily where to focus. Doesn't make sense for us to talk about um, enhancing the powers of the Office of Public Advocate, for instance, if you're going to abolish the Office of Public Advocate. Doesn't make sense for me to spend a lot of time talking about uh, what the petition requirements should be for d political parties if we're going to have nonpartisan elections. That being said, I do hope you will schedule in your election reform aspect of your study, maybe in the next round of hearings, one evening or maybe even a series of evenings dedicated to studying 
proportional representation. The 11 years that New York City's legislature, the city council, was elected by proportional representation was really the golden age in terms of diversity. Not just racial and gender diversity when we saw the first women elected and the first African Americans elected, but political diversity. You saw people other than Tammany Hall Democrats getting elected for the first time. You saw independent Democrats, Republicans, third party candidates. And the only reason it was abolished was because two communists were elected at the height of the Red Scare. And that's no way to determine the ideal composition of a legislature. So there are a lot of different ways to utilize proportional representation. And I do hope you'll hold a hearing where you hold, hear from experts with some suggestions about how to include both partisan and nonpartisan models for proportional representation. The only other thing I'll mention this evening is the issue of coterminous districts. Community board districts, we have 59 in the city. We have 51 council districts. That means it's not unusual to have two or three council members staff and service and work with a community board. And that is a tremendously inefficient process. It causes district managers and community board chairs to have to deal with two or three council offices. It causes council members to have to send staffers to two or three different community boards. It would be much more simple to have simply either 51 community districts or 59 council districts and have the districts be coterminous, one council member per community board district. Thank you very much. Steve? Uh, first of all, thank you for correcting me and the record. Um, let's take this backwards. I, I, Coterminality is something I'm in agreement with and tried in past commissions to uh, redress that. Nonpartisanship. Let's just cut to the chase mm. because we've studied this thing forever. What do you say to people who oppose it that say blanks, meaning the unaffiliated, Republicans, independents, conservatives, working families, they all chose their party or they chose not to be affiliated. They made an adult choice not to be affiliated Therefore, they knew the consequences. This is their right to do so. So if they want to sit in another party or no party at all, they forfeit the opportunity to have a meaningful voice in municipal elections. How do you come back to that? I think, choice? I, I think penal, I, I find that attitude and that supposition incredibly insulting and smacking of political bigotry of the worst type. I think to penalize people for their political beliefs by saying they don't get any meaningful voice in selecting their elected officials is about as un-American as anything I can possibly imagine. You want to tell a registered Democrat in your old council district in the South Shore of Staten Island who hates Donald Trump that believes he's a racist Russian agent with a double-digit IQ that they have to register as a Republican in order to have a meaningful voice in the city council election? Uh, I don't want to be in the room when you have to tell them that. You want to tell a, Demo you want to tell a registered Republican that lives in, in, in Sal Albanese's old city council district who believes that you know Nancy Pelosi is a communist, you know, then, and you want to say you have to register as a Democrat in order to have a meaningful say in elections? It's ludicrous. Let people be a part of whatever political party they want. It shouldn't penalize them from and prohibit them from having a meaningful voice in elections. You can't do that to people that are paying for these elections. If, you, if the Republicans and the Democrats want to pick their own candidates, then let them pay for these elections themselves. But if the taxpayers are going to pay for them, then let the taxpayers participate in these elections. Thank excuse me, much. excuse Thank me. My, my heartfelt suggestion is if you'd like to indicate that you are in favor of what the speaker or anyone else is saying, that you use your jazz hands, um, and then we can proceed in an orderly fashion. Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Next speaker is Jeff Weiss. Thank you very much and good evening. My name is Jeff Weiss. I am a fellow at the SUNY Rockefeller Institute of Government where I specialize in a statewide program on census and redistricting. I'm also a veteran of many years in the State Assembly and Senate working on redistricting. And I've come really just to discuss one issue uh, in 
uh, after the 2010 census and the 2000 census, I served as counsel to the New York City Council Manic Districting Commission and came tonight to address two areas of the charter that uh, one needs um, modification and one possible reform. The first is that I think section uh, 52H requires that the City Districting Commission submit its Council Manic Districting Plan to the Department of Justice for what was called Section 5 preclearance to guarantee that there was no dilution of minority voting strength amongst the 51 districts. Uh, in 2013, the U.S. Supreme Court in the Shelby, uh, the Shelby versus Holder decision uh, knocked out the triggering mechanism that New York City fell under uh, that caused the Section 5 review and that other parts of the same section adequately cover the fact that the Voting Rights Act still yeah. applies. You might want to take out the language that refers to the uh, Department of Justice submission. It's highly unlikely that Congress is going to reauthorize it in the short term, but even if it, whether it does or doesn't, uh, the Voting Rights Act still applies regardless. So it's actually an added extra sentence in the charter. Also, I'm not going to advocate an independent commission. The commission we have now actually works. Uh, the last two uh, plans uh, received prompt DOJ approval and not a single lawsuit had been filed against the plan. My job working for the two commissions was as counsel, uh, you know, good cop, bad cop. My job was to make sure that the Voting Rights Act and the charter and all other laws were complied with and we did that. Uh, the mayor, the two council leaders appoint the members to it. Uh, it works in a bipartisan fashion. There was general agreement. Uh, the criteria uh, are unique among uh, all the laws in New York State and really in the nation, having ranked prioritized criteria that work well with each other. Uh, but if you do want to consider an independent commission, I would take the council manic review process out of it. It's just an elimination of a few words that the uh, commission plan would become final. Uh, and then just responding to Commissioner Albanese's question earlier uh, about how would you appoint a commission, I would suggest the California or Arizona models which use a lottery or a citizen volunteer process, but you would need somebody to administer it. Uh, and then the last thing I'll say is on co-terminality, uh, council districts are based on one person, one vote population equality and community planning boards are based on you know, neighborhood definitions. Uh, if you go to 5151 or 5959, just be aware as you do that, that there are different bases and how they were drawn. And as I've indicated in my statement and to your staff, I'd be glad to help craft such language or offer alternatives if that's what you choose to do. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Weiss. Stephen and then uh, Sal. Uh, Thank you, Professor. With respect to co-terminality, I, I, I recognize the distinction between a, a service district and a councilmatic district, but would you concede the point uh, that there, if, if we were to realign those two, that there is, is a, substantial, um, a substantially improved chance that you would see an improved dialogue and synergy and coordination and collaboration between council members and the community boards. Well, in other that right now, yeah. pieces get left out because as Mr. Morano alluded to, some council members share a piece and those communities kind of get left out of the process because the council member feels, well, it's his, no, it's hers, mm -hmm. no, it's his. So if there was this realignment, would there not at least would we not at least have the potential to see greater synergy and collaboration between the local elected official and the most basic of representatives at, at the local level, community board members? Objectively, rationally, yes, but politics always plays a hand. Uh, having worked in so many states on line drawing and looking at how congressional, state assembly, state senate, uh, local council lines uh, are not coterminous. Some people like having three or four members of the Senate or Assembly, and some would like to just have one. Sometimes if you're in the right party, the more votes, the more power you get, you know, the more um, you know, uh, projects and money you can bring home. But 
uh, for a city like New York with the delivery systems and the overlap, and you know, New York State has thousands of special districts that overlap and make no sense, but they've been all created because there was no stopgap against this going back 100 years ago. So the, the idea is a good one. It's a matter of uh, whether the political will is to do that. Thank you. Mr. Albanese? Yeah, uh, thank you, Professor. Uh, even though the Re redistricting commission is has done a decent job in terms of complying with federal law. Uh, there, there have been no lawsuits. Uh, I've seen a lot of hanky-panky by incumbents who have connect, got connection to redistricting commission members who were appointed by them. So I, I would love to see us move towards a more independent process. And one of the things that we look at as a commission is what's working in other cities and other states. And you mentioned Arizona and you mentioned California. I would love to see. Well, California, I actually served as counsel to the California Senate when the Senate itself had no role after 2010. The lines were drawn there by an independent commission. The four legislative leaders in Sacramento were limited to uh, viewing the selected candidates at a certain vetting level. There were thousands of people that uh, signed up to you know, serve on the commission, but through a vetting process, there was a, you know, an elimination. But it went down to about 20, 30 people, and the political leaders were allowed to uh, reject one or two, but didn't have final say, and then had no involvement whatsoever. But uh, in, in observing how the, you know, the line drawing process went, uh, it, it did work independently. They had an independent staff. They did require vest nesting of districts for the state senate and uh, for the state assembly there. So California's process did work. Uh, both parties have you know, benefited from it in various ways. The state is predominantly democratic, but it worked as the best model I've seen of a really independent process where the political players really had no role. Well, and in fact, the Democrats came out better than it anticipated. They were fearful of it before it was enacted. Well, we'll, we'll ask the commission to research those two lives, and if you've got some information on it, I'd appreciate it if you could I, submit I'm, it. I'd well. be glad to be helpful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Any uh, further questions for Mr. Weiss? Carl? Uh, just going to this uh, question of coterminality for a second. On the, uh, it's always been a, a nice concept, but as you say, uh, service districts and election districts are frequently decidedly different, and not always, but frequently. When you uh, have been on charter, on uh, redistricting commissions, Every 10 years, those districts change as populations shift. Is that correct? That's true. So if we had coterminality, we would require those community boards and the services that would also be linked to coterminality that the city provides, usually over, in many instances, uh, with um, capital uh, investments over an extended period of time to also shift if we were going to maintain coterminality. Would well, the, the council districts are required to be changed by virtue of the U.S. Constitution right. and the city charter. Uh, the community planning boards, and I had served on one of them in Brooklyn, uh, are creatures of administrative action. But you could move those as, as often as the city law permits without regard for the one person, I, one vote. I appreciate that. And what, what in, in effect now, we have 59 community boards that are reasonably stable. The communities know what their community boards are. The people are appointed to their community boards. If we had coterminality, that would necessarily, yeah. as the Constitution required um, councilmanic districts to shift, um, and if we maintained a tight link, that would also require yeah community boards to shift yeah. as well, wouldn't be it? Because the, the uh, legislative districts are required to be equally populous and, and there are shifts every 10 years, when you look in, just in Brooklyn, uh, there are some districts that are up against New York Harbor that might, in the state legislature, can include uh, you know, five or eight different separate communities. I mean, the 51st Assembly District that I'm familiar with, having served as counsel to the member there, has eight distinct communities and three or four different planning boards, four different police precincts, but one uh, overall administrative school district. And those lines are required you know, to be equally populous. You can't start annexing um, you know, part of South Brooklyn to Manhattan or Staten Island unless there's a bridge or a tunnel there. So you know, that becomes difficult. Right. And unless the state 
law in New York for the legislature or for, or for the city tightens up the criteria, there's no stopping either the legislature or the so-called new advisory commission that the voters approved in 2014 at the state level from creating the same kind of twisted lines you've got now in some places. Exactly. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. The last speaker in this panel, Mr. Ford. Thank you, um, Chairwoman Benjamin, Commissioners. My name is David Ford, and I am representing Manhattan Community Board 3. I am the first vice chair and the chair of the newly formed Charter Revision Task Force for our community board. The issues I am highlighting today were previously voted on by the board for the mayor's charter revision. However, the CB3 task force will be working on a broader spectrum of issues to participate with this Charter Revision Commission 2019. My statement today is consistent with a resolution passed by the full board during our Ju um, June meeting. In the interest of time, I will just read the highlights. Community Board 3 requests that the Charter Revision Commission conduct meetings and hearings with community boards, including members and staff for input as to the workings of the board and clarifications and codification requests. Community Board 3 recommends that community boards have independent budgets. Community Board 3 recommends that community boards have a full-time urban planner on staff and budget appropriation to fund said position. Community Board 3 recommends that full support services be assigned and codified to specific agencies and offices and include personnel support for staffing issues, personnel benefits, technical support and maintenance, use of city facilities for community meetings, fiscal information system support, law department support, protections from harassment or unfair practices, and other support services that in, are included in other agencies. Community Board 3 recommends that the Charter Commission consider creating standards and promoting transparency by publishing board demographics and vacancy status, which would promote more representative and effective boards. Community Board 3 recommends that the Charter Commission review the mandated notification process to take into account community board schedules by giving notice at an earlier stage or lengthening the notification time. Community Board 3 lastly recommends that the Charter Commission do not limit terms of members. It's very important that we have people on the boards that have institutional longevity. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Ford. Jim? Thank you, thank you David. Uh, and thank you for serving and for serving as the head of the task force on charter revision. Uh, I just had one quick question on uh, community board independent budgets. Has the board given any thought uh, to what perhaps you might tie the budget to? Um, we'll, we'll work on that, but you know, the situation is, is that the boards have a staff of about three to four and a budget of about $200,000. Um, and 90% of that budget is allocated towards staff. So there's often times where they're f possibly faced with even losing the small staff that they have. But we'll, we'll have to review that issue um, in our okay. meetings and we'll get back to you at a I'd later. be curious to see how community board budgets have either stagnated or gone up over time. Uh, in comparison to, for example, the Mayor's Community Assistance Unit. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for this panel. We appreciate your coming and staying and testifying. Um, just a quick note to let everyone know, uh, we've had 14 speakers and it's been almost two hours. Uh, we will stay, we have about 70 speakers left who have signed up so you can kind of look at your time and figure out how long. So to the extent possible, if you can limit your comments to the really important points so that everyone can be heard, I think everyone would appreciate it. The next five speakers are Marilyn Gelfin, Craig Seaman, Indingo Washington. You gave me two Indingos. We'll just give them. Juan Pagan, Alyssa Chan, and Kate Myers.
David. There's um Jesus. <laughs> Ms. Gelfin? Hi, my name is Marilyn Gelfin, founder of Voices for Shelter Animals. We want an animal welfare department created and the Department of Health out. Historically, they have shown, not shown concerns for the health of the New York City shelter animals. A former executive director of ACC from 2003, when asked about the DOH, said this, if the concern or question is, does the Department of Health have the best interest of the ACC or the animals in its care at heart, the answer is clearly no, they do not. As many have already testified, nothing has changed. As per Scott Stringer's 2013 Let Astray report, the root of the problem is structural. The animal care centers are controlled by the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene, an agency whose mission and expertise has not sufficiently focused on animal welfare. In three months, December 2017 to February 2018, approximately 185 dogs were at risk for CIRDC, basically a cold. 21 of those dogs were killed. Pneumonia is on the rise. Cats are getting Khaleesi virus, which can be fatal. The Department of Health and ACC justified disease as something that is normal in shelters. An anonymous, res uh, anonymous statement by a rescue person. These animals are coming out extremely sick. They're coming out with kennel cough, each and every one of them. The veterinary bills are outrageous. Rescues had to turn their backs on these animals because they can no longer help. At the end of 2016, there was the avian flu outbreak among cats. These cats were put in a temporary quarantine facility and that only happened because this was contagious to people. The Department of Health should act responsibly and remove all the animals now to a temporary facility and completely sanitize the shelter. Some animals are left suffering for days with excruciatingly painful conditions. Instead of getting emergency medical care, the animal centers waits to see if a rescue will pull so that the rescue takes on the financial burden. The ACC fast track system of spay and neuter was designed to get the most adoptable animals out to give more time for the more difficult to adopt animals. But this has had backfired because of the disease ravaged shelter. An animal comes out for surgery, it comes back with a weakened immune system, it gets sick, it gets on an at risk list and can be euthanized. We have documented through FOIA requests 74 victims since January 2017. We think the number is higher. This is not in the best interest of animals. We see many cases of alleged bite histories. The Department of Health needs proof and cause of a bite rather than allow killing on hearsay. Rescues and volunteers petrified to speak out for fear of losing their right to pull the animals or the fear of being let go. It exemplifies the dysfunctional and toxic culture. The Department of Health and Animal Care Centers does not want team process to save lives. Animals can be pigeonholed into death sentences by behavior assessments which are part of the Department of Health contract. Positive experiences with animals by volunteers are undervalued and not taken into consideration which can save an animal's life. These assessments could give an animal a New Hope Rescue only label. That animal can be pulled only by a New Hope Rescue partner. If they're not available, they could be killed. If they allow an increase in qualified 501c3 rescues, more positive outcomes can result. The Department of Health doesn't take steps to work with the ACC to evaluate and change assessment standards. In closing, we need an agency capable of enforcing proper health care for animals under the city's oversight and to ensure a humane shelter system. We need an entity that's only focuses for animals comprised of compassion animal lovers with animal related experience who understands companion and all non companion animals are sentient beings. We need people who will fight for the welfare of all animals in this city and protect them from abuse, inhumane treatment, exploitation and death as we also tackle issues such as the puppy mill pet stores in the city, pet discrimination, backyard breeders and carriage horse industry. Thank you Mrs. Gelfin. Yes, I have one more sentence, please. Just one. Yes, we ask that the Charter be part of a potential, unprecedented and historic event to help the New York City animals, the creation of an animal welfare agency. And we would like to- Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Seaman. Hello, I'm Craig Seaman from Voices for Shelter Animals also. We need an animal welfare department because the Department of Health has shown no overriding concern for the health of the animals in, under care and control. Excuse me. <clears throat> in 2016, 93% of the animals transferred 
to New Hope Rescue Partners were not healthy. That's a crisis. There's been no health-related stats regarding transfers on adoptions uh, for 20 months since then, except for the month after the City Council hearing with the ACC. Also in 2016, 37% of the animals euthanized were treatable. This pattern continues without significant change. The ACC doesn't publish the industry standard pet evaluation matrix, which explains which illness and behaviors fall into categories of treatable or unhealthy. An animal welfare department would require that matrix be made public, evaluate it, and make recommendations. The DOH does ACC facility inspections, but if there were a real concern about animal health compliance, then not only would the DA, DOH demand continued health reporting, but they'd insist on steps to improve those atrocious conditions. During the City Council Health Committee hearing with the ACC and DOH, they were asked about the health isolation facilities, uh, and they admitted they were inadequate. Follow-up questions asked about the planned expansion to the neighboring garage, which would make space, asked if it would make space for improved ISO facilities, and that wasn't the ACC or DOH's priority. The garage expansion, now years in the waiting, won't address the health problems. Those costs of those problems are handed to the rescues, making them more reluctant to pull. The DOH contract uses vague language like reasonable effort to rehome animals, yet doesn't define that effort. An animal welfare department would set procedures, and those are concretely defined in no-kill policies. At the most recent ACC board meeting, they admitted they often don't sedate the animals they euthanize. These animals may be alert and healthy. They don't have vets on duty. They point to state law saying that only a vet could administer the sedative. The lack, the lack of on-duty vets isn't about the cost, though. They can't hire enough vets to take the job. No wonder why. What animal-loving vet wants to kill animals for kennel cough and kitty colds? State law isn't an excuse. An animal welfare department will require a vet to be on duty to make medical end-of-life decisions. The DOH encourages behavior tests, which weren't meant for life and death decisions, putting animals on the at-risk list for euthanasia, and limiting access only to New Hope partners. The DOH allows the ACC to assume dogs and cats not adjusting to shelter life are dangers to society. The Journal of Veterinary Behavior published a peer-reviewed study that such testing is no better than the flip of a coin. An animal welfare department would know that behavior tests are only a snapshot in time and not a reliable indicator of dangerous behavior. And finally, we need an animal welfare department that can implement no-kill procedures in the city charter because it should be a permanent institution. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Mr. Seaman? No. no. Thank you very much, Mr. Seaman. Ms. Washington. Good evening, members of the Charter Revision Commission and members of the audience. My name is M. Indigo Washington, and I'm testifying on behalf of Councilmember Inez Barron, who represents the 42nd Council District and is chair of the Committee on Higher Education. This evening, Councilmember Barron would like to request that members consider making significant changes to the Civilian Complaint Review Board. According to the powers and duties of the board, excerpts from Section 440 of the New York City Charter state, the board shall have the power to receive, investigate, hear, make findings, and recommend act action upon complaints by members of the public against members of the police department that allege misconduct involving excessive use of force, abuse of authority, discourtesy, or use of offensive language, including but not limited to slurs relating to race, ethnicity, religion, gender, sexual orientation, and disability. I join with the advocates who call for establishing a civilian review board that is elected by New York City voters. We have experienced, read, or witnessed too many accounts of misconduct, abuse, and police killings of New York City residents, particularly of unarmed persons by officers of the NYPD with little or no punishment meted out to the officers. I point your attention to some of the most egregious. 18-year-old Ramali Graham from the Bronx, who was killed in his home in front of his grandmother and six-year-old brother by Officer Richard Haste. Eric Gardner, who was killed by Officer Daniel, Daniel Pantaleo by the use of a banned chokehold in Staten Island. And Delron Small from my district, who was killed by an off-duty police off-duty officer Wayne Isaacs. The CCRB was established in 1993. 25 years is sufficient time to give officials and the public information and data to measure their effectiveness 
And I just for sake of time, we have some data that we cite, but I'll just go directly to some of the recommendations. As an elected official, it is Councilmember Barron's opinion that in order for us to receive justice in cases of police misconduct, we must shift, create a shift, thereby establishing an elected civilian complaint review board. I have met with the advocates of this campaign and welcome legislation and a revision of the city charter where these recommendations include board being elected by New York City voters, covering districts in the five boroughs. The board must have power to investigate police misconduct and make findings, as well as all disciplinary decisions must be binding and the ECRB must be granted subpoena powers. So she's just saying that we'd like to have um, an elected civilian review board. Thank you, and if you could do your, your own very Okay. Good evening, members of the Charter Revision, guests and audience. My name is M. Indigo Washington. I offer these remarks as a resident of Harlem and community organizer and activist and graduate with a degree in political science. A few years ago, I formed a group called Take Back Our City. This group was formed based on my experience of working with small business owners, community residents, and artists within Harlem who resided in Harlem. We came together to fight back in 2009, Mayor Bloomberg's proposal to rezone 125 Fifth Street, river to river. Based on my experience with this campaign, as well as my knowledge of the, as working with the, as the legislative director for both Charles and Inez Barron, I'd like to offer the following suggestions. One, we know we should grant powers to the community boards to approve or disapprove land use proposals. Community boards need to be granted this power because we know that they are advisory only. Too often we have witnessed communities who vote to disprove a project only for the projects to move forward with little or no additional input from the community residents. Two, eliminate constituent services in council offices. While I recognize this may not be a popular position, I want to remind us that constituent services was not something that council offices did. And while we know that council members take pride in assisting with their constituents with noise complaints, street lighting, housing, etc., I'd like to bring forth the following to remind us that, one, it would be helpful if we increase the budget to community boards and hire staff who handle constituent services. They already have relationships with city agencies and relationships with the communities. Two, as for the muscle and the reason why sometimes constituents reach out to council offices, they can get this muscle from the borough president's offices, the public advocates. And also, this would free up the time of council members to respond to areas outlined in the charter, therefore passing legislation, budget, and land use. Contrary, of course, to what media and the public put out, council members spend a lot of time trying to juggle between the legislative office and their district offices. The, another area I would say is to allocate funds for constituent services. We know that city council allocates a lot of money for initiatives, so they should be able to use more of this money for referrals to organizations like legal aid services as well as community groups. Lastly, this is the one I really take pride in putting forth, I would say we need to grant recall for elected officials. Give community residents the power to recall their electeds. We have seen too many times when elected officials follow the lead of real estate developers and not the leader of the community. Giving this power to residents would be a true game changer. We know that there were bills up in the state legislature by former Assemblymember Tony Avella, and there have been some discussion in 2013. So I think it's time that we shift the power to the people, eliminate the control that real estate developers and lobbyists have maintained for years. You have the opportunity to do the right thing and make history. Thank you for your time and consideration. Thank you, Ndinga. Are there any questions? Sal? Just want to. I just want to point out uh, that on the issue of recall, which is a good concept, mm -hmm. we're preempted by the state legislature. We can't act on that. That's got to be done up in Albany. So under under our mandate, we won't be able to do that. So we wouldn't be able to put it as a ballot issue at all. No, it's got to. We're preempted by by Albany. That's why you mentioned the state legislators who were introduced bills to that effect. So Thank that's you. Where, that's where the action is on this issue. We'll take it there. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Indingo. And the next speaker is Mr. Pagan. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Juan Pagan. I am born, raised, and still live on the Lower East Side in public housing. I live in an enclave known as Loisaida. Uh, 
my topic is on political and ele electoral reform. I have three subtopics I wish to present. One, the problem. Two, concrete evidence. And three, remedies, proposals for the referendum. The problem. A corrupted electoral process in New York City that, one, discriminates against people of color, especially Hispanics. Two, discriminates against the poor. Three, discriminates against candidates who are not chosen by the political machine, party bosses, or the establishment, which going forward I will, I will refer as, uh, as the machine. Four, discriminates against all registered voters, regardless of socioeconomic status, race, or ethnicity by the machine's use of tactics and mechanisms that result in the exclusion of thousands of registered voters in special elections and democratic primaries while wasting ta taxpayer dollars and a major form of voter suppression. Five, allows discriminatory practices by the New York City Board of Elections coupled with the ineptitude of its employees driven by the administration's patronage to the incumbents as they are political appointees. For this reason, elected officials are not determined by the vote of the people, but by the manipulative, corrupted tactics of the machine in collusion with the New York City Board of Elections. These elected officials and political appointees continue to use these tactics of deception and exclusion in all forms to preserve their incumbencies or appointments Hence, why the issues pressing our communities get, uh, continue to get worse. I'm going to skip the concrete evidence part. I'm going directly into the remedies, then to the evidence. The evidence is based on my years of experience dealing with the New York City Board of Elections as a candidate for public office and assisting other candidates running for public office. <clears throat> I first ran for office in 2006 and about seven or eight times after that. Now in 2018, this year, thanks to the Reform Party, I, a Democrat, am on the ballot for the upcoming general election for assembly against the Democrat chosen and put into place by the machine last April but by way of a special election in which 94.8% of registered voters did not vote. Ethically, morally, just by the numbers, he cannot be considered an elected official. Uh, let me go to the remedies. Uh, if you could s start yes, to I'll, sum up. Uh, yes, I'll, 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 I'll just mention the remedies. It's six of them, actually five. The last one cross off in your, because I made, a, I made a, a very bad typographical error there. Okay. Number um, one, ban special elections. For one, it is a waste of taxpayer dollars, as evidence shows in 2006 and 2018, an average of 95% of registered voters in this nonpartisan election uh, did not come out to vote. Extreme low voter turnout in special elections is a historical fact in New York City. Secondly, special elections are solely used and abused by the machine to destine their chosen candidate to become an incumbent a few months prior to the Democratic primary, which gives the machine's chosen candidate Sir? an edge against the Democrats nominated by the people. Sir, the we, have okay. your, we have your testimony here with the um, six categories, if uh, you would like to just scratch sum off this up. Next one, because I made it never there. I typed this very quickly. I'm going to revise this and submit a new one. But okay. just mention two, ballot access, three, just direct choice them. voiding, four, open primaries, five, term limits. Uh, the explanation is there. I will revise this. This is three pages long. It's actually a 12-page document, which I will revise and submit to you uh, as, as a new document. Thank you very much, and we will read it, and we will have it on our website. Uh, so that anyone else who is interested can also read the full, full text of the document. Any questions? Thank you very much, Mr. Pagan. Ms. Chan? Hi, thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is Alyssa Chan. I'm here on behalf of the Legal Aid Society, and I'm here with my colleague, Kat Myers. Um, so I'll try to be brief. We were also in Brooklyn. I think you've heard some of this before. Um, but. Uh, just, in, uh, just to tell you who we are, the Legal Aid Society provides comprehensive legal services in all five boroughs of New York uh, to clients who can't afford to pay for private counsel. We represent um, hundreds of people um, in 
cases that concern the rights of tenants in regulated and unregulated apartments, and so we're very familiar with the pressures experienced by tenants in the current and developing housing market. We're here to talk about um, the procedure, uh, the ULERP procedure, um, and the way that the New York City Charter um, gives community boards, borough presidents, and the city council um, the way that they consider land use decisions. Um, so as you know, ULERP doesn't contain substantive requirements. Those really come under the city and state environmental quality review laws, uh, which, can, which omit critical considerations that we think should inform elected officials' land use decisions. So recent history has established that rezonings um, result in accelerated gentrification of communities and the displacement of longtime tenants in both regulated and unregulated apartments. But despite that reality, the assessment of residential displacement conducted under existing law is based on false assumptions and flawed analyses. So the Seeker Technical Manual lays out a method for evaluating the potential for both direct and indirect residential displacement, but it assumes that rent-stabilized apartments are not vulnerable to rising rents that would lead to indirect displacement. Um, the explicit exclusion of any meaningful mandate to consider the displacement of tenants in rent-regulated apartments, including those with preferential rents, or tenants displaced through illegal actions of their landlords renders the environmental impact study uh, totally void of a real analysis of the impacts on communities. We know that the stock of affordable rent regulated apartments in New York City is on the decline and homelessness is rising. According to the New York City Rent Guidelines Board, in 2016 alone, 7,524 apartments were deregulated across the city. Um, and so we're here to urge uh, to urge you to amend the city charter to require an assessment that includes um, an analysis of the displacement in rent regulated and unregulated apartments that tracks income and um, race in that analysis and that uses uh, data about prior rezonings to inform future rezonings. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Chan. Are there any questions? Ms. Meyer? I have submitted our testimony on our other topic in the, in the interest of time and to allow other people to testify. Thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate that. <laughs> As to the people there, jazz hands for her, everybody. <laughs> I need six more. Okay. The next um, six speakers will be Roxanne Delgado, Betty Maloney, Michelle Birnbaum, Holly Rothkopf, Michael Beltzer, and Pamela Monroe. Well, they're just moving slowly. Is Michael Beltzer here? Miss. He is. He is. Oh, there he is. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Beltzer. Yeah. Oh, uh, we're going to start with Miss Delgado. Hello. Sorry. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry. Just give me one second before you start. Okay. Hello? Yes. Hello, Commission. Early this year, City Councilmember Andy King hijacked a community board meeting and actively presided over that same meeting. He shut down public testimony and made his opposition quite clear through inflammatory remarks. Afterwards, he took a vote by hand count. Hand count. We later found out that same day the lobbyist was in that same room and had lobbied City Councilman Andy King for this, for this land site the same site the city proposed for the state-of-the-art animal shelter and clinic. AM New York actually reported the developer was eyeing the same development for a massive development. The community board was used to shield themselves from this blatant land grab, land grab by the de developer. Now a city council meeting is scheduled on October 9th on this same issue. 
Now, we activists are standing not only for the animals and for ourselves in the Bronx and with the poorest, but against lobbyists and real estate influence and interference in our government. The issue isn't city planning, but the problem is the influence of real estate and lobbyists and money in our government. Are the elected officials here for our best interests, or are they here to just maintain their power or expand it? You need to balance the testimony from people like me, regular folks, against elected officials who may not be here for our own, own best interests. And actually, now that I have a few seconds, I'm actually in support of the Animal Welfare Agency because DOH is for this pest control and public health safety. And actually, they had inspected a no-kill boarding facility in the Bronx, and those animals were all sick, dying, hoarding, and they didn't care about the conditions of those poor animals, but about the safety of the, of the residents. And they told me, just report the animal cruelty to NYPD. So that's why we need an uh, animal uh, welfare agency so they can care for the animal safety, just like the uh, Immigration Affairs Unit was developed from the last charter, which was over 10 years ago. So, and I'm actually am very supportive of eliminating the Public Advocate's Office and the BP's Office, because they're just advisory and they just tend to sell out in the, in the, in the Bronx. Our BP just sells out to the highest bidder. It's just a shame how Bro Ruben Dennis Jr. just sold out the Bronx. He's driving us all out. I hope he enjoys um, the Bronx when most of his original residents are not here and they may gentrify the neighborhood. They might vote him out finally. Thank goodness. But thank you. Bye. Thank you very much, Ms. Delgado. Are there any questions for Ms. Delgado? Thank you. Um, the next speaker is Betty Maloney. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Betty Maloney, and I'm here as a representative of Radical Women. I am a retired guidance counselor, a member of American Federation of Teachers, and a former rape crisis counselor. Radical Women is a national organization of women engaged in grassroots activism aimed at eliminating sexism, racism, homophobia, and labor exploitation. We recognize that women have a strong stake in the creation of an elected civilian review board because of how our lives are affected by widespread police misconduct and violence. That's not for you. Please Didn't. continue. Women, especially women of color and gender or sex role nonconforming women, are often seen as targets for sexual harassment and assault. We face extortion to perform sexual acts for cops in order to avoid arrest or protect our children from harassment. Our reports when we are victims of crime are not believed or are ignored, and too many of us have lost our children to police violence. It is appalling that the Civilian Complaint Review Board has only in the last few months began to investigate allegations of sexual misconduct. Until then, all these complaints were referred to NYPD Internal Affairs. The NYPD has demonstrated complete inability to police itself, a reality only more extreme when dealing with atti attitudes towards women and the lesbian, gay, bi, trans, queer community, um, which is deeply ingrained in their culture. The New York City Department of Investigation I issued a report this year on the police department's abysmal failure, failure to, deal, to deal with sexual crimes against women, concluding that documents as well as current and former special victims division staff, sex crime prosecu prosecutor service providers, and victim advocates all confirmed to the DOI that chronic understaffing and inexperience have diluted and shortened investigation, jeopardized prosecution, re-traumatized victims, and negatively impacted the reporting of sex crimes, thereby adversely affecting public safety. The NYPD is even less effective, but more likely to drop or whitewash investigations when the perpetrators come from within their own ranks. Others have testified to the enormous impact of police misconduct on young people, especially youth of color. Children while in school are also vulnerable to police abuse that, if dealt with at all, is referred to internal affairs. Presently, there are 5,300 NYPD school safety employees in our schools, and not one has to answer to the CCRB. These officers can make warrantless arrests, carry handcuffs, and use physical or deadly force. In an ACLU study in 2017, 
There were 882 arrests of school children. One in five was age 14 or younger, and 95% of students were black or Hispanic. Radical women believe as do others participating in the ECRB <clears throat> campaign that only an elected board that has disciplinary power and works in tandem with an independent special prosecutor can effectively improve police accountability. Thank you. And I have testimony here to give you. I'm sorry, my microphone's not on. Thank you, Ms. Maleni. Um, the next speaker is Michelle Birnbaum. <laughs> yes, my name is Michelle Birnbaum, and I'm co-chair of the Vendor Committee of Community Board 8 in Manhattan. Um, somebody, excuse me, one minute, let's set the... Okay. And I'm speaking on behalf of the committee and the board. This committee was born of a need to address community concern as they relate to street vending. We sought solutions to concerns about vendor location, health standards, sanitation, pedestrian flow, penalties, and licensing. We are a problem-solving committee. We have 10 resolutions that, if implemented, would go a long way to satisfying the stakeholders in the vendor, residential, and business communities. Those resolutions are attached to this testimony in each of your packets. It would be a valuable addition to the city charter to include an agency that specifically deals with street vending. At the moment, there are many city agencies that govern that industry. The DCA, the DOH, the DEP, the DOT, and the DOS, along with the police and special fraud squads, but all are woefully understaffed to enforce in the way the public demands. The new agency or commission would be comprised of staff fully conversant in vendor law, including representatives of each of the agencies that govern the industry today, along with representatives from community boards and neighborhood associations, and an arbitration panel that could address disputes. This agency, with the input of all of the above, would establish vendor zones and assign vendor locations. Assigning locations would go a long way towards claiming our streets. In assigning locations, the agency would be mindful of everyone that would be adversely affected by cooking fumes, grease pours, garbage accumulation, and the crowding of the pedestrian way. A separate, knowledgeable vendor enforcement squad with a sufficient ratio of the number of vendors to the number of enforcers would be under the jurisdiction of that agency. Such an agency would be mandated to use current technology to track vendors for compliance, including their required visits to their commissaries, which are privately owned businesses that vendor use to store and clean their carts, get potable water, and obtain inventory. While required to bring their food cart or truck to a commissary for service once in every 24-hour period, there is no enforcement of that full protocol. The newly formed agency under the new charter would require commissaries to keep a log of in and out time of vendor attending attendees and whether or not the vendor returned his garbage to the commissary. Every food truck or general merchandise table and license should have an assigned location and an electronic chip for tracking. All infractions would be easily noted, would electronically generate a fine, and electronically maintain a compliance history. There are many more suggestions outlined in our resolutions that if incorporated into the city charter and the administrative code would significantly help our communities who have been crying out for vendor control and compliance for years. Vendor legislation has been offered but fell short, but now we have a real chance to do something about street vending that does not favor one group over another, but takes into consideration the very hard work of the street vendors and the position of members of the community who do not want to be overwhelmed with the quality of life issues that face uh, doing business on the street. Please consider incorporating such an agency as you review this city charter. Thank you very much, Ms. Birnbaum. Are there any questions of Ms. Birnbaum? Yes. Carl? Um, thank you very much. It's, uh, I totally sympathize with the issue and the problem uh, and the um, cross-jurisdictional mess that we're now in. Um, but if we were to not establish a new agency, but to give responsibility to one existing agency, do you have a preference? For which agency should be the agency in charge? 
Yes. You know, their jurisdictions are completely different. For example, the Department of Consumer Affairs is strictly a licensing agency. Uh, when you have enforcement, you're talking of health, you know, the food. No, I, I appreciate what you're saying, but, but what you're asking us to do is amend the charter to create a new agency that would incorporate all of these issues, whereas one alternative is to select an existing agency and give that agency all of the powers that um, you request, or many of the powers that you request. Well, let, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Let me say this. Let me also qualify what I said. For the purposes of this testimony, and, and because we already have a trained workforce in each of these areas, I suggested that perhaps a new agency could be rep have representatives from each of the existing agencies. However, I have no objection and actually feel that it might be very worthwhile to have a separate new agency that actually staffs itself so that it's not drawing from these existing agencies uh, which do other things. They don't just enforce street vending. So to your point, I see what you're saying. Why am I suggesting a new agency if, he, if that new agency is going to have a representative from each of the old ones? But because these existing agencies have other things to do, other jurisdictions, and are, are woefully short uh, in enforcement uh, staff and protocol, a new agency could actually hire people specific to that agency but have who have expertise to monitor, license, and enforce what's happening on the streets today and to be and, and also to have a protocol for uh, listening to grievances, which used to be in the old vendor review panel, which I understand it still exists on the books, but in fact it's defunct. So there's really no place for a vendor or any member of a community or community group to bring any kind of uh, discussion, control, or even to ask for a new existing restricted street. Uh, used to, there used to be a protocol that if a community felt that a street should be restricted and where no vendor should be permitted, we used to have an outlet uh, that was a place to go for that. That protocol no longer exists. If you look at the 10 resolutions that I've attached to your packet, our community board since 2006 has been addressing this issue and we have resolutions that actually address all of the existing circumstances and can go a long way to mitigate them. To answer your question, I couldn't pick one agency because probably the biggest threat to the community would be headed under the Department of Health, you know, in terms of uh, food and all, but I can't see them necessarily doing licensing okay. for general merchandise vendors. So I think you, I still think you need a specialized group. Okay, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Just, uh, yeah. uh, your, your community board has a district manager, correct? Correct. Uh, don't they meet with the agencies yeah. on a monthly basis? I mean, there's a lot of overlap here. Doesn't it, doesn't it make sense to bring all these agencies together, representatives of those agencies on a monthly basis, and uh, coordinate issues yeah. within within that planning board instead of creating a new agency. Uh, well, let me say this. At our vendor committee meetings, that's what we do. But we pick, of course, in the interest of time, specific topics to discuss. And members of the appropriate agency are invited and do come and speak with us and advise us. Part of our responsibility, I felt, was to become fully conversant as best we could in vendor law, which is very complicated and actually involves both the state and city law, because you also have a category of veteran vendors who we are very, very sympathetic to, and we try very hard to accommodate them, and they are very concerned about proposals to increase the number of vendors on the street. Uh, and there, the category of, vet, of veteran vendor is not really included, except in a very, very small way. In the last intro, 13. Oh, three, there were only uh, uh, there was a proposal for hundreds of more vendors on the street in any given year, and only one a proposal for 35 new veteran vendors. So yes, we do. The district manager 
Uh, while he acts as a help to be a liaison, we field the questions, the concerns, and the comments of the community. And at our community board meetings, the community has an opportunity to vent and to point out specific problems and locations. But we try not to, we're not a complaint committee. We have tried to address problems and come up with solutions. I don't think the district manager could do that. Well, I mean, I, I've seen district managers uh, when I was a council member, meet mandating agency representatives to come to meetings on a monthly basis and because there was overlapping you know, on a host of issues and work together and not come in by invitation. It was a, you know, you mandate that they come in, uh, you know, and meet with the district manager and, and start addressing some of the vendor issues. But all of the vendor issues are mitigated by legislation. <laughs> For example, if you have a problem with a location on a street that is not currently re restricted to vending, but the, but the complaint is that there's a cooking vendor under somebody's window, or the fumes are coming into a local store, the district manager has no authority to move that vendor, and neither does any no, of the agency. The agency does. No, the agency doesn't because the location might be annoying to somebody, but it's legal. And once it's a legal location, for example, I'll call the Department of Health if I get a complaint, say, of a food vendor. The complaints come to me. I'll reach out to the Department of Health. The Department of Health will go down and will inspect. And if there's anything wrong, if the vendor didn't go to the commissary, if he doesn't, if it's not clean, you know, the sanitation issues, he can be, that vendor could be issued a violation. However, if that vendor is posing an annoyance to people in the community or blocking a subway entrance or things like that, which we've had come to us now that the Second Avenue subway is completed, the Department of Health has absolutely no jurisdiction to move that vendor. If, if the vendor will less than 20 feet from the main entrance of a building or even a service entrance, then the police could ticket that vendor. But you cannot remove a, le a vendor where, for example, we have the Guggenheim Museum. We have vendors in front of the Guggenheim Museum that the museum complains about daily. We have no authority, and neither does any agency, to make those vendors move if they're legal. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, next is Holly Rothkopf. I want to thank um, Speaker uh, Johnson and Borough President Brewer for addressing land use. And Council Member Powers uh, talked about setting goals, and my statement addresses those issues. Um, we need local neighborhood plans incorporated with a vision for the city. The current system does not allow local land use decisions to be made by local people. While community boards and borough presidents can provide recommendations and input, the recommendations are not binding, and while the recommendations must be acknowledged, they don't have to be followed, and they are often disregarded entirely. In my opinion, New York City needs to completely rethink its land use process to bring local people into meaningful decision making, but still allow the city administration to guide growth and development in the city. In a city of 8.6 million people, it's not possible for the administration to do a good job guiding growth at the local level. Instead, the administration should be driving an overarching vision of the city. For example, New York City needs a plan for X number of residents and Y number of jobs by 2030, and the city signs growth targets to each local district that would help to realize that vision. It would be up to the community boards. Think of them as community boards 2.0, community boards with more resources and staff to adopt land use plans that would protect the community's current assets, but at the same time, identify areas where future growth could be accommodated. Any zoning changes made within the community district must be consistent with the local land use plan. The administration would still have the right to reject whole plans as not meeting the obligations that have been assigned to the community district, but couldn't tinker with individual elements of the plan. Ultimately, community boards plans would guide the form of new development. For example, short squat buildings that are more contextual, 
or tall, narrow buildings that allow better light to the street and where the growth would occur within the community district. The community boards currently have no power in these very local decisions, but the charter could change to give them that power. Local people know best about these very local issues. City planning should also take into account projected changes in the economy, employment, housing, transportation, demand, and seek to maintain its historic environment and improve the quality of life for the city's residents. Further, the city needs to look closely at environmental impacts of current and future development. The charter should require site planning and env environmental review with local oversight for every development. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Roth? Kauf? Thank you very much. Um, Ms. Belzer? Mr. Belzer. I have it spelled Michael in one and Michelle in the other. Ah. Are you Michael or Michelle? I'm uh, Michael Belzer. That's like seltzer with a B. So uh, good evening, thank you chair, thank you commissioners, and thank the city charter for allowing me to be here tonight. Uh, my name is Michael Belzer. I am a community empowerer in the Southeast Bronx. I'm a formal city council candidate and uh, co-chair of the 197A planning committee on my local community board. Uh, the New York City Charter, especially since New York City moved to a strong, t strong mayor governance in 1989, has large gaps in the amount of power and input average citizens have on how our how their tax dollars are spent and how their city is run. In our current environment, this is exasperating income inequality by giving developers a leg up on our communities, not seizing every opportunity for civic and political engagement, and gives the administration too much control on how to allocate our resources. I, have the trust of, I trust the members of this commission will seriously examine the following chapters and sections of this charter and change accordingly. Section 197A amend to require each community district working with the respective borough president and community board to present a district-wide community plan with the help of a dedicated planner every 10 years. I think that would help uh, some of the calls for a citywide 10-year plan. Section 197C, amend to mandate a more accountable pre-certification process. The name of the applicant shall be made public if multiple major revisions have occurred. Plans that are well out, out of character even if, as of right, should enter, enter the public realm. Section 102 and 211. We are told to take a new development to generate tax revenue, but the formulas set in these sections used are preset and allocate expenses and capital funds based on population and size, not economic activity. I suggest either percentage of total receipts to the general fund from each borough be remitted back or a new tax levy charged to, uh, to go to a dedicated borough fund. Section 1052, amend to have the chairperson of the campaign finance board picked by the speaker in consultation with the council. Section 2704, amend to state each borough president must present an annual report on the delivery of service by borough. I think a lot of places in the charter it says shall, it should say must. Uh, section 2705, amend to add that district service cabinet meetings be held during evening hours where regular people can attend. Section 2800, make all board meetings transmitted via live stream. Chapter 10, amend appropriate sections to mandate participatory budgeting of New York City for each community district and a similar program at the borough or citywide level. Chapter 12, look at possibly establishing a surface rapid transit sinking fund system. Uh, uh, fund. Chapter 18A, amend to make members of the CCRB elected by the public. Chapter 71, establish a standard for equitable street allocations for arterial and secondary roadways to be effectuated after any street repaving and con or reconstruction. Uh, convert all NYCHA land to community land trust, electoral reforms, nonpartisan elections, instant runoff voting. I like that proportional representation. I'm just looking at it. Uh, lift the cap on public matching funds from 55% to 100% of spending limit. Uh, add in the democracy vouchers, and just because I heard so much about code terminality, um, I believe the task that you all have here today is how we could use much of this process uh, to really get behind the intent in uh, Section 2700 
the planning of community life within the city, the participation of its citizens in city government within their communities, and the efficient and effective organization to deliver municipal services in local communities and boroughs. Thank you, Mr. Belzer. Uh, do you have that testimony? You went through quite a few changes, but it's very hard to yes. write them all down. Yes, so I should have Do you have it in writing, so or could you send it that. to us? Um, yes, I can. I can mail it in um, through the through the forms that I found on. Uh, yeah, on online. That would be very helpful. I was listening, but I wasn't able to get down everything that you were talking about, and I'd like to be able to think about it. All right. Does anyone have any questions for Mr. Belcher? Uh, Allison, and then uh, Sal, and then Steve. Oh, I thought your hand was up, but it was just um, writing. Sorry, you mentioned the CFB chair be picked by the speaker and approved by the council. I was wondering if you can explain why. Um, you know, I just thought that uh, there's more elected. Um, members of from the public uh, in the city council and they uh, working with the the, the um, speaker would just uh, open up um, you know more diversity into who would become the the chair Sal um, uh, you're like the Thomas Jefferson of the Bronx <laughs> <laughs> a lot of a lot of good suggestions um, the democracy vouchers mm -hmm. uh, are you a strong proponent of it? Um, yes, I think a lot of people, um, you know, I, I think the basis of having the matching fund program is to make sure uh, that uh, we can get small contributions in. Um, but we know a lot of people uh, either don't find the time or don't have the resources to actually make uh, make it online to, to um, or have a debit card or credit card to make it easier to get in a contribution. So just, uh, you know, if, if we're matching um, you know, funds, you know, if, if this goes to the, the last commission's uh, eight to one match, you know, these is this over 1200 some dollars, um, we should be breaking it down uh, per person uh, and using some of that matching, uh, that public funds just to have everyday um, people without having, um, you know, to put in to, to, to put in that initial, initial donation, um, I think it'll, it, it, it'll increase the participation of people who are get, to get more people involved in the process. Thank you very much. Um, and the last speaker in this panel is uh, Pamela Monroe. Good evening, commissioners. As you just said, my name is Pamela Monroe, and I am a steering committee member of the Campaign for an Elected Civilian Review Board. We want to thank you for listening to the many voices that have testified for an elected civilian review board at these hearings. The range of testimonies from mothers to fathers to educators to elected officials show the wide impact of unchecked police abuse on our entire city. It also lays bare the desperate need for a solution. We have previously explained and disseminated documents to you that detail our amendment for an elected, empowered review board. In addition, we will deliver to you our extensive research on state and local law that shows, a, that shows strong arguments in favor of and legal basis for establishing an elected civilian review board. Our campaign is committed to being here to help and is available for follow-up meetings and hearings. Our legislative team stands at the ready to collaborate with you. We know that this commission needs to deliberate and take time to consider everything before you. We respect your process and timeline. We ask that when you listen and reflect on testimony from New Yorkers about what changes we need, please also remember the voices you cannot hear. We ask that when you listen and reflect on testimony, remember the voices you cannot hear. Those who have been silenced because they were killed by those sworn to protect them, the NYPD. They must be seen and never forgotten. The era of unchecked police misconduct must end. 
We have a historic chance to work together to usher in a new era where the police are held to the same standards as you and me and the rest of us. The City Charter Commission can make history and provide an example to the entire country suffering under police abuse. Not everybody can be famous, but everybody can be great because greatness is determined by service. Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. We know you will do the right thing. We thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Monroe. Jazz hands, please. Is any questions? I thank this panel. We have heard from many of the people who have uh, been talking, and we are grateful for your participation. If any of you have written testimony that you haven't already submitted, as um, you have, sir, we would really appreciate your submitting it either through the website or um, through the mail if that's easier for you. And we will put it into the record so that everyone who wishes to can also read it. <clears throat> the next panel is Carolyn Martinez Class. Um, Joanna Cres Crispy, Sheila Kendrick, Patricia Okamu, I'm not sure and I have probably mispronounced it, if so I'm sorry and you can correct me, Nancy Yao Masbach, Andrea Goldwyn. Um, if I call your name, would you just raise your hand? Several people haven't come up. Uh, Carolyn Martinez Class, are you here? Joanna Crispy, okay. Sheila Kendrick, okay. I know you, Andrea. Patricia. Okamu, okay. And Nancy Yao Masbach is not here. So I'm going to call two additional names to come up and join the panel. Um, Oksana Miranova from the Community Service Society. And Beth Goldman. Is Beth here? Okay. Yes. Ms. Crispy. I already gave them. Okay. Good evening. My name is Joanna Crisp, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the Municipal Arts Society of New York. Founded in 1893. Could you bring the microphone closer, please? Yes. My name is Joanna Crisp, and I'm here to testify on behalf of the Municipal Arts Society of New York, or MAS. Founded in 1893, four years before the adoption of New York's first charter, MAS has had a long history of advocating for sound land use planning and policy. Since the release of our 2013 Accidental Skyline Report, which examined the proliferation of super tall buildings in the city, MAS has been a strong voice in supporting new rules and regulations to protect our public assets, such as light, air, and open space, and preserving the character of the city's neighborhoods from out of scale development. Based on our reviews of large-scale rezonings and other developments, we find that current public review processes do not facilitate effective community input and that long-term community-based planning initiatives meet strong resistance from the city. In 2018, the city is well on its way to setting a record number of approvals for zoning map amendments. By June, the city had already certified or approved 38 amendments 
and based on recent trends, we expect that they will likely su surpass 50 approvals by the end of the year. Most concerning about this record number of approvals is the lack of community engagement in the process. Only four out of this year's 38 zoning map amendments have gone through an extended public review. These include the city-initiated Inwood and Jerome Avenue neighborhood rezonings, the 80 Flatbush Avenue proposal in downtown Brooklyn, and the Bedford Un Union Armory project in Crown Heights. MAS supports the creation of an Office of Community-Based Planning with oversight provided by the Public Advocate's Office and revisions to the charter that require community boards to present district-wide plans on a regular basis. Moreover, land use proposals submitted by private applicants should be required to conform to local 197A plans or district-wide community plans. MAS also supports the development of a citywide planning framework, including a shared set of citywide development priorities, which local 197A plans and district-wide community plans should both help shape and conform to. The city's charter should institute a pre ulert process, which would allow for public input into development plans before projects are officially certified. Through this process, the city would disclose application information and hold public meetings to garner input from communities to ensure that major issues are identified and discussed at the beginning of the planning process. City charter revisions also need to strengthen mitigation requirements for adverse impacts identified in the seeker process by making the Office of Community-Based Planning responsible for conducting environmental review of plans initiated by community boards or other local organizations. The city could also require follow-up technical memoranda where applicable to resolve issues raised by community boards and borough president's offices in their respective project resolutions about findings and conclusions in environmental impact statements. Um, we also okay. believe that there should be penalties for misrepresentations and inaccurate information in project applications. If you could sum up, please. Um, sure, just a couple of final points. Uh, we oppose uh, amending the uh, charter to allow the City Planning Commission to make final determinations on all administrative land use permits. Um, we also oppose the proposal of uh, making the Landmarks Preservation Commission part of the Department of City Planning. Um, we also have some recommendations related to mun municipal open data, which are in the, the testimony I've submitted. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kresp. Kresp, is there anyone who has any questions? Thank you very much. Um, Sheila Kendrick. Uh, thank you. Thank you for incorporating the land use process um, into this uh, charter re review session. Uh, I'm a member of Save Central Park NYC, and we are particularly concerned about a tower that was approved by the Department of Buildings as a 25-story building and was changed long into the process to a 775-foot tower. At 25 stories, mid-block, it was contextual. Uh, now, after a significant length of time, it is an enormous tower with a shadow that's going to extend from 66th Street on the west side across Central Park to, to Bethesda Fountain. This tower will be the highest structure on the Upper West Side, and it will eclipse the Time Warner Center. Um, Jackie Kennedy Onassis is not here anymore to represent the people in uh, this journey that we're facing right now. The developer used many loopholes to circumvent the letter and intent of the zoning resolution. Our community board seven, our city council member Rosenthal, our Manhattan borough president, our speaker Corey Johnson, and all the Manhattan city council representatives have come out strongly against the use of loopholes that are destroying our neighborhoods and allowing towers such as this. We at Save Central Park NYC are concerned about the shadows that will be cast for generations to come. Our recommendation is that the land use process, including approvals, start with the community boards to include the community and the people in the land use process. Of course, all community boards would have to be staffed with paid land use um, experts um, and zoning experts. The system as it exists right now, as of right, is wrong. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Kendrick. 
Are there any questions? There are supporters. <laughs> um, the next speaker is Andrea Goldwyn from um, the Landmarks Conservancy. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh, good evening, Chair Benjamin and Commission members. I'm Andrea Goldwyn, speaking on behalf of the New York Landmarks Conservancy. The land use issues under this Commission's review are central to our work in preservation and planning. Over the past several years, and, and my fellow speakers, uh, neighborhoods have, across the city have erupted with alarm over out-of-scale buildings and city policies that enable them. These structures hover over the edges of landmarks, historic districts, and contextual districts, threatening their character and their hard-won protections. We've heard from constituents who say their voices are not being heard when it comes to new development in their communities, and that the Department of City Planning zones but doesn't plan. Overall, we urge this commission to consider a more comprehensive approach to planning. We should have an agency that considers a community's needs, resources, capac and capacity, and makes decisions based on those factors, instead of the current system, which relies on uncertain outcomes and negotiations with developers. For now, there's not just the one problem, but multitudes of loopholes and workarounds that should be fixed. We ask this commission to consider setting a trigger for public review when a building's proposed height reaches a certain limit proportionate to a neighborhood or community district. Notification of zoning lot mergers to community boards, borough presidents, and council members. Setting a limit on the height and location of voids in mechanical spaces and or counting them against a building's FAR calculation. Setting a standard floor height and counting taller floor heights in proportion against total FAR requiring consistent DOB enforcement of FAR interpretations, improving ULERP by establishing a consistent and transparent pre-planning process for community boards to review applications in their early stages, providing community boards funding so they can engage professionals to respond to complicated land use proposals, and improve community board training on land use issues. For too many people, the city's planning system and its 1961-era zoning resolution are broken. We urge you to fix them. On preservation, the city's Landmarks Preservation Commission is one of the strongest and most effective in the country. Its protection of historic resources was integral in reinvigorating the city's economy after the dark days of the financial crises in the 70s and 80s. In recent boom years, it set the balance, working to maintain the dynamic mix of old and new that makes New York unique. This success leads to the conclusion that the LPC should absolutely continue as an independent agency. We believe the agency would be more successful with a few improvements. The Commission should reestablish its authority over city-owned landmarks and scenic landmarks. And we'd like to see tweaks to the appointed Commission, compensation for the commissioners, prompt reappointments, and the requirement of a preservationist, at least one preservationist, on the Commission. Thank you. Thank you, for, thank you very much, Ms. Goldwyn. Are there any questions? Carl? Yes. Um, I have a question about compensation for commissioners, uh, landmarks commissioners, and I know that uh, Borough President Brewer also brought this up. Um, I think one of the issues with compensating landmarks commissioners is that they would then be subject to the same conflict requirements that um, commissioners in the City Planning Commission or city employees are, are subject to, which would greatly reduce the um, quality or pool of um, particularly architects and preservationists um, who would be eligible to participate in this, uh, on the Landmarks Preservation Commission. And so I'm wondering how you would balance those two seemingly contradictory objectives. I, I think that it's something that needs to be explored. Right now, I think nine out of the 10 commissioners are uh, running on expired terms. So clearly it's hard to get people uh, to participate. Um, maybe if there was compensation, it would be more attractive, but certainly the conflict of interest issues could become prevalent. I think it's something that the commission should look into, test it out, see if it would be an improvement it's not clear that it would work, but I'd like to see them look at it. I believe that most other city agencies that have commissions do have compensated commissioners. 
They do, but they're also subject to mm -hmm. conflict of interest requirements, which really does limit the, their ability to engage in outside businesses when being on a commission is very much a part-time job. I think it's something that should be explored. Thank you. Are there further questions? Hearing none, thank you very much, Ms. Goldwyn. Um, Patricia? Thank you. Excuse me, how do you pronounce your last name, just so I don't screw it up again? Oh, no, you did it right. Okumo. Okumo, okay. We, what we stand for, we are a coalition of groups and individuals dedicated to replacing New York City's Civilian Complaint Review Board with an elected civilian review board. Thank you, Charter Commission. My name is Patricia Okumu. Many of you have seen me on television on the 4th of July when I decided to scale the Statue of Liberty. The reason I did that, as you know, we haven't talked about it tonight, it was about the children. Our government has decided to put on in cages. I was protesting Trump zero tolerance policy on immigration. The testimony today is to the Charter Revision Commission, CRC. The CRC, not any other, is our chance to demand change. Due to lack of time, I will present a brief summary of my testimony today. I am here to forge solutions in light of the crisis we face daily in our city. The problem is that not enough police officers are held accountable for their actions or inaction which perpetrate injuries to civilians. Their lack of judgment due, due to systematic racism, unconscious bias has caused too many deaths among our black communities. After segregation supposedly ended, most of the laws have remained unchanged. The law is preventing you from doing the right thing. It must be changed now. If this wasn't the case, CRC will have shown us that you have the real power to defend the people. We the people. Admit it, you do not have the power to gain justice because of the law you must follow. The over-incarceration of marginalized communities and massacre of black men is evidence of segregation in the United States, racism, is real and everyday struggle. Segregation never ended. If you want to know about me personally and how this issue affects my life, then look it up. In 2009, I could have been Eric Garner. I had filed a complaint with the Civilian Com Complaint Review Board against the NYPD prior to Eric's death. The brutal incident happened on Bay Street in Staten Island, where I reside. Such handling of a female by police wouldn't have happened to a white woman. Perhaps Eric's death would have been avoided if you hadn't downgraded, downplayed, or dismissed my complaint. CRC, do not water down and ignore our complaints. Please create an elected board now. And may I remind you, I do not trust the process, unfortunately. As we speak, we, are, we have children in cages. Michelle Obama says when they go low, we go high. I went as high as, as gold because our country went so low. Our laws have no morality. And unfortunately, I am saddened by that and I do not trust this process. First, thank you for your time. Thank you very much, Ms. Okumu. Okumu. That's correct. Thank you. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. And the next speaker is Oksana Mironova. Is that correct? Mironova. Close enough. <laughs> um,
Thank you. Uh, my name is Aksana Mironova, and I'm a housing policy analyst at the Community Service Society. We're an anti-poverty organization here in the city. Thank you for this opportunity to comment on the New York City Charter. Uh, given the diminishing supply of public property and the great need for affordable housing, open space, public facilities, the disposition of public property should serve pressing community needs. Specifically, re we recommend requiring the city to prioritize public benefit in the sale or lease of all public property r rather than selling or renting it to the, uh, for the highest marketable price or rental. Defining a process for measuring public benefit that prioritizes the most pressing community needs Developing a comprehensive process for the, uh, for the dis disposition of public property that is connected to a citywide planning framework. The charter devotes multiple pages to the process of land use, land use review, but does not define the metrics or goals for measuring the impact of land use actions. While the explicit guidance and the methodology should be left to the seeker uh, technical manual, Ma uh, major methodological gaps have repeatedly underestimated displacement pressures and socioeconomic <coughs> impacts resulting from land use actions. We recommend updating the environmental review language within the charter to be more prescriptive about the goals and methodology of the environmental review process, requiring the mayor in consultation with community and agency experts to establish a criteria for measuring displacement, including potential for direct, indirect, chain, and exclusionary displacement. Um, requiring the City Planning Commission to conduct a citywide analysis of displacement risk using the said criteria. The criteria should be employed with, explicit, with an explicit goal of meeting the City's fair housing goals and ensuring a no net loss of affordable units. Uh, employing the criteria in the environmental review process for all future land use actions, requiring the tracking and reporting of displacement and socioeconomic neighborhood change after land use actions are approved to measure their impact, and mandating a review of the City Environmental Quality Review Technical Manual by community and agency experts every five years. Um, in addition to that, we also support the call for a comprehensive, comprehensive community planning framework, but I feel like that's been discussed by people on this panel and um, in other meetings before this one, so I'm not gonna go into that, but that's also a good idea and should be considered by this board. Thank you. Um, first, my uh, quick question. Are you speaking on behalf of the Community Service Society also? Uh, yes. Okay. Are there any questions? Thank you very much, Ms. Mironova. I can't get it right, but I keep trying. Um, and last on this panel is Beth Goldman. Uh, thank you. Thank you to the chair and to the commissioners for this opportunity to testify today. My name is Beth Goldman, and I am the president of the New York Legal Assistance Group. Uh, NILAG, as we're known, is a leading provider of comprehensive, free civil legal services for low-income New Yorkers. I'm here today to talk about uh, the procurement issues that others have talked about. Uh, I've partnered uh, with David Greenfield, who appeared before the Brooklyn yes, he did. Uh, hearing. Uh, we are representing an informal group of other uh, human services organizations, legal service providers who face this problem. Uh, two preliminary points. The first is that uh, this is not um, to bash government contracts. Government contracts are what allow us to do the vast amount of work that we do do. Um, this city has shown a great commitment to legal services for the poor, and the contracts have benefited the city uh, cities poor and the ability to provide legal services for them. Um, it's also not uh, a condemnation of any agency or uh, the mayor's office of contract services, all of whom are uh, staffed by professionals with whom uh, we actually enjoy a very good working relationship. The issue here, though, is that there is a real problem uh, that you've heard about from others, and the controller's done a lot of work and a lot of research in his report showing that. 80% um, of contracts in, in fiscal year 17 uh, were not registered at the time uh, the contract started. And the reality is that with a city with a budget of over $88 billion, uh, nonprofits like ours are doing the work and not being paid till long after the services have been provided. I provide here some statistics just about my organization and what we've faced over the last three years. Um, and in FY17, 22 contracts start July 1, 2016, 19 were not 
registered until the May through August period. June is the end of the fiscal year, so that's the point there. Um, FY18, similar, we are still waiting for the last couple of contracts from FY18 to be uh, registered. And for this current year, we're already um, almost through with the first quarter of the fiscal year, and uh, we have 3% uh, of our contracts have been registered. So what do we do? What do organizations like ours do? We have a line of credit, and we borrow against it, but we pay interest. Uh, we we some, can borrow from reserves up to a point, but we're running out of the ability to do that as the contracts grow. And, and as I've now expressed to various city agencies, we're, we may get to a point where we can't take on any more contracts because of the cash flow problems that it causes us uh, by doing it. We can't do the work and not get paid. We can't afford to do it. We're running out of that. Um, so why do we come to you for a solution? I think it's because there isn't one single agency that's responsible. There are so many, and nobody knows where the contract is at any given point. So the point is to have the, the charter set a deadline, like it does for the controller, uh, to register contracts. And we would suggest that a, any contract get to the controller within 60 days of its start date. And if they don't, then there will be a payout that covers us for the cost of borrowing. Um, and then transparency in the system so we can know where the contract is at any given time, and then a report at the end by any agency that doesn't comply with those deadlines. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Carl? Um, yes, I'm going to ask you the same question I asked Mr. Greenfield, which is, um, and who was... Who barred from answering the question, so I assume you as an attorney will likewise be judicious. But are there certain, I mean, you, you have contracts with a variety of city agencies, and do you find a pattern of certain agencies' contracts being registered in a timely fashion and other agencies that you're dealing with fairly regularly? you don't have those contracts registered in a timely basis? Um, I, I would say that if you look at the report by the controller, you see that there are agencies that seem to be worse. Our, per, our experience is that they're all delayed, and they don't seem to be delayed necessarily at the agency. We, will, we have contacts and people who are trying to help us, and they'll often say, we've done our part. We don't know where it is mm -hmm. now. And that does seem to be a standard thing. They, if it goes out of the agency or goes out of the department we're talking to, we don't know where it is, and nobody does. There's nobody to call. I mean, that, that actually, as someone who's initiated a lot of contracts within city government, that actually I find, I don't find surprising that they're delayed. What I do find surprising is that the agency does not know where they are in the process. I always pretty much knew where they were in the process. I, I, my understanding is that because it, it goes from one agency to another and there isn't one system that follows a particular contract through it, there isn't visibility. Um, I, don't, I don't know why, but as someone who used to be in city government, I know how complicated the systems are and they often don't speak to one another from agency to agency, but I, I don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, Commissioner Camilla. Thank you so much for your testimony, and as, as the former head of MOX and a former employee of MOX, <laughs> this is not uh, the first time I've heard uh, this issue be raised. Um, while there are some challenges, absolutely, um, the analysis really does show that it's a shared burden. You're right that there are five, maybe six agencies that touch the procurement process, all for a very good reason. Um, and we've made some strides with the rollout of, um, of HHS Accelerator to help gain additional transparency. So the things that you've mentioned are a management issue, and I think the city is working towards addressing that through the rollout and development of Passport. 
um, which will provide additional transparency on where things are. So once we obtain additional transparency, um, and as you mentioned, if, you know, pointing at the other at the other offices as uh, the cause for the delay, and once we have that level of transparency, um, do is there are there other solutions um, that would address okay. that the issues that you've raised? So I, I think what I would say is, is twofold. The first is, um, you know, the, the new systems like Passport and others definitely are, make it more user friendly and allow us to upload our documents all at once and not have to redo it. And, and everyone's quite appreciative of that, but it doesn't tell us anything about the status of the contract. It's either registered or unregistered. So you don't know where it is along the way. It hasn't, doesn't seem to have sped things up. If anything, if we look at our history, it gets slower. Um, so the transparency that I'm talking about goes to where is it in the cycle? So that somebody, um, you know, if it's sitting, I'm making this up, so no offense to DOI, but if it's sitting on a pile at DOI, nobody knows that it's there. Nobody, you know, there's, there's no accountability. So transparency in that way might force people to act more quickly. So I, if I, if just for point of clarification, if it's sitting at DOI or at OMB or at MOX, people know. We do have <laughs> APT. You, uh, that might be the case, and then there, there might be communication issues. People know where things get stuck. So just want to clarify that, because I think what within the procurement world, it is such a complicated, multifaceted process that addressing the, the people problem you are, you, in terms of communication um, uh, is, is one thing, uh, but there is a shared platform. Currently, does, it's not the best one, and we're working to change that, but people know where things are. Whether or not that's being communicated appropriately to the vendors is another question, and I think that we most certainly have to do better at um, just putting that out there. Okay, so then I would go to my second point, which is even with those systems, a system that doesn't require that contracts start to be paid within the first quarter when the work is being done, I think there's something wrong with that system, right? We're doing the work that the city wants done, um, yet we who you know have small margins, do not have deep Absolutely. well of cash, are literally going to banks and borrowing money to pay payroll you know, it's we're up all night worrying about paying payroll sure. on contracts that the city has awarded us, but we're not being paid on. A question for you from Dr. Paoli. Yeah, I, look, I, I could not agree more with you. And <clears throat> I think po part of what we need to do is look at how many levels of approval are there and uh, do they all make sense and do they add anything to the process? Because I think that, that the, the more people have to touch the paper, the longer it will always take. And you know, we just have to figure out what are the necessary approvals that are ju just really adding to the process and making it transparent and you know, well vetted and so on. That's one piece. And the other piece is that you know, we have to learn to give people money ahead of time if they have a contract and then audit it post audit. And I think you know, I, I, we've been doing business with the same people for a very long period of time. It's not like we don't know them and we know where they live, we know where their children go to school, we know, <laughs> you know. So uh, it, we have to find a, a different process. I also feel that we need to stop treating community-based organizations as vendors. They're not vendors, they're our partners. And as partners, they should be treated differently. Thank you. And look, we'd love um, to work more with you in the future if there's an opportunity to think this through even further. Um, thank you very much. If there are no further questions, um, I've been asked to take a five-minute stretch and bathroom break. So all of you are welcome to also, there's a men's room in the back of the room, and the ladies' room is out the door and to my right. Um, we will return in five minutes. And before you leave, let me just tell you, there are 48 speakers left, and the next six speakers, when we return, will be Ben Kalos, Michael Zambluskins. Hmm? Okay. Uh, Joy Goldberg. 
Alita Camp, Nancy Sliwa, and Curtis Sliwa. Earlier than the last time, Curtis. Is it 48 or 20? 48. 48. Yep. Oh. Probably a couple of those people aren't here, so there's probably only two panels before.
Thank you all for indulging me and let me, letting me um, take a little break. We're back now, and uh, the panel, the next speaker is Ben Kalos. Good evening. Our city's charter is in desperate need of an upgrade for the next generation. The last telegram was sent in 2006, so I don't think the charter should require telegraph to be maintained by the NYPD commissioner. The minimum wage is about to be $15 an hour, and I don't think that the mayor's fourth enumerated power should be to pay election workers only $20 a day. We're presented with an opportunity to examine the balance of powers, the infrastructure of our government, and ultimately who is empowered to make decisions on behalf of 8.7 million people who call the city home. Since August, I have carried a copy of the charter around with me, highlighting interesting sections and soliciting input. I must admit that I haven't read all the way through to section 3103 of the charter. My testimony, though, does represent a best effort through a cursory review identifying challenge, challenges with the proposed solutions as a starting point. I joined hundreds of New Yorkers in participating in the Mayor's Charter Revision Commission by testifying over several months in favor of items now on the ballot, including term limits and urban planners for community boards, and a slate of campaign finance reforms to reduce large contributions and match more small dollars with more public dollars to finally get big money out of New York City politics. First and foremost, I would ask that if these measures pass, this commission not weaken them in any way and in fact, I'm asking you to strengthen them by adding a requirement that any part of the charter adopted through a vote of the people only be subject to change by those same people at another vote. Along those lines, there are certain reforms that must be protected from future change without a vote of the people, such as ethics reforms for a lifetime ban on lobbying and lifetime term limits for elected officials, and enshrine reforms in the city council to make the job full time eliminate Lulu's for equal compensation and standardized budget allocations for each council member. In the face of an attack on our rights from the federal government, New York City is in need of its own Bill of Rights guaranteeing residents a right to free higher education and child care, affordable health and mental health care, access to parks, libraries and public transit, affordable internet, freedom from hunger, clean air and water, just to name a few. This commission can create a pathway for all the residents with great ideas for laws at these hearings and in the future to submit bills directly to the city council for a guaranteed hearing and vote. Ultimately, the 1989 Charter Revision Commission gave many of the powers from the Board of Estimate to the mayor and boards appointed by the mayor. Regardless of the mayor, other elected officials and communities have often been without power to stop a wrong. My recommendations hope to democratize many of the city's most powerful boards with appointments from the borough presidents and council to achieve fair housing and affordable housing goals. Borough presidents and community boards must be empowered to veto bad rezonings. The council empowered with a final vote on franchises that have left residents without reliable ca cable or internet, and both empowered to initiate land use changes in their own right. I would highlight for this commission three main themes. My testimony is 30 pages. Please enjoy reading. <laughs> Thank you very much, Council Member. Uh, Commissioner Fiella has a question for you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Council Member, I want to uh, thank you for uh, being with us tonight, and we look forward to the extensive supplemental material you're providing on behalf of your colleagues. I want to ask you a question about a subject that uh, you took up four or five, six years ago. I don't know the exact date, but I read a report uh, you provided some oversight hearings and held uh, an extensive uh, series of discussions regarding the community boards. I read that report years back. I got to pull it out and find it. The question I have is because the, um, this is my third charter commission and I can tell you from 1989 forward community boards, community boards, community boards. The c subject comes up every time. What you find when you listen is some community boards operate and seem to have tremendous influence utilizing the existing language in the charter. So that supports the notion that there's sufficient language as exists that allows community boards to have a meaningful voice. And then a lot of them say, I need this, I need this, I need this, which then leads you to conclude there's a deficiency in the language as it presently exists. You did that extensive analysis. Is there any intention to do a follow-up and see what 
or what percentage of community boards have adopted the measures that came out of that task force effort and to see whether or not we really need the charter to be beefed up or do we need the community boards to gain a better understanding and insight into the existing language and utilize the tools that are already available to them in the charter. And great work on that report, by the way. I read it from cover to cover. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> it, is, it is very rare for elected officials to hear anyone actually reads any of the things we write. That report was about 80 pages, and it collected a lot of the best practices from every borough, including your great borough of Staten Island. Uh, where your borough president does not appoint people with political affiliations, which I think is a best practice. I like to tell folks that when a community board, a council member, and their borough president are aligned, there is very little that can stop them. Uh, that is likely because in many cases involving land use, the council member has the final vote. Uh, when you have a situation where there is not an alignment between the community board, borough president, and the council member, uh, one awful, often sees that the borough president may be misaligned or the council member may be misaligned, in which case you end up with a situation where the community board, board's voice goes unheard. That's why I'd like to add one more step to the process, which is if you have a community board, say, I, I want them to be able to say, we have a problem with this, and if the borough president says I have a problem with this, they could bring it to the borough board and if all three of them agree, they might be able to say, hold on. And just as negotiations go, not to tell too much of the secret sauce to some of the people at this table among the commission who actually have been involved in more land use actions than I will ever be involved in for my entire life, if you are dealing with people at the table who have a vote, the negotiation is gonna go much differently and I believe that if the City Planning Commission, which I would hope to reconstitute with a voice from the council, had knew that the community board's vote had a binding impact, and if they didn't make the community board and borough president happy, they risked going before a borough board that might stop their project, then you would have a City Planning Commission that was more responsive to community board concerns. So I assume then that uh, in, forthcoming in the material, we might find something regarding binding authority relative to the community board's role in our city. Uh, page 20. <laughs> what was that? I'm page 20. Page, thanks, thank you so much, Council. Thank you. Paula? Being one of the many people who have read the charter, um, thank you for that. <laughs> uh, I wanted to ask a question about whether you thought there'd be any value to just streamlining the structure of the charter so that more residents would get engaged in our city. Thank you for reading the charter. I am very happy with the commissioners who have been selected, uh, that all the nerds in government have been attracted to the right place. I. Uh, found many places like the Telegraph and the uh, Board of Elections where I feel that we should slim down the charter so it is not necessarily 360 pages if printed from the city's website and pull a lot of the things that don't need to be there out and put it into the administrative code. I think there's a lot that's in the administrative code that could be pulled out and put into rules and regulations and we could have a document that could be a lot more accessible, a lot more like our Constitution. One of the items I'm suggesting is a Bill of Rights, and that could actually help guide our principles and values, and so instead of somebody having to find Charter Section 435B, they could say, no, on, on Section 1 where the Bill of Rights is that says that there's a right to access to my government and, and you're violating that right, please fix it. Thank you, I agree. Sal? <clears throat> Council member, good evening. Good evening. Uh, I'd like to commend you first for the work you've done on, on, on the charter um, and your suggestions. Very thorough, good work, a lot of very solid ideas. Um, and in terms of campaign finance reform, um, sad to say, uh, the proposals that, are be, that will be on the ballot um, in my opinion, won't do much to keep conflicted money out of 
our politics. Um, it basically still people running for citywide office will still be reaching out to deep pocketed sources in the city. Um, people in in working class communities, some of the poor communities are going to be unfortunately left out of the process. Um, lobbyists and developers and their families can still bundle money. So I know you and I have had a discussion about what I consider the gold standard in campaign finance, which is the Seattle Democracy Voucher Program. I was wondering why you didn't include that in your proposals. Thank you for your advocacy for democracy vouchers. It is something that I hope to work with you, not in this role, but in a different role as a, a strong advocate and, and former elected yourself to pass legislation on that that could be done outside the charter if this commission chooses to start enshrining certain items like democracy vouchers from being changed by elected officials through a political process. I'd be interested in doing that as well. And, and, and you're right. If the current system only gives candidates a little more than half of the money they need to run, uh, and right now I believe for the mayor's office that is uh, 2.6 uh, million dollars. Under the new system, it would be a little over a million, uh, and, and you're correct. A million dollars is still a, a god awful amount of money that that shouldn't be there. We got from 55 to 75 percent. If we could get to 85%, it would mean that you wouldn't actually need to raise any dollars larger than 250. That being said, I, I like to say to folks, I I've never, get, you can currently give the mayor $5,100 or any citywide official. I've never given anyone something worth that much. I, I gave one person something worth that much and I expected her to spend the rest of her life with me. She said yes. Uh, but money has expectations and so some of my colleagues from who represent low-income communities of color have said to me no one no one's writing me a check from my neighborhood for two hundred and fifty dollars we need democracy vouchers and and I agree and the reason it is not in this testimony to be frank and honest it was in my initial testimony to the mayor's charter revision commission and based on the direction that they were going between June and July we ended up dropping it and focusing on the direction they were going and we pulled many of the recommendations that we're giving you from that same report. It's an oversight, and at the next hearing, I hope to include it. So you're open. You're open to. I want to introduce the legislation and get it passed, and I'm interested in making it a, a, an elected official proof, uh, item enshrined in the charter. Thank you, Mayor. Are there other questions? Are there other questions? Thank you, you Councilmember. Uh, the next speaker is Michael Zambluskas. Yes. Uh, I want to thank you, uh, Commissioners, for being here, and I want to commend you on your stamina and patience. I mean, it's a long night, and it's probably longer for you than it is for me. Um, my name is Michael Zambluskas. I'm the former chair Manhattan County Chairman of the Independence Party. I've been active in politics basically since 92. I've helped Democrats, Republicans, uh, third party candidates if I liked them. Matter of fact, Commissioner Albanese is one of the candidates I helped at one point in time. Um, I wanted to, and right now, our voter turnout is basically 25% in citywide elections. That is pathetic, absolutely pathetic. When you think about Afghanis and Iraqis that went out and voted in almost an 80% turnout under the threat of death and they had to basically dye their uh, thumb purple for three days. Since we've had the campaign finance board, term limits, it's actually hurt our democracy. So I think some of the things we need to do to actually enhance debate is the instant runoff voting, for one, because that will actually um, eliminate uh, some of the people that, um, you know, uh, spoke earlier. I'm not going to get into the cost and everything else. But instant runoff voting will actually save money for the city and we'll have one election. But I also want to talk also on proportional representation. 
I think that will help tremendously with voter turnout. Being from a third party, and I've actually run on the Republic, uh, with a Republican ticket, I've you know, gotten a decent number of votes in my elections, but one of the things I always hear, and especially even more so with third parties, I'm wasting my vote. Even Republicans in Upper East Side of Manhattan, from where I'm from, I'm wasting my vote if I'm electing. Why should I even come out? Because the Democrat's going to win. We need to establish that, hey, if I can vote for, uh, I can vote for you, uh, and then if you lose, your vote will roll over, you'll get more people turning out. And as, asking the commissioner's question from earlier, uh, Fasella, sorry. Um, Fiella. Fiella, sorry, I'm, I apologize. Fasella is a different step. Right, okay. <laughs> Former council same bar, member. Same bar. I, I, okay, I go back to uh, George Washington's farewell address. Beware of the tyranny of parties. We need, we need to open it up. And it's, uh, New York City is uh, one party rule and we need more voices heard, proportional representation will do that. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? You're home free. The next speaker, I'm sorry, my fingers are, is Joy Goldberg. Is your mic on? Press the button. Thank you for the honor, first of all. Uh, honorable Madam Chairperson, Honorable Commissioners, my name is Joy Goldberg and I live in Brooklyn and I'm proud of it. Um, I retired April 1st, 2016 as a distribution and window clerk in the United States Post Office in New Lot Station, Brooklyn, New York, 11208 for around, give or take, the last two years of my postal career, I waited on an average of two customers per day at my window alone, who presented the two envelopes with the certificates of mailing. Uh, these are replies to eviction notices. One envelope to the marshal, one envelope to the attorney handling the eviction. This included the elderly. Multiply my window, this is every day now, multiply my window by three or four windows open, times every station in Brooklyn, times every station in New York City, times every station in the United States. That's a serious problem. I have friends in the housing project across the street from the post office. A couple years back, their rent increased dramatically, and they took a hit in their food stamps. A former co-worker of mine studied hard to get a real estate broker's license and passed. Congratulations seemed in order. Then I learned that the same person was working for a firm that bought buildings that needed care, fixed them up, and resold them. My first gut reaction was, after they do this to every building, whose playground will the greatest city, the apple, become? Who is behind gentrifying every neighborhood? I doubt the people with the two envelopes and the certificates of mailing. Looks as how forces are at work who would make it impossible for anyone except the rich to live in New York City. I also wonder how many of these owners of brand spanking new gentrified buildings live in the community and sustain it. And how are the property taxes off the blood of the now evicted poor sustaining the community? Bettering New York City for whom? The Bible decries dividing the land for gain. And that's in quotes. It is incongruous, inhuman, monstrous to take the bread and shelter from those who need it most and part and parcel it to those who need it least. I'm almost there. In short, it is evil. God is watching closely over the apple of his eye. 
over how the measuring lines are drawn, what rezoning takes place, and who will benefit. You are authorities anointed with a stewardship with which it is incumbent upon you to do the right thing. For this, I implore and exhort you, begin with those who need it first, the most. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, Ms. Goldberg. Thank you. The next speaker is Alita Camp. Good evening, commissioners. Thank you for hearing my testimony. My name is Alita Camp. I am the chair of Community Board 8 Manhattan. The board has not had the opportunity to determine fully which charter provisions this commission should examine. I understand that there will be additional opportunities to testify. I would like to address only land use and landmarks. CB8M supports additional financial and other resources to enable community boards to do their job properly. We support an urban planner for each community board. However, we urge this commission to propose that such resources be provided by the borough president's offices. CB8 recommends a stronger, more robust community-based land use planning process. We would like to see greater emphasis on community assessment of social and environmental factors in considering land use plans. Land use affects our communities. We deserve and accordingly recommend that community boards have a greater role in the planning process, including policy making, to be sure that all community concerns are heard and considered. New York is a large and diverse city. The great diversity of age, religion, culture, race, ethnicity, and income are what create the vitality that attracts businesses, visitors, and residents. We are well situated to assess impact of land use decisions on the diversity and quality of life in our communities. Rebney testified before the 2018 Charter Review Commission. We anticipate that it will testify to the same or closely related points before this one. We emphatically oppose stronger as of right development, including allowing the CPC final determination on administrative land use permits. We are gravely concerned about the extent of development in our community and across New York. We further reject any attempt to displace the City Council and land use decisions. These decisions are at the heart of New York. Many, if not all, issues and problems facing New York, such as affordable housing, displacement of long-term residents because of ill-considered gentrification, sufficient educational resources, overburdened infrastructure, lack of green space, particularly in CB8, loss of small business and environmental deterioration, for example, flow from the overdevelopment we are seeing. We further believe that the entire EULA process should be transparent. Transparency would include an evaluation of whether self-certification benefits New York. Individually, I ask for com comprehensive community plans before further building permits are issued. I want to know the impact of these buildings on my community as well as around New York where we are seeing out of context construction. CB8 wants to know that there are provisions to provide for affordable housing for those New Yorkers that cannot afford market rate housing. New York should be a city for everyone at all economic levels. We ask that sufficient resources be provided for affordable housing and that the need for and commitment to affordable housing be a part of the charter. CB8 urges the Commission to include a revision to provide for notification to community boards as soon as any land use applications, including as of right and commencement of the EULA process, are filed. We further recommend that applications indicate in which community board the project is filed, enabling prop prompt notification to the boards. CB8 exports, supports the expansion of EULA to land owned by NYCHA and enforcement of deed restrictions on land held for the public benefit. The landmarks just Landmarks. The Landmarks Preservation Commission has a critical task of preserving New York's valuable history and architecture. We strongly urge the Commission to support and enhance the LPC's role and that of community boards in Landmarks designation and application reviews, and to recognize the importance of preservation in the dynamic fabric of New York. Thank you so much for your time, and your attentiveness is remarkable. Thank you very much, um, Ms. Camp. Is there anyone who would like to ask a question? Thank you, Ms. Camp. Thank you. Nancy Sliwa. Hi. <clears throat> Good evening, everybody. Um, my name is Nancy Sliwa, and I'm the director of Guardian Angels Animal Protection, and I'm also running for attorney general on the Reform Party line with an all-animal rights platform. And I'm here to speak on behalf of having an independent animal <clears throat> sorry, welfare agency in New York. Um, currently, at this point, we have the city shelters that are being run as kill shelters, and they're, they're funded um, over $20 million per year, 
And I think the biggest issue as to why they remain kill shelters is because there's no oversight, there's no um, singular organization that's actually guided with the focus of maintaining the life of the animals. Um, <clears throat> so there's more than enough money, there's more than enough agencies working. And right now the Animal Care and Control is about to get a renewed 34-year contract that has been admittedly not even reviewed by any of the members of council and how something like that could go through in my opinion would have to be because there is no singular agency that's overseeing the animal welfare. Um, right now we have um, the, one of the biggest issues with why they continue to euthanize healthy animals is overcrowding. So now again, without having a singular focus, without keeping in mind that you need to keep the populations down, they've never made that part of their agenda. So they're not going out, so as a, a little bit of a visual example here, this is one of the, the rescue cats that I have. And this cat is from an outdoor colony. And this cat is actually part of um, what, what would go on with, with all the cats that live outdoors currently. There are people who are feeding cats and the law permits you to, to feed the cats and care for the cats and actually criminalizes those who prevent you from doing that. The problem is the laws are so scattered and there's no agencies for people to turn to. So when they're doing this for years on end and someone comes up to them who happens to have some right over the land or maybe the cats happen to walk somewhere, they have no recourse and they have no one to go to. Um, the cats being there, another positive of them is that they're useful for rat eradication. Now again, without having a singular animal agency, that's never been put into play as a program. But in Chicago, there's a program called Cats at Work, which is exactly what they do with the, the feral cats that are brought into shelters, which otherwise would be euthanized because they're considered unadoptable. They have a six-month waiting list for these cats. That's how much of a demand they are. These cats will go into um, either residences, like backyards, or they'll go into businesses. That's another reason why, for instance, even having the Department of Health they banned having cats in bodegas. Those are just so familiar. I mean, they're, they're willing to take the fact that they might get a fine because they realize it actually makes more sense than having the rats run around. And just one final point, um, it, this is being done in, in the Javits Center and throughout community gardens. This is you know, more formalized. But um, a few years ago, there was um, a, a law being passed to say $200,000, that's 1% of the, the budget going to animal care and control, would work toward actually spaying and neutering the feral cats. It was approved unanimously, and with one veto, Cuomo took it off the table, and like that, it, it doesn't, doesn't exist anymore. That actually attacks the problem, and that's what's needed. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Um, Count Commissioner Fiella. Uh, thank you. Um, Mrs. Sliwa, first of all, thank you for wearing the red, <laughs> being part of an organization that's uh, helped the city a lot over the years. Secondly, um, this is our fifth hearing Correct. in recent weeks, mm -hmm. and uh, this is one of the emerging themes that we have heard over and over and over again. So the passion is to be applauded. The question I have, mm -hmm. because what we have to do is start to think about the art of the possible, and what is an appropriate charter recommendation, mm -hmm. right? So process-wise, are you aware of any legislative fix? Is the city legislature or is it the state legislature? Is there any bill in the Senate or the Assembly? Any issue be, uh, being advanced in the city council that could address uh, a portion of this or all well, of this? Well, um, one thing I know that is there's um, one, one thing that's being pushed through to say that every single pet store would have to have shelter animals so you can't have any breeder animals. That's one way to sort of start clearing the shelters a little bit. So that's a particular focused <coughs> end objective. Um, and like I said, the idea that the Javits Center actually did bring in feral cats to, to, to actually use it instead of putting down the rat poisons, which currently are being distributed throughout neighborhoods, playgrounds. I mean, animals are getting sick. 
people are getting sick. There's a lot of secondary environmental effects that happens from putting down <coughs> all these poisons in mass. Okay. All right. Thank you for the Thank clarification. You. Any further questions? Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Oh, I'm sorry, Sal. Sorry. Just, uh, Mrs. Nancy, great yes. job. Uh, Thank you. Great testimony. Thank you. Uh, your passion is important on this, on this issue because uh, um, we know for years this, this has been swept under the rug and buried in the Department of Health with the whole issue of animal welfare. Mm -hmm. And uh, we've heard from so many people now it's becoming etched in our consciousness. Uh, but the, the, the issue you, that you raised regarding feral cats, I mean, the city could save a ton of money if they used them instead of spending, you know, millions on rat I mean, Blasio, I think, has, um, in the past maybe four years, has been, oh, like, close to $50 million, and these are all singular focuses that maybe will eradicate a rat in a certain area for a moment. But again, the, the, it, they keep on populating. It doesn't address, I mean, it's too much money. And then it's also just the toxins itself. When you already have the cats out there, I mean, the fact that it's being done throughout the United States, you would think New York would be much more progressive when it comes to animal issues on this. And, and you just pointed out that the Javits Center Correct. has successively used feral cats to, to get rid of rats. And, and there are community gardens throughout the, the city as well. So, I mean, I think it's just the, the more formalized that this becomes, the easier it will become for people to start implementing it as a plan. How would that program work with the feral cats, just so you can just quickly describe? Well, I mean, yeah, like, so for instance, um, with the, the cats that are in the shelters right now, or the ones that are just existing, you know, within a neighborhood, what you need to do is you need to um, spay and neuter them. They're very territorial. They stay in the area as long as they're being fed on a regular basis, or you create a little housing unit for them. These are healthy cats. They've all been vaccinated, um, you know, they're not procreating, so they're not adding to the population. And then that also creates the opportunity for keeping the population down in general, because when people make the mistake of removing cats from an area because they think they're a nuisance, it creates a vacuum, and now other ones come in and then overpopulate. So you never address the problem by just trying to rid the cats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Mr. Sliwa? Thank you. Uh, I come here tonight as the New York State Reform Party chairman and want to applaud what happened with Charter Revision back in the early 90s. You took the wrecking ball to the Board of Estimate, that denizen of corruption. You got rid of it, right? You got rid of the city council president. You know that guy, Andy Stein, thought he was going to be president. Not <laughs> then we didn't. That was later. <laughs> but anyway, thought he was going to be president. And then all of a sudden, a replacement came about because we had to continue the line of patronage. So we created the position of public advocate. Did we, the citizens, vote on that? Did anybody vote on that? With a $3 million budget, a public advocate makes about $165,000 a year and has no power. They're impotent. No subpoena power. No investigatory powers. So if NYCHA is screwing up, because we know they are, what does a public advocate say to NYCHA? Stop it, or I'll issue a press release. They laugh at the public advocate. They're powerless. And we know what the public advocate position is used for. Ask Mark Green. Ask the President Mayor. Ask Tish James. It's a launching pad to run for a higher office at taxpayers' expense. So we have this position that exists and then once a year, they put out a list of the 100 worst draconian landlords. They have a big press conference, right? And okay, they're bad guys. Then all of a sudden, they're running for higher office. <coughs> Who's the first one that they're whining, dining, and pocket lining? But these draconian Dracula landlords, the sanctimonious hypocrites that they are. I would suggest that we actually put this up for a vote, initiative and referendum. Let the people vote. Do we want to continue the position of public advocate, which I call a fagazi position? It's just a launching pad to run for office at taxpayers' expense. Or do we actually want to give the public advocate, whoever she or he is, the, the weapons, the culions, the power to do something? Now, if Tish James beats you, Nancy, and the rest of the folks running to become the next state attorney general, 
Guess what? There's going to be 40, maybe 50 people trying to get 4,000 signatures to run in a nonpartisan election to become temporarily the public advocate. We have a very unique opportunity since the city will be focused on that position to say, either give the people the right to do away with it or make it a position of power so that a mayor doesn't walk around saying, I don't have to worry about a public advocate. It's a toothless tiger. How about actually giving some teeth to the tigress or the tiger who becomes the next public advocate, or let us, the people, vote it up or down, initiative and referendum, and get rid of this fake, phony, fraudulent, fugazi position the way it exists? Thank you, Curtis. Are there any other? Steve? Hard to argue with uh, that. Mr. Sleewer, let me also thank you as the founder for wearing the red. I was up in Albany a few months ago, and someone was telling me they're bringing you guys up there. Um, let's, I've got two questions for you regarding tonight's testimony, and uh, I have a question regarding your testimony. I believe it was in the Bronx, if, if I recall correctly. Brooklyn. Uh, Brooklyn. <laughs> With respect to the public advocate, this is a topic we have debated ad nauseum. And uh, the people at one point did determine they wanted the office. Do you think that's sufficient? Now, that was a, I grant you, that was a while back. But do you think that plebiscite is sufficient where uh, this commission should make a determination as to whether or not the offices of borough president and public advocate should be funded independently? of having to go to the mayor and the city council? In other words, insulate them from that as they've requested? And was that a sufficient uh, statement on the part of the people? They wanted the office, and therefore this commission should look at providing teeth, more substantial teeth and providing a more meaningful role for the public advocate and the borough presidents. All right, well, the key is a public advocate. Everyone assumes, oh, they have oversight. Well, what oversight do they have? They can't do anything. They can't tell the NYPD, hey, look, you're going to have to answer some certain questions. You know what O'Neill tells the public advocate? F you, like all the commissioners do. Have you ever seen any of the commissioners cooperate with any attempt at an investigatory situation that the public advocate has launched? So the key is give the position teeth but explain to the people exactly what a public advocate cannot do, because all they do is cut ribbons, and they run for higher office on our dime. Okay. Thank you. And it's that the second question, I'm going to read you something. I pulled my notes, as, I, as I, I, I've done throughout this from my last charter meeting. The current system of local elections is a disaster, but nonpartisan elections make voters less likely to vote and create less competitive local races. That was the Wall Street Journal in uh, 2010. Do you agree with that assessment? And finally, you're the chair of a duly organized party of this state. What makes the chairman of a party come out and ask for an election reform that at the local level will essentially diminish the role of the reform party. Diminish? You put me out of business. I won't be a chairman. I won't be like Crowley or, gee, who's in all that trouble in Brooklyn now? Sedio. No. We'll have no power, and that's the way it should be. And most importantly, nonpartisan elections will give people an opportunity to run who don't have two nickels to run together. And the Wall Street Journal, the journal of the rich, the powerful, the people who have means, who are the biggest lobbyists and the biggest purchasers of democracy of anybody, I consider the Wall Street Journal the kind of publication when it talks about true democracy and letting the people's voices be heard. The only people's voices they want to be heard are the very rich and wealthy who already have a stranglehold on New York City. Jazz hands, please. Thank you. Jazz hands. Thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Are there any other questions of our Reform Party Chairman? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the next panel is Ilya Swartenberg. Are you here? All right. 
Um, Michelle Jackson. Okay. Chusi Fasan. Mary Luke. John Lee Compton. Mr. Compton, are you here? Brenda Levin. Okay, I need three more. Alicia Byer, is she here? From MTOPP, excuse me? Okay, Boy. Okay, Kyle Bragg. Three, four, five, with another chair left. And Ed Hartzog. No. <laughs> Miss Jackson. Your mic's not on. There we go. There we go. Good evening. My name is Michelle Jackson. I'm the Deputy Executive Director for the Human Services Council. I'm submitting testimony on behalf of HSC as well as Lawyers Alliance. HSC represents about 170 human services nonprofits in New York City. I've Would testified. Would you pull the mic closer, yes. please? I've testified in front of many, you, many of you before, and the issues won't be much of a surprise. I want to thank you for staying so late, uh, commissioners, and providing me the opportunity to testify. Um, we're here to talk about human services procurement, which you've heard about. We want to already this evening, so I won't rehash a lot of that, except to say we support the recommendations of Councilmember Rosenthal, um, Comptroller Stringer, and then also um, one of our organizations, um, NILAG, testified earlier. Um, the procurement process is an important mechanism for New York City. Human services contracts are part of that procurement process, and the extreme delays and underfunding that those contracts have create real delays uh, in how nonprofits are able to deliver quality services for, uh, for our communities. Um, in addition to um, recommendations that were already brought up, like paying interest, um, which could be part of the city charter on late contracts, um, we also think that the mayor's management report should shed light on the late contracting pro uh, practices by having to every year show when payments are made and when contracts are registered. That used to be part of the mayor's indicator reports, um, and that has kind of gone by the wayside, so we'd like to see that brought up. Um, the PPB should be required to meet four times a year with a public hearing because we think that would allow more changes to be made where they should be, not in the charter, but in the procurement policy board um, around some of the nuances. And I also want to bring up um, some ways to deal with the underfunding as opposed to just the late registration. Right now, uh, requests for proposals do not, can set rates in some of those human services contracts, but there's no justification for those rates. So we think requests for proposals should have to include sample budgets where the city agencies actually have to explain how they arrive at the rates that they're using on human services contracts um, so that there's some sense to that. Um, and we also think that there should be a survey of vendors required before a new RFP. If a new RFP you know, is being based off an old one, they should have to do a survey of the current vendors to see how that contract is going, are outcomes being met, are the rates of service priced appropriately, um, so that there's more light shed on how city agencies develop both the program design as well as the rates that are on those contracts. Um, there's much more detail in my testimony around where we think language could go and about capital appropriation and some other things, um, but I, I will stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ms. Jackson. Are there any questions? Thank you. To see Fasan. Uh, hi, it's uh, Tausif. Tausif. Uh, okay, sorry. No problem. 
Um, so good evening. My name is Tausif Hassan. I am the Civic Engagement Coordinator for the New York Public Interest Research Group, NYPERG, and I'm delivering this testimony on behalf of our program director, uh, Megan Ahern. We appreciate this opportunity to share our thoughts on proposed revisions to the New York City Charter. The federal government has at best demonstrated inaction on some of the most pressing issues facing Americans today. National political leadership is taking away access to health care, affordable higher education, and environmental and public health protections. Fortunately, the New York City Charter revision process is an excellent opportunity to strengthen our city and its citizens from some of the worst of these attacks. We have submitted a longer written testimony and plan to offer more detail as the process continues. I will now summarize our top recommendations to the commission. The Mayor's Charter Revision Commission advanced proposals to strengthen New York City's democracy. However, the 2018 Commission did not advance important items that we urged the 2019 Commission to consider. NYPERG's recommendations to strengthen our democracy and civic empowerment are detailed again in our written testimony, so please refer to it. As you consider changes to the Charter, there can be no doubt that the single biggest challenge facing the world is climate change. NYPERG recommends the establishment of an environmental oversight entity modeled on the successful independent budget office. While NYPERG believes that the city has made laudable pledges and is committed to success, Washington, D.C. has shown how quickly science-based policies can be undermined by a determined ideological anti-science agenda. We propose the creation of an independent environmental oversight office, which would be tasked with ensuring that the city is meeting its environmental pledges. On mass transit, as New Yorkers well know, MTA service continues to get worse, costing New Yorkers time and money. Despite its importance, precious little about mass transit is included in the charter. NYPERG recommends that Chapter 71 of the charter dramatically strengthen reporting requirements so that New Yorkers have a tool to reliably report tra and track poor service. NYPERG also recommends that the charter require the DOT to grant priority to buses on city streets by expanding transit signal priority and vastly increasing the number of dedicated bus lanes and transit-only corridors, beginning with bus routes with the highest ridership. Moving on to financial security, NYPERG recommends that the Commission explores ways to support a municipal public bank. NYPERG is a member of Public Bank NYC, a broad-based coalition fighting for the creation of a public bank chartered to serve the public interest. Public banking is a strategy to advance racial, economic, and environmental justice by divesting public deposits from private Wall Street banks and instead investing in a municipally controlled and publicly accountable bank. And finally, on higher education, the Charter develops wide-ranging goals for education in New York, but says little about education beyond K-12. through NYPERG recommends a new chapter specifically ensuring that resident students attending the City University of New York have as much financial support as possible. Thank you for the opportunity to testify. Thank you very much, Mr. Hassan. Uh, Allison? Um, ah, sorry. Uh, this is more of a, thank you very much for your testimony. This is more of a request, I guess, than a question. Um, I think I find the idea of a public bank, a municipal bank, to be pretty intriguing. Um, and I was wondering if you could be sure to submit if you have any materials or information about why the city can do that, how do that, how it um, creates uh, more uh, or decreases income inequality in the city and provides more access for low banked communities. That would be uh, great. Um, yeah, it's a very exciting idea, and actually we have um, uh, some coalition members here present tonight, and I'm sure that they'll expand on that, but yes, you will have as many materials as you need to do the research that you want to do. Thank you very much. I, I just have oh, a quick sorry. question. Yes. Go ahead. Um, has not, not per given any thought to the city taking over it's mass transit system. Uh, you know, the governor says that we own it. He says you own the system. Um, and the state constitution allows, allows the city as a municipality um, to, uh, un under the home rule law, to uh, pass laws regarding property that, that, it's own, that it owns, including transit facilities. Has Nightper given any thought to that? Um, I 
would need to speak to my colleagues about that. I know that we have a very robust um, transit campaign, um, but I can't give you a definitive answer on that question right now. We will be around for um, further uh, hearings, so we look forward to continuing this conversation with you. I notice, uh, you know, Chicago uh, uh, runs their own transit system, and they, they have invested in that system, and 90% of Chicagoans are thrilled with their mass transit system, which is amazing because people you know, complain about it all the time, 90% according to a recent survey. So you know how people feel about our transit system in New York Yeah, City. they don't have the best things to say. I'd love to hear Nyperg's opinion on that. Yeah, we're, um, I was unaware of that, but like I said, I'd love to continue this discussion. Any other questions? Thank you, Mr. Hassan. Mary Luke is the next speaker. Good evening. Thank you so much for this opportunity to speak before the Commission um, on the City Charter Revision. My name is Mary Luke, and I am with the New York City for CEDAW Act and the Metropolitan New York Chapter of UN Women. Our mission is to expand the participation of women in government in all sorts of, in all walks of life, in economic development, access to education, and ensure the safety and protection of women. Women's empowerment, equal opportunity for women has been my life's work, both in the U.S. and globally. And I have to say, I've worked in about 35 countries, and I've seen how women and girls especially suffer because they don't have the same opportunities for education, for health care. They're tortured, raped. I mean, it is incredible what women go through in different countries. Here, I've been in New York for four years, and I thought that things were different. But I am so surprised and disheartened Social Services knows all about it, that women in New York also suffer from discrimination and injustices. Um, here in our own city, women, heads of households especially, remain disproportionately affected by poverty. Black women have children earlier than other women, so they're premature, and they have higher death rates due to childbirth. Uh, children who live in different parts of New York and different neighborhoods have different access to education, which definitely disproportionately affects girls. Women earn significantly less than men, especially black and Latina women. And New York City has higher rates of sexual abuse and violence against women. And women, in this case, includes <coughs> trans women, gender nonconforming, LGBT. So there are major problems that affect women in this city. Women in New York City need equal rights, human rights, and protection from discrimination and violence. We so appreciate Councilwoman uh, Helen Rosenthal's earlier suggestion to put CEDAW into the revised city charter. What would that do? That would protect women from all forms of discrimination, promote gender equity, defining gender discrimination, gender discrimination which really recognizes all women. Women's lives are affected by the policies and programs in the cities, and women's voices must be heard. So I have just three quick recommendations in addition to Quickly. putting uh, CEDAW as a Bill of Rights for women, um, that women's voices need to be included in pan the planning and evaluation of programs with gender disaggregated data, that gender uh, responsive budgeting must be included as <coughs> part of the budgeting process, and that there must be gender parity in the appointments of commissions and boards. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Are there any questions for Ms. Luke? Thank you very much, Ms. Luke. The next speaker is Alicia Boyd. Oh, 
No, it's, okay. Hi, my name is Alicia Boyd, and I represent the movement to protect the people, flack flower lovers against corruption, and ban the anti-gentrification network. As you can hear by those acronyms, I'm very much a warrior in my community, and I am part of a grassroots movement in my community to protect us from real estate developers and rezonings and the Yola process. However, what I wanted to talk about today is sitting here in Manhattan, I come from Brooklyn, you know, we all talking about the Yola process and how a lot of development people want to go through the process of the Yola Yula process because then here comes your elected officials and here comes, you know, the voices in the community. But right here in Brooklyn, we have a Yola process and yet our voices are completely disemboweled. Our elected officials do not show up at our meetings. They do not meet with us. We have a community board that does not have a district manager and hasn't had one for three years. We had, for two years, we had a real estate lobbyist that was being lobbied by the real estate industry. We filed seven lawsuits against the community board. One was just to get the bylaws. The other one was so that we could be notified of meetings. And you know what? When we went to the courts, the court counsel said that community boards do not have to abide by the open meetings law. So we did some research. In 1989, the city charter commission said, no, that's not true. There should be sunshine on the committees. And we produced that in the court of law. But then we found out that Corp Council actually has an opinion that says that they should abide by the open meetings law. But guess what? My community board does not abide by the open meetings law. Seven lawsuits. Two are now on appeal. Four were upheld. One we let go of. This is my community board in Brooklyn. Because you know why? Because we're a community of color. So we are really at a disadvantage just being a community of color. So when we talk about community boards, when you're talking about white affluent community boards, a lot of them that spoke here today, they're all talking about, oh yes, we want the Euler process. We don't want anything of the Euler process. We don't want a Euler process at all. You know why? Because once we give a request to the Department of City Planning, they take any recommendation that we have and they put it in the garbage. Five rezonings and five communities of color Every community board said no to those rezonings, and now there's massive displacements. Four years ago, we were supposed to be rezoned. We stopped the rezoning by screaming and hollering and protesting and getting arrested, the things that we're supposed to do. But we were supposed to be modeled after East New York. East New York now has the highest rate of development in Brooklyn and a massive amount of displacement. So when we're talking about the Euler process, we need to be talking about how is the Euler process going to actually empower communities of color? Where does that happen? And one of the ways it can happen is by the enforcement of the city charter. Maybe the city charter should have it within their law that community boards have to, must, abide by the open meetings law. That one simple sentence that way when I go to court and I put it up in front of the judge and I put it up in front of court counsel, it's right there in the charter. But you don't have that in the charter. Put that in the charter. Let us hold our community boards accountable to the laws that currently exist on the books by enforcing and also possibly penalizing them. Why should my community be without a district manager for three years? Going on four. Why? Also, we're not getting our services because we don't have a district manager. They're getting $200,000 every year, and they're sending back 100000 every year because we don't have a district manager. Who's, who's overseeing that? Who's, who's watching that? Who's making sure that that doesn't happen? No oversight of community boards and community boards in color. So what we're asking is that there'll be something within the city charter that demands that community boards have to follow the rules and regulations and that there'll be a statement. Please put a statement in. Community boards must abide by the open meetings law. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. May I ask you a question? Yes. Um, two things, actually. One, the borough president has the role of, of, of both appointing people to the community boards and uh, oversight of the community board. And um, do you think that role has been appropriate? 
Well, we had we took our borough president, Eric Adams, to court, and is now on the appeals because he violated the city charter because he wanted to control the community board. So instead of having his 50% share, he put 75% shares right there in writing. So yeah, our community board continues to be infiltrated by real estate industry because it's my borough president's position that we should build, baby, build, his exact quotes. And so having one person who's responsible for putting people on the board, keeps all of that power in his hands. So if it's his, I mean, you're, you're, you're very lucky. You have Gail Bruna. We have borough president, borough, you know, Eric Adams. So depending upon the borough president's position, then that then determines who gets onto the board, and then that determines how the board then reacts to the community. And I can well, tell you, we are a star model for... The, um Council members are also electing or... No, they do not elect. They, they recommend. propose members mm -hmm. to the board. Mm -hmm. And have you had a different experience with those members? I will give you an example. There was one woman who was on our community board. She was fighting for us. She was the vice, she was the vice chair. She was really trying to eradicate a lot of the corruption that she was seeing. She was recommended by our Eugene Matthew not the best council person, but he recommended her. And then when she was pushing back and demanding that there's some accountability, Eric Adams removed her. Councilman Eugene said, no, I want her on there. She got removed because she had the nerve to open up and say, this board has to behave correctly. They have to listen to the community. They cannot violate the law. She was gone. Th this is my board. You got to come visit us sometime. How do you know that I haven't? <laughs> well, we normally, yes. Well, we, yeah. we are really a notorious board. Um, and, and last but not least, um, do you believe that the proposal that is going to be before you on this ballot this year um, to have term limits for members of the community board would be helpful to your situation or it won't matter? It, in our case, it will not matter. Okay. And, and, and okay. I just, can I just say just one thing about that? As long as you allow one person to continue to choose the people on the board, you will never get diversity. Mm. Okay. By allowing possibly the council people to appoint, not just recommend, at least you are guaranteed to, to put a little diversity in there. But as long as one person makes that control, whatever that person wants, that person gets. Okay, thank you very much. Are there other questions? Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Boyd. Um, Kyle Bragg. Oh, okay. Uh, good morning, I mean, excuse me, Commissioner. <laughs> Good evening, Commissioner <laughs> Chair Benjamin and <laughs> Commission members. My name is Kyle Bragg. I'm the Secretary Treasurer of SAIU 32BJ. On behalf of 85,000 members in the city, thank you for holding these hearings and for giving our, your time and expertise to this important process. Colleagues of mine appeared at earlier sessions you held in Bro Bronx and Brooklyn to discuss how the city charter can be amended to ensure the city's land use and procurement policies help to create good jobs and strong communities. These issues are further addressed in written testimony submitted to the commission. Rather than expand upon these proposals, I instead use my time to emphasize my creation of good jobs should be a key priority of the commission's work. The city has done much in recent years to combat poverty, successfully lowering the percentage of New Yorkers experience economic hardship to below pre-financial crisis levels. However, Far too many New York is still struggling in the city with one of the nation's highest cost of living and rents that have soared at rates far outpacing wages. The facts show that in New York City, neither having an education or holding down a job are safeguards from experiencing poverty. High school and college graduates in New York are both more likely than their peers nationally to be living in poverty. While one in three poor New Yorkers above 16 years of age are employed, alarmingly, these figures come at a time when the city's unemployment rate is at its lowest point on record. We simply cannot trust that the jobs that the market creates 
will be sufficient to support a life of dignity and hope that all New Yorkers deserve. We must look broadly at the forces that drive down wages to poverty levels and ask ourselves whether we are using all the options available to provide a counterbalance. The, prop, the, prop, the property service industry in which our members work is a prime example of where such forces can persist. When used, low bid contractors for security, janitorial, and other building service work encourages a race to the bottom in labor standards that suppresses wages and deters any benefits from being offered. Fortunately, it is also an example, as our submissions descri describes, of an industry in which the city can effectively intervene to support quality jobs through fair and more accountable procurement and land use policies. This city char charter establishes the framework for both of these domains and should be amended to ensure that quality job standards are required when public dollars are being spent and the city land is being disposed of, as well as being central priority in all land use decisions. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify here this evening. On behalf of the union members and leadership, I offer the commission our fullest commitment to further engage on these issues. If you have any questions about the specifics or proposals, I am happy to take questions or follow up with further details. Thank you very much. Great timing. Um, thank you, Mr. Bragg. Are there any questions? Thank you very much. And the last speaker on this panel is Ed Herzog. Herzog. Thank you, uh, Chair Chairwoman Benjamin and the commissioners uh, for the opportunity to speak tonight. Uh, my name is Ed Hartzog. I am the co-chair of the Housing Committee on Community Board 8. I am here in my own personal capacity while I do support the previous testimony of my fellow board members and my chair. Um, I come here tonight uh, as someone who has spent a great deal of time in government uh, to give away my age when I was 14 years old. I remember as a Senate page watching John Tower and Hubert Humphrey walk arm in arm off the Senate floor. We are not sadly at that point now and I'm very concerned for not to sound Pollyannish because I have a great deal of salt having been in politics and around it for most of my life, but I am very concerned and I'm very happy to be here in front of this commission because uh, as someone with a long background in this area, I can tell you right now um, and listening to my panelists and others before us, uh, the perception in New York City is the fix is in. Mm. The fix is in. And, I, and the place where I also work as an attorney and I work as an election attorney, the place where I sometimes work across the street, above the doorway, it says, the true administration of justice is the firmest pillar of good government. And when the fix is in, and when people believe that the fix is in, government goes by the way, and people no longer listen to their leaders, and they take matters into their own hands, and that is not a good idea. So the suggestions I have for you tonight, and I will go very quickly, and will allow you to question me about them, are in that vein, one, in terms of selection of community boards, Gail Brewer, Scott Stringer, who initially put me on this board and continue to put me on Community Board 8, have, I believe, the gold standard for selection of community board members. It is a double-blind process. I also believe that all community board members should not be subjected to, as I hear recently, litmus tests by their council members, i.e., will you vote this way, will you vote that way? Mm. We don't do that for Supreme Court nominees. We shouldn't do it for community board members. Second. I also believe that we should no longer have the idea of term limits. We should not have term limits in any way, shape, or form. However, uh, and I can tell you, the turnover on Community Board 8 within the last eight years is 56%. So it's, the idea of term limits is a solution in search of a problem. It's not a problem, in my personal opinion. I do believe, though, that we might institute something that we have, which is term limits for our officers. That kind of turnover at the top, I think, is a good idea. Third, as co-chair of the Housing Committee, I would like, I, it's a wish list of mine, it's subpoena power for us to get lawyers back in front of us for affordable housing applications. I hear it all the time. We cannot get lawyers to come back in front of us. They do not adhere to Rule 3.3 of Part 1200 of the Rules of Professional Responsibility. There is nothing that uh, makes them come back, and they change their applications all the time. As you heard the previous panel talk about the 275-foot building that turned into 775 feet, it's all the time. If you allow me to just finish, I'll go very quickly. Second, the BSA, I would suggest that the BSA be allowed to have additional members appointed by the borough president, and those would be community board chairs, okay? Fifth, 
uh, I also think that uh, in terms of uh, campaign, we should have resources for our locations. It is a conflict of interest in our community board. I only speak personally. We have large institutions. We are walking around begging for space. We then hear applications from the very same institutions and players who we then decide on. So they could say, uh, theoretically, hey, you didn't rule so great on us, we're not gonna give you any space. It, it sets up an inherent conflict. Uh, we should be given the kinds of resources and places for community boards to go and have these hearings. A central location in the community district so people can come on a regular basis. I also would suggest, in terms of campaign finance, that city council members be precluded from soliciting donations from community board members. On its face, it just looks terrible. And I have heard from many people all around the city that there is just a sense that if I do not give to the city council member that I might not get appointed. And I'm sure, and I'm not saying anybody is doing that. All I'm saying is the appearance and the thought is there and it does not look good and it only seeks to perpetuate the idea that the fix is in. I know we're done. Thank you, Mr. Herzog. Hartzog. Okay. Are there any questions? Mr. Fiala? Mr. Hartzog, thank you very much for your testimony and your service. I uh, thank all of the panelists. Um, I'm, in, I'm interested, did I hear you right? Uh, yeah, I, I'm, one of my issues is, is trying to find a way to enhance the role of the borough president, which was eviscerated, but not undermine the checks and balances that the 89 charter put in place by making a mayoral council, you know, check and balance system. You, you suggested adding, increasing the membership of the Board of Standards and Appeals? Well, but did I hear it right? Did you I, say that there are a point that, that, A, did I hear that right, and B, was your vision that they would appoint from among the ranks of community board chairs? So they would get one appointment each, but they would have to pick someone from the community board chairs on, in their borough? Yes, Commissioner, okay. uh, and, and however the Commission would view uh, treating the BSA, I, I don't want to uh, impose an idea on that, but if I may, just if you would indulge me, uh, we had a case uh, when I first got on the board uh, of an application from a large institution. Um, they win all the time in our neighborhood, and for once, uh, they lost. It was an enormous fight. We created a separate task force just for this notion because 300 people showed up at a community board member from an affected building. I happen to take notice when 300 people show up at a community board member, uh, a community board meeting. Um, we voted down the proposal uh, at the community board. The institution lost. I can't remember them ever losing ever. I think it was the first time ever they lost. Um, we voted to disapprove the application. We, someone then raised the issue of, well, let's now, um, we didn't disapprove it, we didn't vote for it, uh, I should say. So the motion was to approve, we voted it down. Someone then said, well, let's have a motion now to disapprove. And then people said, well, we've been fighting over this and there's no need for that, et cetera, et cetera. I was new, didn't realize that we actually needed to do that. Because when I got down to the BSA, counsel for the BSA looked me in the eye and said, well, counselor, you know, um, you didn't disapprove it. You just didn't approve it, so it's approved. <laughs> now, the thing is, the mayor appoints all those members, so whether you want to take some of those people off and put two members on, uh, that's something else. But yes, my idea was that the borough president, each of them, would pick from among the chairs of the particular boroughs, uh, bor a community board. So in uh, Manhattan, we have 12. So of the 12 chairs that currently exist, uh, Borough President Brewer would pick one of those 12 to serve, and I haven't teased, thought this through in terms of how long, but she would pick one of the 12, as would uh, the, each of the borough presidents, pick one of the uh, chairs to serve for a period of time that you may deem uh, appropriate. But I think it at least gives people the idea that their voices will be heard. Thank you. Are there other questions? I thank you, this panel. And the next panel, uh, Hal Phillips. Is Mr. Phillips here? Eleanor T. Fine. Julia Durante Martinez. 
Andy Morrison. Are you here, Mr. Morrison? Is that you? Okay. Emily Goldstein. Paula Crespo. Matt. No last name, Matt. Melissa Ayakan. Are you here, Melissa? Derek Miles. Judith Lustgarden. You're here, Judith? That. Um, is Julia Duranti Martinez here? Okay. Uh, Andy Morrison is here. Emily Goldstein is here. Paula Crespo. Yep. And Judith Lustgarden. We have one more seat, and the lucky winner is Grace Ramsey. Michelle Campo. I thought we already had her. It's possible. Martha Cowber. Martha. From the YWCA. From the YWCA. Howard Katzman. Great. Um, and we will start with Ms. Duranti Martinez. Uh, good evening, Chair Benjamin and commissioners, and thank you for the opportunity to testify. My name is you Julia. You need to pull the microphone closer. My name is Julia Duranti Martinez, and I work at New Economy Project. I'm here tonight testifying on behalf of the New York City Community Land Initiative, NICELY which is an alliance of community-based building, affordable housing, and economic justice groups, as well as longstanding and emerging community land trusts across New York City. Our recommendations for revisions to the city charter are as follows. Um, the first one is to include a right to housing in the city charter, and the second is to prioritize public benefit and community control in disposing of property, which we heard a bit about earlier. To the first point, New York City's residents urgently need a right to housing provision in the city charter. The city is currently subject to a right to shelter mandate deriving from the New York State Constitution's mandate uh, for the aid, care, and support of the needy are public concerns and shall be provided by the state. In response, the city has created one of the most extensive emergency shelter programs in the nation, which is an essential safety net for thousands of vulnerable New Yorkers. But without an accompanying right to housing, the right to shelter mandate has resulted in a shelter system that has grown at an unprecedented rate. As housing costs have risen faster than incomes, and as gentrification citywide has led to the displacement of thousands of New York City households. A parallel right to housing mandate in the city charter would help to reverse this dynamic by requiring the city to produce new and preserve existing housing that adequately meets the needs of our existing population. Universal access to housing guaranteed by the city must also include allotting a significant share of new housing on the market to those most at risk of displacement and homelessness. And on a practical level, the current state of affairs has led the city to allocate more than $1.8 billion to its growing shelter system, with about $1 billion of that coming directly from the city's expense funds. This amounts to just over half of the city's total capital spending on housing this year, and many times more than what is invested in housing for those of extremely low income, i.e. those at most at risk of displacement and homelessness. So a right to housing framework would also enable the city to fulfill the New York State Constitution's requirement to provide aid, care, and support of the needy. Whether or not someone has housing determines many other issues, including health outcomes, health outcomes 
educational attainment, the ability to secure and maintain employment, and the ability to live in safety and free from violence. By failing to provide a right to housing, we ensure the perpetuation of a shelter system that destabilizes families, disrupts jobs and education, exacerbates medical and mental health issues, and otherwise increases New Yorkers' precarity. And then to the second point of prioritizing public benefit and community control in disposing of property, um, presently the city, the city charter requires that the city-owned property be leased or sold to the highest bidder with key exceptions and nicely believes that public benefit should prevail over profit when it comes to disposition of public assets and that the city should be required to consider housing needs and the needs for other public facilities in all property disposition. And I'll end it there since we already heard about that. Thank you again. Thank you very much, Ms. Durante Martinez. Are there questions? Yes, I have a question from Mr. Nuri. Mm -hmm. I have a six-part question. Oh, well, okay, I'll see what I can do. So can you describe what a right to housing would look like uh, from a kind of policy perspective? Does that mean more public housing? Does it mean banning evictions as they've done in, in certain cities around the world? What would it look like? I think it looks like all of the possible tools that we have to address the housing crisis. Nicely in particular is especially focused on community land trusts as a promising tool to address the housing crisis and that are currently underutilized in New York, especially given that they do enshrine long-term community control over housing um, and a participatory governance structure. So I think that is one way to think about a right to housing um, that Nicely has done a lot of work on. Work on. Um, but it's definitely a conversation that we look forward to continuing um, as this charter provision, the revision process advances. Thank you. Reverend Miller. Thanks again for your testimony. It seems like, well, factually, the city has gotten out of the housing business, and it seems like the city has depended on developers to provide affordable housing, which again, is not always affordable. And these mixtures, 80% market rate, 20% uh, affordable. Mm -hmm. Do you think your proposal submits the possibility of the city actually getting back in the housing business? Um, I, I believe that deep, deep affordability is what Nicely and Nicely members are looking for. And I think that is hard to do without robust public support. Thank you very much. The next speaker is Andy Morrison. Oops, uh-oh. <laughs> um, good evening, Chair Benjamin, members of the commission. Thanks for holding this hearing. I'm Andy Morrison. I'm campaigns director, also at New Economy Project. Um, we're an organization that works with community groups across the city to build a just economy based on cooperation, equity, racial justice, and ecological sustainability. And I'm pleased to be here on behalf of Public Bank NYC which is a broad-based coalition of community, civil rights, racial and economic justice groups that are fighting for the creation of a public bank chartered to serve the public interest, accountable to New Yorkers, and rooted in principles of racial and economic justice. We all know that 10 years ago, Wall Street banks brought down our economy, wiping out trillions in household wealth um, and millions of jobs, and the losses were disproportionately devastating for people in communities of color. And those reverberations are still being felt in communities throughout our city. And yet today, the big banks are bigger uh, than ever and more profitable than ever. Meanwhile, countless low-income New Yorkers, New Yorkers of color, immigrants, seniors, women across the city are struggling to get by. And with the Trump administration's dangerous gutting of regulations and corporate tax giveaways, we need bold local action to strengthen our local economy and advance truly uh, a truly progressive New York. Municipal banking, a people's bank for New York City, is a way to pursue that together. There's a wave of support for public banking across uh, the country, and New York should lead the way. Now, every year, the city moves tens of billions of public dollars through Wall Street banks that are routinely extracting wealth from communities and exploiting people in our city. Through the public bank, we can divest from those banks that, by the way, are also financing fossil fuel extraction, speculative real estate, private prisons, and so much more. And we can also leverage our own money to support 
critical needs in communities. We can make equitable investments that support low and extremely low income housing, union and living wage jobs, democratically controlled clean energy. Uh, we can foster community wealth building and neighborhood led development, including community land trusts, worker co-ops. We can expand high quality affordable financial services by having the bank partner with community development credit unions that are in the business of serving communities that the Wall Street banks are redlining in our, in our city. And we can also promote transparency and accountability in municipal finance by providing comprehensive non-extractive banking services to the city um, and also affordable municipal financing options. So our coalition urges the commission to consider amendments to the charter that will increase the transparency and public accountability we need in our municipal finance system, to strengthen standards for the financial institutions with which the city does business, and to remove any barriers uh, that you find that would prevent the city from creating a bank um, and so we've identified a lot of those areas within the charter, which we're happy to discuss with um, the commission as the process goes forward. And we really um, hope we can work together with you uh, to realize this together. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Um, can you tell me what would prevent the, a public bank from bidding for the city's financial business? Well, the, I mean, presumably um, the city would create the bank, so it would be owned and controlled um, by the city. So there, there wouldn't be anything to prevent the city from um, creating a bank that would be um, like baked into its mission. It would right, but wouldn't it have to be licensed and under the state banking yes. law, et cetera? Yes. So it wouldn't be part of the city corporation. It would be a separate corporation that it, it could be a local it could be state. a local development corporation for example that but the city would through whether it's through legislation or through the charter revision process would would establish the bank Carl yes I have two questions first um, I know that the uh, uh, notion of a, a public bank municipal bank is uh, being explored in many places is there any major municipality that's actually established one? There's the uh, Bank of North Dakota, which has actually been around for 99 years. And um, it's been very successful. Um, in fact, it withstood the financial crash better than the Wall Street banks did. Um, so that's, there is a precedent for it. But, but the current movement to create municipal public banks um, which many cities I know are looking at, um, but no major city has yet established one. So. No, no, none of the cities that have. But and, I mean, and then most of the campaigns are nascent, though. I'm sorry. A lot of the campaigns are nascent campaigns. And the, just to follow up on uh, the chair's question, what what would uh, it would have to go through the standard practice of getting licensed and the like, but what? What would what in the charter currently pr would prevent the city from doing this? There's Since it establishes local development corporations all the time, EDC is a local development corporation. Right. We don't we don't think there's anything incompatible with creating a public bank in the charter, in state law, or the state constitution. So so in order to establish a public bank, we wouldn't have to amend the charter in any way. Well, well, you could create the, I mean, you could actually create a bank in the charter, um, but you could also, like, there's, there, there are some provisions um, within sections 1523 and sections 1524, um, which we could talk about in more detail if you'd like, but there are um, some provisions that could be um, amended to, um, reduce some of the potential impediments. There's nothing, there's nothing that we couldn't overcome. Like for example, there's a provision um, that says that no amount shall, this is, gets really technical. If you thought procurement was um, technical, well, this mean, gets very technical, but I'll tell you, no amount shall be on deposit at any one time in any one bank exceeding one half the amount of the capital and net surplus of the bank, that's section 1523. Um, and so that's one example of something that could be amended to um, make make the charter more amenable to a public bank. Well, do you mind, Carl? No, go ahead. 
Would it have to be all or nothing? It does not have to be all or nothing. Thank you. Back to you, Carl. No, I, th I think you Anyone else? answered my question. Thank you, Mr. Morrison. Next we have Ms. Goldstein, Emily Goldstein. Hi. Thank you. Good evening. Thanks for the opportunity to test night, really. Good night. <laughs> Thanks for the opportunity to testify. My name is Emily Goldstein, and I'm the Director of Organizing and Advocacy at the Association for Neighborhood and Housing Development, or ANHD. ANHD is a coalition of community organizations throughout New York City working to ensure the right to affordable housing and thriving equitable neighborhoods for all New Yorkers. We and our members are excited about the opportunity this commission provides to fundamentally reassess aspects of how our city is operating, particularly with regards to both land use and the equitable distribution of resources as well as burdens in neighborhoods throughout the city. I'll be submitting full, longer testimony uh, through your online mechanism, so uh, I'll just briefly highlight five principles that we hope the commission will consider as it reviews the various recommendations it's hearing. The first is fair distribution of resources and development. One of the dynamics that often plays out in the context of rezoning fights we've seen recently is not actually about zoning itself or about the use of land, but about investment and resources that have in many cases been uh, not seen in low-income neighborhoods for decades. Um, actually having a process that required that communities, um, sorry, requiring that resources be distributed more equitably and that uh, low-income community, communities' needs were met outside of any form of a land use process would mean that all communities are bargaining from a, or, or addressing land use needs that are actually about land use and from a more equal playing field. The reality is, as it stands now, uh, added density is often happening in areas where vulnerable residents are concerned, rightfully so, about displacement, and they're accepting that density because it seems like the only way to negotiate for other needs that have been left unmet. That's not the dynamic that should be happening in our planning and land use, in our land use processes. I'll go quicker. Second principle is enforceable commitments. This again relates to the fact that a lot of what community residents are thinking about and concerned about with relation to rezoning processes is not actual zoning, but everything else that comes with it. Unfortunately, many of the rest of the package, as it were, that often happens in rezoning agreements is not as binding or as enforceable as the land use changes themselves. If you change from R6 to R7, it's R7. If a community is promised park upgrades, they may or may not get those park upgrades. And communities and local community organizations are pouring enormous amounts of effort and resources into trying to make sure that these commitments that were supposed to be part of a package actually get met. So looking at ways to make the entire package genuinely binding and have it happen sort of upfront and in a fair way, I think would go a long way to changing the dynamics of these arguments. 10 seconds. Ten I won't seconds. speak as much about the other issues because my coworker spoke about them, but our three other principles are integration without displacement, really looking at where density is being added, where affordability is being addressed, where residents are at risk of displacement, and where uh, additional affordable housing could be created in higher income neighborhoods. Transparency and accountability in the land use process, and finally, real community power and ownership. Thank you very much, Ms. Goldstein. Are there any questions? Thank you. Our next speaker is Paula Crespo from Pratt. Good night. Um, thank you for the opportunity to testify. For decades, the Pratt Center for Community Development has worked with community-based organizations and low-income communities of color to plan for and realize their futures. One of the key ways that cities adapt to the array of changes and challenges that they face is through their planning processes, and that's why this commission's charge is so important. Our currently disconnected planning and land use review systems are not meeting the need to overcome the legacy of racist planning policy and to create affordable housing, quality jobs, equitable access to uh, parks and schools, and infrastructure for sustainability. The land use review process has become one of the few places where unaddressed planning needs can be publicly debated. But if and when communities are equipped to engage, 
their concerns are often dismissed as out of scope. Other meaningful avenues for addressing these concerns don't currently exist, frustrating those trying to make positive neighborhood change and address the underlying causes of inequality. At the same time, more powerful reactionary actors stymie progress towards citywide goals and increase neighborhood uh, inequity. In particular, as Emily just alluded to, the city's long-term infrastructure needs cannot be met through neighborhood investments that are tied to new housing density, but not tied to pre-existing neighborhood needs, many of which are the result of historic disinvestment in low-income communities of color. A comprehensive planning framework can play an essential role to address these challenges and these failings. Lessons that have been critical to other cities' successful use of comprehensive planning include merging environmental concerns with land use recommendations, using community plans as building blocks for a larger citywide framework, and using the plan to build accountability and transparency into every decision and expenditure made during implementation. There are two issues um, that I'll provide as examples that comprehensive planning could help address. The first one is residential displacement, which is rampant, but there is no official measure of risk across the city, and the current methods for pro uh, projecting risk in the context of new development are egregiously flawed. We discussed this and the need for corresponding policies in our recent report called Flawed Findings, and I'm submitting this um, to the commission as an attachment to this testimony. The other issue that comprehensive planning could could uh, make a lot of progress on is fair share. The promise of fair share is falling far short of protecting disproportionately burdened communities from new threats to health and safety. Modern data tools and transparent reporting are necessary, as are updated criteria. The City Planning Commission should use heightened review to prevent unfair siting in over-concentrated neighborhoods. These are just two ways that comprehensive planning could integrate our systems and set goals towards a more equitable city. Meaningful public participation should be at the heart of any planning process, and we need to advance the participation of low-income communities of color. Pratt Center looks forward to working with the members and staff of the commission and with community members. We're available for follow-up to elaborate and collaborate on the themes I've touched on. Thanks. Thank you very much, Ms. Crespo. Are there any questions? Yeah. Sal? Just, uh, um, you're connected to Pratt Institute, I would assume, right? Uh, yeah, we are a nonprofit uh, located at Pratt Institute. Uh, we're you, not the same. You're connected? To we're, we're connected. Good. Well, you know, there's a lot of expertise there. So you, you said you're willing to help the uh, commission with more in-depth uh, ideas in these proposals, mm -hmm. drill down on them? Yes. Staff take note, and uh, certainly it's, it's a great, uh, we can use that resource. Uh, great. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Thank you very much, Ms. Crespo. Uh, Judith Lustgarden. Yes, hello. Um, I thought that it uh, was past my bedtime when I was the last to speak in Brooklyn, but oh my God, <laughs> I can barely think straight right now, but I've got my notes this time. Um, DOH, Department of Health, ACC. Accountability, transparency, there is none. Uh, there are agencies for everything, and I just, I think there should be an agency for animals. There, uh, why not? It's, it's, a business, an enormous business, but it's a business like every other business, yet it's never been acknowledged as such with blind eyes and deaf ears to this business, um, as well as to the advocates for decades. Um, the DOH, the business needs to be spun out of the DOH and an animal welfare department created with the proper qualified professionals in place because it's like the wild, wild west, no regulations. Um, the DOH is not the proper department. Uh, they're not qualified to oversee these animals. They have no know-how to be involved with the animal care. Here it's run by the Department of Health, yet the place is riddled with disease, and it's never been dealt with for, for decades. Um, the only thing the DOH has concerns on is 
are, are human concerns. Uh, if, if an animal catches something that's contagious to humans, well, then they'll take action. But they're not focused on any real concern for animal welfare. Um, please, let's create <laughs> a, a department that cares about them with the right people. They're just not a disposable commodity. They give us such great pleasure and yet we just don't think about them. And these animals come in looking so wonderful. They, they're healthy. They get so very sick within, uh, if I could show, I'll show you pictures. I'll send them to you. One look will be worth a thousand of my words. And the adopters and rescuers, of course, are spending thousands of dollars uh, because the animals are so sick and they don't want to pull anymore because they can't afford it. Um, the bills are enormous. Um, you've got the ASPCA who's got a reserve fund of two, $225 million. They're doing spay neuter surgeries subsidi with subsidized monies. They're sending these poor things back to ACC where their immune system is down and they're just getting sick and they are killed within days, sometimes the following day. I know I mentioned that before. Um, DOH does no enforcement. Uh, they have a contractual agreement to oversee the health conditions, but they don't enforce it. They kill an animal for kennel cough, um, so easily treatable with some antibiotics. It goes untreated. It turns into pneumonia and worse. Um, it, it, it's bad. It's very, very bad. Um, oh, God. Um, let's see. There is legislation. I gave that to you. It's passing one by one across the country. It's called the CAPA bill, the Companion Animal Protection Act. It's terrific. And bring in the professionals because they're willing to come and they would like to speak to all of us in New York. Um, you know, there's just no reason in the world that it should continue as it is. It can be great if it's run responsibly and ethically with integrity to these animals. The whole setup here in New York needs to be changed, and it, it's already been proven. And if we know it can be better, and it's proven it can be better, then it must be better. There's just no other correct and moral choice. We can Ms. implement Lusgarden. a wonderful system. <laughs> I remember that last time. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. Uh, <laughs> implement wonderful systems and programs and eliminate those that are working there now. Um, it's going to be the biggest social movement of our times. I have absolutely no doubt, and it's growing in droves, and it's time for a new regime of wisdom, moral and ethical integrity, responsibility, humanity, compassion, and justice for every animal who's unfortunate enough to have to walk through shelter doors. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Are there any questions? You know, I could say a whole bunch more. <laughs> Thank you very much. And the last speaker in this panel is Howard Katzman. Uh, good evening. I wish to, <laughs> it's almost morning, I guess, but I wish to thank the distinguished chair and commissioners for overseeing a process that allows citizens and residents of New York City to have a say in the governance of our city and for their appreciated persistence. My name is Howard Katzman. I represent policy and strategy on the steering committee for New York City for CEDAR Act. New York City for CEDAR Act is a grassroots coalition of over 300 organizations working for a Women's Bill of Rights in New York City. I'm here to speak about our effort to embed a human rights approach to gender into New York City's charter. I've spent the day riveted to the drama coming out of Washington, and I can only conclude that we do not listen or consider the needs of women in the same ways we consider the needs of men. In January 2017, over 400,000 people marched in New York City protesting for women's rights. The next year, over 200,000 marched again. There's the Me Too movement, and then the, there are the convictions of prominent men. The ongoing theme is that women also need to be considered. New York City for CEDAR Act's proposal is that the New York City government must consider the effects on women when city programs are formulated and assessed, when city funding is appropriated and dispersed, whether New York City, as an employer, treats women equally as men. We often assume the impacts on women, unconsciously playing on our biases as to the roles of women. The name of our coalition incorporates CEDAW. 
CEDA is the Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, an international human rights treaty ratified by 189 countries. CEDA is an international consensus on discrimination against women. Its 16 articles and optional protocols offer a means of creating a comprehensive framework to assess discrimination against women. CEDAW is a document negotiated in the 1970s when there was an understanding of gender as a binary of men and women. We now have a fuller understanding of gender and we wish to ensure that a CEDAW framework incorporates gender as defined in New York City law, women and girls, transgender and nonconforming gender individuals. We've been asked how this relates to racial and other forms of discrimination. Gender discrimination is different from other forms of discrimination. Women represent over half the New York City population, but even more importantly, women are represented in virtually every household of New York City. Discrimination against women affects each of us New Yorkers. The most important people in my life are my wife, my daughter, my mother. I actively rebel against anything that stands in the way of my daughter fulfilling her complete potential. Race discrimination is different from gender discrimination. Identifying it is different, the solutions are different, but race is recognized in this proposal. We recognize that gender discrimination does not occur alone. Other forms of discrimination layer upon gender discrimination. Members of our coalition can better explore this issue. I wish to thank the commissioners for considering this proposal and incorporating a human rights framework in New York City's charter guided by the principles of CEDAW to identify gender discrimination and correct the structural problems that are identified. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Katzman. Are there questions? Thank you very much, panel. The next panel, um, Young Bao Gao, Darlene Jackson, Darlene, are you here? Yeah. Okay. Terry Kude, or Kud. Okay. Paul Epstein. Anna Rude Dinesh. Anna Rude Dinesh. And David Eisenbach. You've won the lottery, Mr. Eisenbach. David, yeah. Hey, <laughs> Sir, you are first. Thank you for the <coughs> for the opportunity, and the chairman and the honored commissioner. I just learned this uh, uh, meeting up, yesterday, <coughs> and I thought, oh, well, this is a public hearing, so I can probably participate. And I came in, and then I thought I learned that I could uh, speak, too. So I, <laughs> I'm here, and uh, <coughs> I also hear that, you know, a lot of people here talk about the, <coughs> the abuses, for example, police uh, abuses. And I think abuses of power exist in all those different branches, for example, in, in the court and also in the executive branch. Um, the best way to prevent such abuse occur, I think, is to hold those leaders, the head of those agents or divisions accountable. Uh, the best way to hold them accountable uh, is to lock the power into the iron cage of data. When I say iron cage, it means really need to be solid. That's and the data should not be, cannot be deleted. That means iron. All those, for example, at the court or at the police uh, department of a police officer, those data should be permanent. Uh, especially those important uh, document information. If you can keep those documents permanent, 
then you hold them accountable. Another one is the transparency. Those documents should be transparent. People could see it. When people make decisions that will affect other people's life, those decisions should be transparent and should be permanent. And then we can keep people accountable. <coughs> uh, in nowadays, technology you know, really can empower you know, uh, a lot of people. I just make some simple example. For example, at the, uh, I had my probably more than my fair share at the, of those exposed to those abuses. <coughs> Court, the decision, they, so gross abuses. For example, uh, one decision that was written, decision made on uh, last year on March 14. March 14, that we have a snowstorm. The court was closed. How could it be a written decision made on March 14? Well, that was certainly made before the hearing. Without hearing, the decision was already made. How could that happen? And more than that, <coughs> then this, the, the, the course, you know, the, the, the judge changed the date of the, of the order, law in order, four times. That's just crazy. And I think those things, those things should be put up permanently. And those judges, they made such decisions or willfully make, make those wrong, wrong decisions should be put up permanent and the people can see it. And they should Thank be punished. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Thank you, Mr. Gao. Uh, Ms. Jackson? Okay, sorry. Um, so good evening, my name is Darlene Jackson and I'm a part-time city employee at Manhattan Community Board 11 in East Harlem. I'm here today as a strong believer that local community boards can be the acting force to empower civic engagement throughout the five boroughs in New York City. That would take a serious overhaul and in investment, starting with increasing the budget sufficient enough to address and meet the needs of the board and the community at large. All 59 community boards need an independent consultant to provide oversight, as board members are community volunteers with other obligations outside of their two-year commitment and do not have the capacity to provide to provide day-to-day -day support. An independent consultant can establish the following that does not currently exist at Community Board 11 in Manhattan. A healthy and productive work environment, communication among employed staff, employee supervision, inclusive staff meetings to plan effectively, employee performance evaluations to promote professional growth and compensation to, I'm sorry, and compensation increases to guarantee a living wage, <coughs> professional development trainings and workshops. Um, one thing I added was an employee handbook organizational structure and evaluation with, um, towards mission statements and goals, procedures for grievances, and to hold them with integrity and urgency, and to hold the Equal Employment Opportunity Unit at the Borough President's offices accountable. This basic improvement would create accountability, transparency, and serve as a nonpartisan liaison between community boards and the Borough President's offices, which brings me to the idea of term limits, um, during an interview with the New York City Council for the Outreach Liaison position for the 2019 Charter Division, I was asked about my thoughts on term limits as a staff member working at a local community board. Um, and my response was that there are pros and cons. Uh, not all 59 community boards, 50 seats are filled, but with adequate investments towards robust outreach efforts for recruitment and, and advertisement can resolve that. Uh, board members attend, this is not audited, not only at the full board meetings, but not at, at the committee level as well. In addition, is not factored in during reappointment process, and not all staff members, which is liaison to committees, input are included. Nor does it provide an in-depth analysis to a board member's active participation and or contribution to the community board. All community board meetings are open to the public and should encourage community members from all levels of, of expertise to have a voice, a seat at the table, and part of the decision-making process, and board membership should not be 
determine or dictate participation. Uh, board president's training offered should be mandatory for all board members and offered in the, in the fall and in the spring. Attendance needs to be tracked via a database. Board members should be required to take a, a refresher every six months to provide them with the necessary tools and skills to advocate on the behalf of the com communities regarding land use, district needs, and budget priorities. I'm almost done. Term limits will eliminate a conflict of interest, corruption, and biased politics. For example, I have yet to receive feedback and or decision regarding my application for membership at my local community board nine in the Bronx from the BP's office and my council representative in District 18. And now all of these, all of these seats, are, seats are filled. Elected officials' agenda needs to solely operate around constituents' needs and establish a working coalition task force that meets regularly and hosts public meetings. It needs to be mandatory that all 51 New York City Council members have participatory budgeting in their com community district and work collaboratively with local community boards. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Are there any questions of Ms. Jackson? Thank you, Ms. Jackson. The next speaker is Terry Kud. Uh, still today. Uh, thank you for uh, the opportunity. You need to move the mic closer than you think you want it. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Um, I am Terry Coote. I am chair of Community Board 2 Manhattan. Uh, the testimony I'm presenting today was not voted on at our full board since these are initial suggestions. Uh, they were determined during our charter revision task force meeting, so they are preliminary to any official position. I'm going to just go through the overarching concepts that, that relate to community boards that we felt were very important. One, community board written resolutions shall be, should be respected as the official voice of the community and should be given full weight and consideration as such. Community board recommendations should be presumed as authoritative and shift the burden of proof to the opponent rather than always being on us. All agencies should include community boards in their review processes and should be mandated to seek input from any and all affected boards. Agencies should be required to improve coordination between and amongst themselves as well. Um, we believe term limits for board members should be opposed as they are contrary to the best interests of the community. We have a lot of very complicated issues that we deal with and it takes years for us to learn our jobs and then do it well. And then on to more specifics, land use review. Community board input is advisory but it should be recognized as an official voice of the neighborhood in which the land use action is contemplated. We have the meetings that happen in the community. People can access us, people can reach us. They can't always get down here. They can't, and once the train is, is leaving the station, right, once, once uh, at, at every step, the process becomes harder to change or divert. So what happens early on in the community board process is very important to get and to be, um, to be utilized as not just, oh, well, it's NIMBYs, yeah, they don't want a building, they don't want a school outside their door. That's actually not the case. We are very thoughtful and very careful. In addition, and for the charter, City Environmental Quality Review, Seeker is flawed. Each of the defined ca categories should be considered in the context of the aggregation of buildings and structures in the impacted area and not just in isolation, each one. Um, categories most often cited by communities uh, that were discussed in our deliberations are schools, the seat calculations are just, they're just not accurate for the city. People are staying. Uh, park requirements, uh, sewer waste, infrastructure, emergency preparedness, and public transportation. There's more, I'll email. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there questions? I just, uh, Terry, are you going to submit okay. that as, I know you spoke a little extemporaneously, but can you submit that as yes, well? She said she was going to email. Good. Okay. Or, or, <laughs> or use the website. Thank yes. you. Thank you. Are there others? Questions? Thank you, Ms. Kud. Our next speaker is Paul Epstein. Thank you. Uh, 
I've worked for two mayor's offices and consulted around the world. Please see my printed testimony with more of my bio and additional topics that I have addressed after the one I will talk about now. The city's land use process is broken, heavily tilted in favor of whatever City Hall wants and against local community interests. When a mayoral agency wants, to pr wants a project or neighborhood rezoning, they fully control the process and content. Once ULERF starts, mayoral agencies run out the clock and leave community-driven alternatives sidelined up to activists to try to get council members to negotiate bits of their plan into the final plan. And even when council, or really the local council member, wants to include part of a community alternative, another barrier can arise. Some or all of the changes may be ruled out of scope and not allowed. Just one example, last year the city council produced an excellent report, Planning for Retail Diversity, with recommendations that include store size re restrictions to preserve space for small businesses. Forget about that during the de Blasio administration, which hates the idea, because if in the rezoning process the lead agency doesn't include those restrictions, any attempt to add them through city planning or council changes will be ruled out of scope. No matter how much there is community support, those restrictions will always be out of scope if the lead agency does not propose them first. That's just one example. The land use process needs many fixes. I offer one to help level the playing field for the community. This would apply to any city proposed land use action and any privately proposed plan that covers more than, say, a minimum area of a square block, perhaps. The charter should enable alternative plans that garner enough community signatures to be recognized in the land use process for consideration by city planning and council. A signature deadline before the borough president's hearing will allow interested parties enough opportunity to review and comment on alternatives in the rest of the process. The number of signatures, I'll suggest 200, could be higher, should be set high enough to require sig significant volunteer effort, but not so high as to be very difficult without paying petitioners. Signatures should be acceptable from voting age people who reside in, own businesses in, or are employed within a half a mile of the initially proposed action. Then at city planning and council stages, modifications to the agencies or sponsors plan can include any component from a recognized alternative plan at that, and not be considered out of scope to, due to being more restrictive than existing zoning or initial proposal. I have more uh, things that I'll be addressing in written comments and in some comments that I su submitted in the written testimony that I given you now. If you want to ask questions about any of them, I'm here. <clears throat> Thank you for condensing your testimony. Um, and we appreciate that you'll be sending it to us either by email, which would be the best, or on our website. Are there any questions of Mr. Epstein? Seeing none, I thank you and look forward to seeing the rest of your testimony. Mr. Dinesh. Thank you, Chair Benjamin, and thank you to everyone on this commission for your service and for giving me the opportunity to testify tonight. My name is Anirudh Dinesh, and I'm an Associate Research Fellow at the Governance Lab. We're an action research organization based at NYU, and we focus our work on studying how to leverage new technologies as well as the collective wisdom of our communities to improve governance and make people's lives better. I'm here to testify in support of participatory law and policymaking that we call crowd law, and to urge this commission to include such innovative and participatory practices for lawmaking in its charter revision recommendations. Crowd law is a simple but powerful idea that parliaments, governments, and public institutions work better when they boost, bolster citizen engagement, leveraging new technologies to tap into the diverse sources of information, judgments, and expertise at each stage of the law and policy making cycle. Doing so improves the quality as well as the legitimacy of the resulting laws and policies. The GovLab's crowd law catalog documents over 100 examples of initiatives from around the world across the various stages of lawmaking, starting from identifying problems and suggesting solutions to co-drafting laws and evaluating policy outcomes. Decidem Barcelona, for example, is a platform that allows city residents to make proposals and comment and vote on other proposals for Barcelona's municipal action plan. Another example is Promise Tracker, a platform developed at MIT's Media Lab which is being used by the Comptroller General of the State of Pará in Brazil to engage school students in the process of tracking the outcomes of the school lunch policy. 
To further promote the value of participatory law and policymaking, the GovLab has led the movement to draft the Crowd Law Manifesto, a statement of 12 principles which articulates the importance of developing new ways to include more diverse opinions and expertise at every stage of the decision-making process at the local, regional, national, and international level. The manifesto has been signed by 136 individuals and over 60 institutions since its public launch just a week ago. On a final note, I also want to take a brief moment to thank Council Member Ben Kalos for his advocacy for the advancement of crowd law and giving New York City residents more voice in the legislative process. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you, Mr. Dinesh. Um, I know you have that. Would you be sending what you're reading from to us? Yes, I can send it to you by email. I also have copies of the manifesto. Oh, that would be great. Um, are there any questions of Mr. Dinesh? Thank you very much. We will certainly read that. Um, last but not least, I have David Eisenbach. I appreciate that. Uh, David Eisenbach, I teach history at Columbia, and I ran for public advocate in the uh, last year's Democratic primary. Um, it struck me tonight that so many of our problems uh, as a city get back to the fact that our democracy is broken. Uh, the Founding Fathers never intended for there to be a professional class of politicians uh, whose main focus is keeping their job or moving up the chain. Uh, not their defending their districts from bad rezoning plans and their boroughs from the same, right? But perpetuating their political power. And so I'm urging you to make reforms that open up the process and enable citizens to enter into the political process in New York City. Now, the, the mayor's plans to, to uh, reform the campaign finance uh, with the charter revision actually will inhibit non-politicians from entering the process. Uh, lowering the campaign donations actually, when you're collecting money from friends and family, you need those $4,000 checks just to get started. My campaign spent $57,000. Half of the, the money I raised came literally from my father, my mother, my sister, my wife, my brother-in-law. You know, that's how you have to get started in this process. You also need to lower the thresholds for the matching funds. The mayor's plan doesn't lower those thresholds, but it increases the amount of money you get if you hit the, the threshold. So that will actually make the rich uh, politicians even richer. So if you really want to um, reform the process, also require that any candidate that's on the ballot be included in the debate. We can't have the situation which we have right now where New York One gets to decide who gets to debate and who doesn't. And it's often based on how much money they've raised. Right? When you have a system where it's all about the money, how can you expect that they won't sell out the communities, that they won't allow towers to be built that cast shadows over gardens, and that you won't have communities like Inwood that are being rezoned and are losing their character? We're losing our city because we've lost our democracy, and so please, in your reforms, figure out a way to take our democracy back, open it up, and take it away from the money. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there questions? Thank you very much. And the next panel. Uh, Susan Lerner. Jerry Goldfeder. I didn't see Jerry. Oh, he left me. Okay, whoops, I dropped Susan. Um, Mr. Popoff. Um, Thomas Burton, Guy Guider, Mr. Guider, Liz Barry, step right up into the winner's circle, Leandra Requena, Leandra. 
Yeah, I think she's oh, right she? there. And um, Lo Vandervak. Okay. Ms. Lerner? Yes, thank you. And thanks to the Commission for your patience. And I want to commend you on doing something unusual, which is that you are taking people in the order in which they signed up. Normally, I would have been on the first panel as a, you know, an advocate, and I think it's absolutely appropriate that the public is intermixed, so thank you for that. Um, I'd like to summarize and get right to the chase. I'm going to say something which I think a lot of the good government community would disagree with. I urge you to be ruthless in committing triage and to focus on a very few essential issues, primarily land use, because I believe uh, and at Common Cause, we believe that a Charter Revision Commission, especially one that has a limited time, and actually a year is, frankly, not a huge amount of time when you are dealing with a document as complicated as the Charter, um, that you need to make some choices. There have been some intriguing ideas which have been suggested uh, just here in Manhattan, and I'm sure many other others in the other boroughs, but I would suggest to you that the most pressing issue that is facing the city that is the thorniest, the most difficult, which needs the most concern, um, hard work, and consensus building is land use. And I would suggest to you that that should be the primary charge of this commission. I think it's going to take all of your energy, all of your patience, and all of your wisdom and through the, a difficult process in the year to come up with uh, a workable reform for our land use process. Uh, so that is my primary um, suggestion to you. Uh, and another area which really we've heard uh, testimony about, which I think also is one that would be appropriate for a charter commission, is dealing with the problem of the civilian review board. That's not in my written testimony, but I have been impressed with the testimony. Um, we make some suggestions in, along the lines of uh, voting issues which might be appropriate for the Charter. And lastly, in my written comments, I talk about two areas which the earlier Mayor's Charter Revision Commission uh, identified as unfinished business. I frankly believe that those issues could be dealt with by the uh, Council, but we did draft uh, proposed revisions to the Charter, actual language for setting up an independent districting process, and we drafted proposed changes to the Charter that would set up a ranked choice voting system. And I will file those with uh, you through the website so that you see what we have suggested previously. But on the other good ideas that have been uh, introduced by other organizations, members of the public, I suggest you identify the ones that you think are intriguing and send them down to the council. Thank you. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? Uh, council member, no, you're not council member anymore. Um, Commissioner Faella. Thank you, Ms. Lerner. Thank you for your submission. Um, I, I think uh, two things. One, I'd appreciate it if uh, Common Cause could provide in supplemental material their thoughts on how to improve service delivery in the outer boroughs and whether or not there is an opportunity to strengthen the borough voice through the office of the borough president, right, without greatly diminishing the checks and balance that mm -hmm. system that we have in place. I think that is probably one of the most important things that could come out of this body's work is to address, we're going on 30 years almost, next year will be 30 years, and quite frankly, there's a disconnect between the ability of the city to deliver adequate services to the people of this city and what the charter suggests the city should be able to do through its office holders. So any insight that you could provide this Charter Revision Commission in that area would be greatly appreciated because this is 
at the heart of what <coughs> local government does, delivering municipal services. So I realize you want us to focus on those kind of big three areas, but it's a kind of a, a I've been dealing with this too now. I started this in the late 80s. I voted against the 89 charter precisely because we would be fearful, as were the Board of Aldermen in 1901 from Brooklyn, fearful that in a consolidated city, you would have a centralized government that over time would lose sight of the localities outside of the central area. So any guidance you all can provide, because I know you've all done great work in the past and have lots of thoughts on detailed proposals, that would be welcome. Thank you for Thank that you. suggestion, and we will, we will do our best uh, to provide you uh, with some suggestions. It may take a little time, but we will take it up. Thank you very much, Ms. Lerner. Are there any other questions? And then we'll hear from Nikolai Popov. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Nikolai Popov, and I want to apologize in the ways for my terrible accent and possible grammatical mistakes in my testimony. Uh, I'm a civic uh, activist and immigrant New Yorker. I am speaking here to support proposal made on previous hearings, and not only for myself, but from uh, behalf of the several organizations and groups that are organizing and advocating for at least 200,000 people uh, from 15 former Soviet countries, according to the census. Uh, as an immigrant who escaped from a uh, dictator regime in my own country, I want to focus my testimony on uh, one of the most important elements of democracy, representation. We're calling to amend section 18 of chapter one of the charter by replacing the bureaucratic office of immigrant affairs with representative commissions of immigrant community leaders under the mayor. This concerns immigrants of every ethnicity, race, sex, and background. Our city is nowadays 37% third born. It's an official numbers, and I'm sure everyone who lives in the city can say those numbers are much higher. Uh, let's not forget about those who was born here and by all, uh, by officially an American, by all the means are still immigrant. We need to have a voice in the city government. The current Office of the Immigrant Affairs does not provide representation on social or political aspects, or real economic opportunities, and it's not aware and uh, um, responsive what's what's happening within and among communities. Immigrant organizers and leaders are excluded from participation in the government, and it's bad for the city, for such city as New York is. The city which always been known for its diversity and liberal spirit. Many of communities possess important information the city needs. For example, immigrants from Russia know quite a bit about some of the super rich associates uh, associates of the Putin regime have been sp spreading their influence in the city by an upper real estate, uh, f uh, lending money and trying to buy up some politicians as well. Our community and organization know and understand a lot about those people and can provide some insights and useful information to the city through the such commission we propose. Especially it's important in uh, nowadays. Um, such commi commission already s exists in San Francisco, Portland, and Houston, and they uh, include immigrants. For example, San Francisco has an immigrant right commission which by law must ensure and provide that half of its members are immigrants. Um, we urge you to make sure that our city follows this best practice. Members of such commission should be appointed from among the candidates submitted by immigrant land and profit organization. Its compassion should be approximately proportional to the size of major immigrant communities, but no less uh, than one of the community of two, uh, 2,800 people or more. To be effective, independent, and fully committed, these commissioners must be uh, p salaried public employers. Also, we recommend they should have local offices in every borough governed by their own immigrant leadership councils. Thank you very much for your attention, and it's an honor for me uh, to speak here to you this night. Thank you. Thank you very much for speaking. We've had other representatives who um, from other borough hearings that we've had who have spoken about the same issue of, about the Office of Immigrant Affairs and particularly the proportionality. So that is something we'll be looking at and if you can send us a copy of your notes, we would appreciate it. Are there any questions for Mr. Popov? I just say your English is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, hearing no questions, the next speaker is Thomas Burton. Uh, 
Good morning. Um, my name is Thomas Burton, and uh, uh, I am uh, I'm here as a, I'm both a community board member, uh, community board one, but I'm speaking personally, individually. But I will talk a little bit about my experience as a community board member. But uh, uh, I'd like to first start uh, with letting you know that I'm a small businessman. I've uh, had uh, a sailing business for the last 18 years in in Lower Manhattan. I uh, operate uh, large, iconic, and historic sailboats, in, and uh, and I'm here to tell you that I've had a lot of problems, <laughs> and uh, I'm 18 years going, and I still don't have a dock, um, and uh, I think uh, I'm still season to season. I employ over 50 people. I have a payroll of over a million dollars, and I don't have a dock, and uh, I think the reason for that. Is, uh, is something that I was told is a charter reform issue years ago, and, uh, and so I'm, I'm here. And uh, it's, uh, one is the RFP process. Penalizes uh, small businesses because there's a financial test on every RFP that I've responded to, um, and uh, where your balance sheet determines uh, you could be perfectly uh, a viable candidate, you could, ha you could be able and competent at the, for the task or in the, res in the response in every category, but if you have a balance sheet of a million dollars or three million dollars, even though you can afford the contract or, or whatever you're going for, um, if somebody shows up with a $30 million balance sheet or a $50 million balance sheet, you lose, and that's that. And I've been told that, and this, so if you would, in your uh, review of the city charter, look at how to, uh, maybe not advantage, but at least not disadvantage smaller businesses that provide local, unique um, uh, services that I would say my first recommendation would be a financial test, which is an, a yes, no, not how big. Um, and I, it's, it sounded like the highest and best use of public lands is that you know, you have to take the highest bid. Those seem like uh, uh, too, uh, too absolute and, uh, and that adhering to those uh, really disadvantages a lot of the local flavor and color that could, uh, you know, uh, make New York or keep New York as a very diverse, you know, uh, exciting place for small little pop-up, you know, businesses. Um. I have other, uh, I think I'm about to run out of time. So, uh, also, uh, as a small business, the, on the waterfront, you have 500 miles of coastline. Perhaps there's some way to uh, have an ombudsman uh, where uh, a waterfront district or something like this could, has been proposed. And uh, because the unifying all the, the jurisdictions, there's EDC, there's the Port Authority, there's Small Business Services, HRPT, BPCA, and New York City Parks, which all have waterfront properties. Um, and uh, uh, on top of that, insurance, uh, the city self insures, but uh, a lot of businesses have trouble with certain insurance requirements, especially when they run into uh, city and, and other, uh, you know, uh, property and, or public properties. And so if there were an insurance, if, if you would consider a, a, a way for the city to consider New York City Bank, a municipal bank, consider a New York City municipal insurance company that would uh, look at that. These are commodified things now that could certainly be taken up by uh, a city like ours. Uh, okay. Banking, insurance, it's, it's, it's just extractive and very hard for small businesses. Um, as a community board member, um. I, I will wave. I can't do anything more, but I'm in support of a lot of what all these really smart people have said uh, on land use. And the, and the ULR process has been awful for a community board member to be able to respond, I suggest. I'll put it in writing. Yes, but that, that would be good. Uh, that the community boards come up with the ability to advocate with a budget for uh, climate change and other forward-looking things that are maybe global and national, but really are local and could have Thank a you. lot of uh, moment Thank and you. force from smaller. Thank you. I just want to make sure I understood what you were saying. Are you saying that in the process, the RFP process, for lease or use of 
city peers, docs, and other things that you're suggesting this reform? I've responded to EDC RFPs. I've responded to but the RFPs parks, are for lease RFPs, or yes. other use of city. Yes, in response, as a respondent, I have lost each time. I'm occasionally I've been pulled aside and said, "Your balance sheet. You had every other category just, perfect." Just wanted to make sure. And are they saying your balance sheet or the amount you can offer to the city for the lease? Uh, there were both, actually. Okay. Uh, it depends on which RFP we're talking about, but I've been at this okay. for 18 years, and it, it's a constant struggle. Where, where, where are you operating right. from now, Battery Park City? I'm, uh, I have two locations. One of my oh. landlords is, uh, is uh, New York City Parks, um, and another of my landlords is... Uh, uh, actually, it's not Parks, but I'm, I've been... Uh, uh, I've been given a sub-license to operate from Statue Cruises, who's been generous with me because they've been very generous with me. <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't have a place to operate. I'm sorry. And, and the other location is uh, Battery Park City Authority is my other landlord. And is that un pursuant to a lease with Battery Park City Authority, or is that just... I don't have any direct relationship with a city agency uh, or a state agency. I am a sub... I'm a, I'm a month to... Or a season to season... Uh, tenant or sub licensee of somebody who had more money than me and a bigger balance sheet. Okay, thank you. Are there other questions? Thank you, Mr. Burton. Thank you. The next speaker is Ms. Barry. Hello. You're not on the mic. It should be red. Okay. Hi. Um, I really appreciate this opportunity to listen and speak and I'm actually interested in how we speak and listen at scale. Uh, my name is Liz Barry. I'm nobody in particular, but I collaborate on collaboration. <clears throat> um, I got really interested in chapter 47, the public access to meetings and information. There's a real opportunity there for supporting our public conversation. Um, when we talk to each other in settings like this, um, our words come out in a mix. There's gripes, there's questions, there's data points, there's perspectives, demands, visions, and the crowd sits. We go one at a time. No way to signal except jazz hands. And <clears throat> generally, and in a democracy, people get apathetic and people get turned off when they're not being heard. So I suggest um, that by using some well-known facilitation methods that are used in settings um, locally and at larger scales around the world, um, we could better organize our public conversations. We separate out facts, feelings, ideas, action. They're a fancier name for those, but I'll email them. <laughs> uh, and some tools to help those phases scale um, we can, as a public, send clearer signals to government. Uh, these steps can happen in an ordered series, or they can happen simultaneously with someone who can dynamically facilitate and organize a public conversation. Uh, documenting this participation at each step um, with the sophisticated surveillance we all have in our pockets, much less on the tripods, uh, will make it easier to track if the ultimate decision points match what people said. So facts include data, studies, and identifying what's not known. Feelings also includes perspectives, conflicts, attitudes. And only after we go through those do we put some ideas out. Think how different this is from the way city agencies land a proposal in the public and all the feedback comes out at once in a cacophony. Um, with some adjustments, um, what's described in Chapter 47 might actually be able to help other city agencies align their public engagement processes um, and make it clearer how participation relates to power. Thank you. Do you could you give us a little more? You, you don't have to stop right at this second. 
Oh, it's 12.15. Um, I know that. <clears throat> there's a working, I can say this, on another island, an island that happens to be its own country, 23 million people in Taiwan, there's a working model. They've taken what we describe in our chapter 47 and turned it into a public digital innovation space. That space supports each agency in doing public engagement because each agency is busy doing its agency mandates. <clears throat> they may not also be very good at public facilitation and they may not be good at working with each other as we've already heard this evening. Um, what is the change exactly that you think is necessary in Chapter 47 to make sort of better facilitation of public uh, discourse occur? Um, <clears throat> the, the chapter could specify um, a facilitation mode um, called ORID. If you want to look it up, that's its, its most well-known te well technical name. Um, for objective, reflective, interpretive, and decisional phases. But I prefer the emojis for facts, feelings, ideas, and actions. So um, by recommending this structured conversation technique, or it's also called focused conversation technique, for use any time a complex issue is being talked about in, well, the way that people talk when ideas and complaints are coming all at once. These facilitation practices um, are very well tested and not too hard to train, but they've been locked up in a profession called, in a profession of professional facilitators. And um, I'm active in the civic tech world, I suppose, generally that's fair to say. And one of the spaces where we're breaking out techniques that have been locked in professional silos is in facilitation and building open source technology to help it scale. And I'm happy to write this up and explain it. It's actually doable and it's helping a, an island nation um, make crowd law with tens of thousands of people participating at a time. We would appreciate it if you wrote it up and sent it to us. I'm, I'm interested. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Um, Leandra Requena. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Chairman and Commissioners. My name is Leandra Requena. I'm activist, also union member of SEIU Local 32J and leader of Committee of Rasta of Make the Road New York. I would like to consider a proposal or suggestion or petitions that I'm calling because it's something I was concerning for a long time. Is um, we are a pet lovers. I'm, I'm, I'm asking for why the pet lovers, we don't have the tax deductions because it's so important. Pets are important for the human people, I mean, for human, for everybody. And it is important because they are companions. Uh, they are therapy for kids, for, for, citizens, for senior citizens. They are our bodyguards in our homes. They can, um, they are so significant in our lives. And in base of that, um, we have the right to ask for tax deductions. First of all, pet lovers, we have supported the huge commercial industry clothes, foods, and also in the, the college, in the, when the high school, uh, junior, I mean, the high school young people are starting a new career, most of them, um, 
there is a high percentage. They, they, they have, they go for, to be a veterinary. And that it costs a lot of money. And it's, we are, if we don't, we, we create jobs with that. We create jobs, we create economy, we are a taxpayer. That's increase the city, the taxes for people who was invested. But those taxes didn't affect us. The pet lovers, instead that they heard the people who was saying about the animal cruelty, the we can't have it. I didn't, I had just had one, one week to know about this charter city, but I'm going to submit because I am going to get the signatures because I talk with many people. I can give testimony from people who have saved their lives just because they adopt a cat, but they take care and they save their lives. This, a, a friend told me, you know, I was 10 years with this cat, but someday she never did. She was, in, in, uh, she was approached me she was, as, I mean, mowing over her when she said, why do you bother me? And it was the kitchen, almost, saved her life. That is one. I can give many testimony. I can submit and all those things. But please, we need, we, uh, pet, uh, pet lovers, we need a tax deduction. Okay, thank you very much, um, Ms. Requena. Are there any questions? Thank you, and now Mr. Vandervalk. Um, thank you. Uh, my name is Lowe Vandervalk. I'm president of Carnegie Hill Neighbors. We're located in the Upper East Side on the north end towards Central Park. Um, I would like to speak to the issues of land use. Um, my colleague sitting right next to me mentioned that you might apply triage because changing a charter is so huge. I can't even imagine what you are coping with. But I will speak to the issues of land use and, and uh, let you make the decisions. Um, we think that, uh, that some of the loopholes should be changed in the zoning laws, and those loopholes are um, gerrymandered lots, which can which can be used to avoid certain requirements of zoning, or they can be used to increase the amount of uh, floor area that you have available. Um, also, we, we, we hope that uh, the idea of voids and stilts to increase the height of a building can be eliminated. And third, the, uh, the height of floors should be regulated. I know in the old days they didn't. A floor was a floor. And that's because churches and schools needed bigger floors. And there was a, I think there was a sympathy to those organizations. But it's being abused now in tall buildings. Um, the second thing is I very much am sympathetic to the broader approach that was outlined by Borough President Gail Brewer and, and uh, Council Member Keith Powers early on this evening, uh, that we cannot just limit our view of zoning to just the district, the block becomes the basic ingredient for assessing what a zoning district is. And we have to look more broadly and this, this will affect how we might view tall, taller buildings in different areas of the city, so it's not just one size or one rule fits all. Um, third, just as a practical thing, when, when we have a 45-day period in which we can comment on a new building, it's on the internet, the plans are on the internet. However, it's very hard to know when that 45-day period starts and when it ends. Uh, it's hard to know when it starts because there might be th certain things happening in the lot and you look at the website and then, you know, you have to track it every week, but not everybody's capable. It would be nice if there was a bigger warning, like if there was some kind of a sign with a certain color and a certain size that had to go up when the 45-day period starts. Also, and you're the, talking about the building department 45 days? Yes, okay. yes, for new buildings. And, yeah. and, and the, it's the comment period. It's the, when you're allowed yes. to make comments. Right. And the ending of that 45-day period is also tricky because they often don't put up the real plans 
it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a provisional plan, which then is revised during the 45-day period, and you really should be extending the 45-day period. And then also, holy cow, I, I, I hope you'll let me go a little further. Just a little, because I uh, think Also, the, the need for, uh, for a, a timely response for challenges to the building department, because if they drag it out three or four months, then the, the, the building goes up and the issue is moot. Uh, also on ULERP, I just want to say, I think what's in ULERP so important is the scoping period. Again, if the scoping period could be stretched or if it could be done in a way that alternatives have to be presented, that there's more community feedback, that the experts and the developers have to appear before, before a public body so that before the, the clock starts ticking, you have a chance to influence matters. And then uh, finally on, and the environmental impact statement needs to be made accessible to the public. You must take into account a greater allowance for neighborhood character. Uh, and that on LPC, I just want to say, Quick don't please. place it under the uh, City Planning Commission. Keep it an independent agency. And give the LPC staff a break. Let the August period be one where there is no hearing. Okay, keep that. <laughs> currently. Revenue wants Thank a you. hearing in August. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, could you send us your testimony? Yes, um, I will. Thank, thank you. you. I will. Yes. Are there any other questions of Mr. Van der Waal? I thank this panel very much. Yeah. Thank you. And for those of you who are sending us your testimony, Great to, uh, we like appreciate it very much. Our last panel. Um, Kelly Grace Price, Michelle Boyson, James Trigus, Scott Kaplan, and those are all the slips I have. Is there anyone here who submitted a slip and his name has not been called? Okay, then. Okay. Ms. Price? Is Ms. Price, are you Ms. Price? I, I, I am Ms. Price, thank okay. you. Thank you, Chair Benjamin and the members of the Assisting Council for listening and continuing on late into this um, new day. I bet you think you know what I'm going to talk about today, <laughs> but I'm not going to talk about um, a citywide pet protection agency. Um, Ms. Benjamin, I believe that you have the only physical copy of my testimony. One was printed out for you specifically and, and it was emailed to the rest of you. I'm Kelly Grace Price from the Jails Action Coalition from Close Rosies. I'm a member of VID and the Four Freedoms. I'm really just nobody. Everyone else here, Susan Lerner, everyone has an important title. I'm just someone that really shows up at, at hearings <clears throat> specifically around women's rights issues and Department of Correction issues. I've been rallying at the Board of Correction specifically to end the rape crisis for the last five or six years. And my comments today specifically are around three different periods, three different um, uh, areas in the, the charter that I believe could uh, significantly increase safety for girls and women in New York City. Um, I've emailed them, and I don't want to bore you by reading off, um, but I, I'll just sort of um, give you the highlights of my ideas. Um, and I am a member of the Downstate Coalition Against Sexual Violence, which you may or may not know includes everyone that works in this area, people from the DA's offices, um, people that work in advocacy groups, uh, everyone sort of gets together. And, and really what we're having uh, right now is a crisis of investigatory management in all of our city agencies and all of our departments in the NYPD and the CCRB and the Department of Correction, City Council and the Department of Education and NYCHA. We have a, a crisis of uh, great proportions regarding sexual assault, rape and sexual harassment. Um, as someone who has lobbied carefully and meticulously 
um, specifically one of these agencies, the Department of Correction, vis-a-vis -vis the Board of Correction, we've hit no small amount of enormous problems just trying to implement a, a, a sexual assault prevention and, and um, um, investigative plan. Uh, the Prison Rape Elimination Act has literally been ignored by the Department of Correction even though it was briefly embraced back in 2016 uh, and the department's charter was revised with a, a PREA rule. But uh, you'll see in my testimony I included links, uh, Helen Rosenthal and Keith Powers and Rory Lansman uh, held a hearing a couple weeks ago about this issue, but really we we the, the department doesn't follow direction. The department does its own thing, and and I don't want to make my testimony, which is very short at this point, the remainder of it, about rallying at the Department of Correction. The most important thing that I believe that you can do for women and girls in New York City is to create a new oversight agency uh, for rape and sexual assault and sexual harassment, specifically against city agents or employees against the population. I would love to see that agency spread so that it is, it, it is an oversight board for all sexual assault and, and rape and sexual harassment. There is a precedent. Um, the, the federal government, the um, Department of Defense, uh, spent a long time creating a SAPRO, SAPRO uh, and so there is a precedent for bivouacking a lot of different agencies together to create such a, a, a complex board. Now, this particular agency, of course, would step on the feet of a lot of, the, of other agencies, um, and it would be very complicated, but there is a lot of backing. There, you wouldn't know from the low turnout of, of women here screaming about their, their rape or their sexual assault not being investigated thoroughly, but believe me, there, there are a lot of people working on this issue and thinking about this issue, and, and even though I'm a lone voice, please consider it heartily. I know it wouldn't make one of Susan Lerner's top lists, but please consider it heartily. I also ask you in my testimony to consider revising the Board of Correction Charter because currently the Board of Correction is the only oversight board over the Department of Correction, but they are um, very unevenly compromised. Uh, it would be, I, I made some specific suggestions about how to re revise that. And then finally, the one last thing that I have personal experience with that no one is talking about is this money that's flowing into, into different city agencies from venues outside of the city council. For instance, the NYPD is making tens of millions of dollars a year off of its royalty share agreements with technology corporations such as Microsoft and Palantir. And the same with the Manhattan District Attorney's Office, I believe. These things need to be looked at and I appreciate you letting me go over a little bit and my testimony is detailed. Thank you so much for listening to me and for your service to the city of New York. And Frank Sinatra thanks you for letting him appear at the <laughs> dais as well. Thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Are there any questions? <laughs> thank you very much. Um, the next speaker is Michelle Boyson. Is that person here? Oh, no, she James Trigas. Yes, hi. Um, Yes, uh, I'm a community leader for several decades and a member of both major political parties. Uh, I'm very involved in the community. I've helped uh, get elected Democrats, Republicans, third party candidates. I'm here on several issues and they're ballot questions uh, that should be done as a referendum. Regarding campaign, for, uh, campaign reform, uh, our city charter should um, only allow local donations and prevent out of state and out of the country donations to influence our local elections. So the question should read, uh, do you want out of state and out of the country campaign donations for local New York City elections to be allowed in New York and the surrounding boroughs, yes or no? In going to gerrymandering districts, um, redistricting all areas should, they should be made to uh, be fair as possible um, with a cross section of all residents, not to shift the majority uh, of one nationality into one area that only elects that nationality. So all districts need to be redone fairly, as fair as possible. Um, and that question also should, if, if you want me to spell it out as a referendum, I can, but I think you're smart enough to understand. Um, the other thing I wanna address, low, uh, low voter turnout. It is clear, uh, as being involved in the community, that I know far more than most of you. I go door to door, I speak to people, I'm a member of both parties, a lot of voters are fed up 
with what is going on. It is political bashing of one party against the other. And as long as you have that, you're never going to solve issues. It's always Democrats attacking Republicans, Republicans attacking Democrats. It's the party game. The real solution, which you probably will not do, but is that there is no major party. The parties should be removed. There shouldn't be any association with parties. Let anybody run. Uh, whoever gets the majority of votes should win. Um, and that is clear if you've watched TV in how bad it's gotten. Uh, in Flushing, um, oh, what has had, we had a local town hall meeting with the governor, the public advocate, and, and another member, uh, and which I wasn't even allowed in as a community leader. They kept me out, and as, and as a registered Democrat, I wasn't allowed to attend. They didn't want me to know what they're doing. The whole message, and if you watch t TV, is elect me, I will um, oppose uh, the president. They're not talking about issues. They're not solving anything. They're not saying what they want to do. They want to be elected to bash the other party. They made that known. As long as you have that, nothing is going to get solved. If you want local issues to be solved, remove the party uh, from the equation, let anybody run, and you will be able to solve issues because they're forced to deal with the issues and not bash the party. So I would like a referendum on the voting machine and let the voters decide. There's a lot of questions, even sanctuary cities. It's not up to the mayor or the governor or anybody else to decide. Put it on the voting machine. Let the people decide. Thank it's you, supposed, to, it's supposed to work for us. Thank if you, you let the people Trigus. decide, whatever happens, happens. Thank you, Mr. Trigus. Thank Are you. there any questions? Thank you. And our last speaker, Mr. Kaplan. Uh, yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for your service. It's an honor to be last, I guess. <laughs> So just for uh, first. identification, thank you. For identification purposes, I'm an officer in uh, the Jim Owls Liberal Democratic Club and Gramercy Stuyvesant Independent Democrats. The last time I did this, uh, Mayor Bloomberg and Speaker Quinn were seeking extension of uh, term limits. So tonight I have three, three requests, um, which I don't think you've heard of of uh, in prior, uh, uh, sp from prior speakers. One, make the office of Corporation Council independent of the mayor. Too often, the Corporation Council, which is supposed to be the attorney for the city of New York, acts as if it's the attorney for the mayor who already has their, his, his or her own council particularly in issues of conflicts between the mayor and the city council. It's vital that uh, we have independence, and you could do that either by having fixed terms, which don't have to correspond with the city officials, or make it elective, just like the attorney general. City council members who have term limits are always looking for other positions, so let's give them this. Number two. I think they'd have to go to law school first. Someday. Well, I'm talking about the lawyers. <laughs> but, but number two, let's make the uh, commissioner of the New York City Department of Investigation more independent. Right now, the mayor has outside counsel trying to uh, come up with reasons to justify uh, terminating the services of the DOI commissioner, which can only be done um, if, if um, reasons are enunciated. I suggest make it stronger, um, only allow the DOI commissioner to be terminated on cause with consent of the city council. This is a vital agency that must be independent of whoever is mayor. And number three, um, uh, probably the most popular uh, topic tonight was uh, civilian control and election of the uh, CCRB. I would urge, regardless of whether you decide to place that on the ballot, that the authority in police 
discipline cases be taken away from the commissioner of the NYPD. Commissioners have been unwilling to discipline police officers, and there's been no transparency. So vest it in either the CCRB or the uh, Department of Investigations or the Inspector General, but some other entity other than the um, NYPD commissioner. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Kaplan. Are there any questions? I thank the panel and would just say, is there anyone here who wishes to speak who has not been heard? That being the case, I want to thank everyone for attending and sharing your thoughts and ideas with us, and I encourage you to do so throughout the process, and to the extent you have written uh, comments or you may write them in the future, please send them to us. Uh, remember to visit our website at charter2019.nyc, follow us on Twitter and Facebook. Commissioners, while you're more than welcome to take your written materials with you, please remember to leave your folders and name cards behind so that we may use them again. And if everyone would take a minute, it is Commissioner Nuri's birthday today, <laughs> and uh, we would all like to wish him happy birthday. Happy birthday to you, happy birthday to you, happy birthday, happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Seconded. Seconded. All in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Thank you so much, everyone. Yes. You can take all the other stuff. We just want the folder so we don't have to get new ones. Right. Yeah, there was some...